to Casper the Ghost East 98 Memphis Triple Six exclusive for that that was Bunta Sparks free falling with Loke Playa hello folks this is the motherfucking news underground I am the motherfucking abandoned nihilism aka the harbinger and I'm coming at you with one goal in mind to inform you to let you know that you're actually in danger you know, even if you're not in the United States, you're in danger. I I am what my name de- describes. Abandon nihilism. We're here to destroy it, not embrace it. We're not here we're not here to commit generational suicide. We're here to make something better of ourselves. I hate seeing this corporate logo. Let's fix this shit right now. We'll fix this with the handyman's secret weapon. Duct tape. Props to duct tape. You know what I'm talking about. That duct tape. I hate seeing this stupid corporate logo on my shirt.
Of course, everyone knows this stream is sponsored by Garbage Fuel. Garbage Fuel, the number one drink mix company in the world. Thank you so much, Garbage Fuel, for sponsoring this. Folks, don't forget, Garbage Fuel is made from 100% garbage juice. Garbage juice. Last drink you never consume. Made from 100% garbage juice sourced from your local dumpster. Make sure you buy it, spend money purchasing this, and consume it. Put that, put that in your body, please. <coughs> that's a good slogan. That's a that's a good creepy slogan for garbage fuel. Put that in your body, please. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, okay, uh, recap here what we're going to be covering. We're actually covering a lot of news today. I don't know why I'm six minutes into this and I still haven't jumped on over, but we're covering quite a bit of news. Haiti, um, smattering of world news, including UK, Myanmar. Uh, we got Houthi updates, including a Houthi update from a really cool news source. What's going on with shipping? Really cool guy. You know, I, I love I love these hyper niche channels who do deep dives into some of these news stories and you get this extremely, in, you know, informed, like I, I assume this guy, you know, is like used to be in logistics, probably his whole career in logistics, right? Look at this, he's got his YouTube award. Hey, congratulations, man. To the underdog, to the underdog, right? So we're gonna be watching some of, uh, some of this fella here, what goes on with shipping. And uh, we're gonna give you the link now and we'll give you the link then. Like and subscribe to that she is. Um, I am going to be introducing a new segment. That's right, a new segment today. Be stoked, be stoked. We got a new segment coming up. Uh, the segment's called Attack from the Left. I figured since I have a segment where uh, I'm gonna, I shit on the right, uh, I figured I should have a segment where I'm shitting because I'm constantly shitting on the neo because the, the neoliberals, you know, this this idea that we need to protect these people, this idea that we need to coddle these people for if, if, if we don't, the, the balance will be tipped and uh, the Republicans will win. Only only in very niche cases when it comes to specifically like voting strategically, is that actually true? <laughs> But especially during the primaries, uh, neoliberals need to be challenged uh, to the hilt, to the absolute maximum. Uh, after the primaries, the calculation does change a little bit. So the left needs to learn how to be nuanced. Big stream, this stream is so obese, we had to, we had to get one of those oversized toilets. You know, those big ones. This stream is obese, okay? We're not changing the lifestyle. We gotta change the toilet. So we're gonna be introducing that new segment, Attack from the Left, and I'm also gonna be doing What's Up with the Fascists, everyone's favorite segment, What's Up with the Fascists. We're gonna be catching up on all of our favorite assholes and how they are uh, it, it currently taking liberty uh, and how they plan on taking more of our liberty. That's right, the conservative party. There's still this lie that they are somehow patriotic, that they are somehow pro-America. I've never seen a more anti-American group of fascists in my fucking life. So we'll be covering the assholes, jumping into U.S. news and everyone's favorite segment, the mass shooting update, of course. Everyone loves the mass shooting update. So make sure you stay tuned for the end of that one so we can uh, wrap our head around how many people died uh, needlessly in the United States this week. Uh, we're gonna, we have some good news after that. And it's, this is a really amazing piece of good news. This is a really inspiring uh, interview from the 70s from a professor who was incredibly prophetic and incredibly intelligent and you, no one knows him but this is really interesting uh, article I think this article was provided by woke patriot this definitely looks like a woke patriot link maybe it was me but I think this is woke patriot but look forward to it the fella's name is um, Marshall McLuhan I assure you you are going to want to watch this clip it's something else Hey, just came back from the Mitchells. Mickles. 
Uh, after that good news, we're going to be covering bad news in Gaza. Everyone's favorite bad news in Gaza. You know, I'm going you know, to get, a, get an update on the ethnic cleansing campaign. And then, of course, we're going to be jumping into Ukraine. And God damn it, we, I got to get to the end for my boy, Chem Goblin. But if I, if I can't make it to the end, because um, this stream is incredibly obese, you've, you fucking right. I'll be doing it tomorrow with an exclusive Ukraine stream. Don't give me that shit, Cam Goblin. I don't want to hear you don't have to. I want to hear, yeah, bitch. You better be doing it. That's the attitude leftists need to have. I want it and I want it now. All right, we got to meet these. We got to meet the right wing. We got to meet these evil mother, evil doers uh, with their energy. Because what do the evil doers want? They want it now and they want it right now. We need to do, we need to be the same. So, you know, if I run out of stamina to cover Ukraine today, you goddamn right I'm covering it tomorrow. So big props to strategy member, Chem Goblin, Leon for coming in. Number one's in the chat. Number one's in the chat. You guys rock. OG's coming back. We'll be covering UK news, just a small segment really on the UK right at the beginning of our world news, Leon. So if you want to stick around through Haiti, uh, I would appreciate that. But if you can't do that, I understand. John Axel in this, no, number one in this mother, but y'all number one. You get, in, you get in the first 10 minutes, you're number one in my eyes. You guys, the OGs. All right. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, we're going to be covering UK console, you know, the uh, 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 consoles uh, cutting taxes, but uh, uh, cutting services, but raising taxes. Um, and this, you know, this is kind of in line to what you were saying earlier about how, you know, the Tories giveth, but that, you know, then they taketh away greatly. And these are just, you know, these tax cuts that they give are just these little pithy little nothings, um, you know, to uh, to convince the stupids that, you know, the Tories are on their side. And, of course, it's timed so perfectly. We're seeing a lot of that cynical timing also from the neoliberals in the United States. It's incredibly frustrating. But anyway, let's jump into our number one story of the day, Haiti. Um, it's it's popping off. Uh, you know, barbecue, barbecue is laying down the ultimatums, and this motherfucker is saying, you know, ain't taking no for an answer. The international community is saying, I don't know who this, uh, Haiti what? Haiti who? Um, we're going to, so I'm going to give just a quick inside edition. <laughs> I thought this was interesting. Inside edition covering, you know, if there's juicy footage, I guess inside edition all of a sudden becomes international journalists. I thought that was cute. They they found time to stop covering the boils on a celebrity's ass to to cover an international you know <laughs> incident. Oh, that's very nice of inside edition. Um, but we're going to get an explanation of what the hell is actually going on over here uh, from DW, because I need this as well. I, I, I actually have no fucking idea what the hell's going on. Um, and then we're going to get a update just from the last hour uh, ago about what's actually happening on the ground to end our coverage for Haiti. So let's jump right into it, folks. News underground, abandoned nihilism. You know what you're here for. You're actually here for real news. You're not here to fucking jerk off, talk about destiny or what the fuck. For some reason, Destiny's wife is like, I search for literally anything, and like six six results down, it's Destiny's ex-wife talking about how she wants to suck dick. Why is she ever, why is she, why? I reported the video because I can't make it go away. It's in my search results. I can't, I never search for this woman. I never, I don't know why. Why? People love the drama. It has 27 million views, that video of Melina you know, being interviewed, talking about how, well, some men are just intimidated when I come up to them and I'm just like, I want to suck your dick. And they're like, oh, 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 they get all scared. But I'm like, oh, I really want to do it. And it's like, okay, you're a whore. I don't know what you want me to, th what? Why is this on my YouTube? 27 million views. <laughs> Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Okay, probably no one knows what I'm talking about because everyone has their own algorithm. For some reason, though, okay, I don't know. Probably because I typed in Destiny into my search one, you know, one time six years ago, for God's sakes. He is coming up on my live stream algorithm as well, Destiny. So, you know, he's, he's doing all right for himself. He's canvassing, I think, for a Democrat. I'm pretty sure for a Democrat. I think for a neoliberal. Uh, but, you know... 
that's all I really ask for is one, two, three. If you're a streamer with a big audience and you're following one, two, three, I'll get off your nutsack. That's all I ask. Is that, you know, is that you're, you're, if you're a political celebrity, um, you have a following, you're on the left, all I ask is that you follow one, two, three. And if you're doing that, then I'll get off your dick. I don't care, you know. But I certainly don't agree with <laughs> a lot of Destiny takes. That's for fucking sure. Um, I'm sure he would have a long paragraph, parag paragraph after paragraph as to why I was wrong, of course. But whatever. Let's get to Haiti here. Anyway. After thousands of inmates were broken out of prison, a state of emergency Some has been declared keep in him. Haiti. Yeah, me. The yeah. Caribbean nation's government says armed gangs took over two prisons over the dick. weekend. During the violence that ensued, reports say nearly all of the 4,000 inmates at Haiti's National Penitentiary in the country's capital, Port-au-Prince, escaped. Human wow. rights group RNDDH Inside with says the, the penitentiary music. was I built love it. to house 700 people, but for years has been holding thousands. A nighttime curfew it's and a 72-hour state of emergency was declared across the nation in an attempt to restore oh order. God. Haitian Prime oh Minister God, Ariel dude. Henry is out of the country on a trip to Kenya, where he asked again for support of a United Nations-backed security force. Nah, According dude. to the you UN, Haiti has about 9,000 I mean, police. I mean, what what kind of loser are you if you you know you let barbecue you know he, he used to be like chief of police or something man like um for all we know barbecue could do a better job than you you know and i'm not saying i'm not saying you know um i don't know has it's like has bar is barbecue killing a bunch of innocent civilians he's threatening genocide he's literally threatening genocide um it's such as it's such there's no winner here there's no winner here surely there's like there's got to be some kind of political party or something in Haiti that is like a legitimate party that wants to like be a government you know what I mean? There surely there has to be something in you know in Haiti, right? It's back security force. According to the UN, Haiti has about 9,000 police officers to support 11 million residents. The US embassy in Haiti has issued a level 4 do not travel security <laughs> alert. It's urging all American citizens in Haiti to Fuck depart you. as Fuck soon you. as possible and warns others not to come. You beat your Officials wife. say you at least 9 people have been killed. 4 of them are believed to be police officers. Holy For shit, For Inside dude. Edition Digital, I'm T.C. Newman. It's, you know, Barbecue seems to know exactly just how unstable the whole situation is. And, you know, this guy over here being like, you know, can the West bail my ass out? Uh, uh, you know, if Barbecue, if, if Barbecue, this is what I'm talking about. If Barbecue doesn't kill a bunch of innocent people, the West can easily ignore this. Right. If barbecue just does a coup, right, and kills a bunch of their soldiers, right, and you know, and their politicians, but ultimately doesn't like clean out villages and you know do something super horrific, the West won't really have to do shit for this guy. <laughs> but let's find out more. Maybe I'm dead wrong. We got a fifteen minute. This is fifteen minutes. I want to watch the whole thing because clearly I'm misinformed. Clearly I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. So let's get informed on this situation. We got a DW documentary, mini doc, mini, you know, kind of full full rundown here with interviews and all that shit. So let's get the rundown. How the world destabilized Haiti, the world's first free black republic. So let's let's all learn something today. If barbecue wins, the next question becomes what would be, Yeah, I mean, obviously. If history if history is to be our guide, um a a criminal run fiefdom you know, a fucking Somalia situation. But, you know, who knows? Maybe barbecue is a some kind of legitimate, like I said yesterday, some kind of Che Guevara or some kind of uh, Hugo Chavez character, right? A mixed bag, but ultimately does try to govern and create a real government, right? This is Haiti, and this is how rich cruise ship tourists, the relatively few who visit, get to see it at a private beach on the northern coast. 
And this is the reality, just oh. a few kilometers away in the capital, oh. Port-au-Prince, for most people in Haiti. Yo, Violent gangs are in control of the streets, skyrocketing prices for food mean most people are hungry and miserable. Oh, can we go to back to the resort, honey? What's a black republic? Uh, <laughs> this is Jean Samuel Mentor. He is a freelance oh, on, journalist yeah. from Haiti. Je ne trouve pas vraiment de mots pour décrire la situation que nous vivons actuellement. Les violences sont aggravées et les cas de kidnapping sont explosifs. But did you know the start of Haiti's story is quite inspirational? It had the world's only successful slave revolt, leading to the world's first black republic. Okay. So what happened? Okay. Right. Let's just say colonialism played its part, and all these big players, amongst others, were involved. So let's unravel how the world messed with Haiti and what that means for today. All right. Okay. Okay. You know, if if this is made by DW uh, Germany, if this avoids any kind of, you know, I'm curious. Okay, that was very interesting framing. That was very interesting framing right there. One more time. I want to hear that framing one more time. One more time. These big players, amongst others, were involved. Okay. So let's unravel how the world messed with Haiti and what that means for today. All right. Okay. All right. Never mind. I, I heard something different. All right. It's exciting. I'm going to learn something today, goddammit. This is Haiti's flag now. This is what it used to be when it was still called Saint-Domingue. Yes, that's the French flag. When the black slaves broke free of their French masters, they removed the white stripe from their flag, representing an end to white European power. Oh, fuck yeah. A bit of white later reappeared in the flag, but with Haitian symbols. But let's start at the beginning, or at least what Europeans consider the beginning of Haiti. It was actually Christopher Columbus who was the first colonial player to set foot on the island of La Hispaniola. Uh -oh. He landed in what is now called Mont Saint Nicolas <laughs> on November 6, 1492, claiming it for Spain. Okay, at the time, yeah. half a million indigenous people were living on the <clears throat> island. By the mid-17th century, most of those indigenous people were gone. Europe was crazy for coffee and sugar, and this Caribbean island promised both. Like Tropico. France Love fought Spain for control. The two colonial powers ended up splitting the island in two. The Spanish colony of Santo Domingo is today uh, the Dominican Republic, uh, and the French Saint-Domingue later became Haiti. Uh, the French brought in African slaves for the grueling work on sugarcane plantations. By 1800, Haiti had a population of more than 700,000. No way, it's Overwhelmingly, Israel, really? people from West Africa. That was a very, uh, uh, kind of a barbarian system. Slaves worked, they were beaten, etc. Robert Fatten is a professor of politics <laughs> at the University of Virginia. The Born and raised in Port-au-Prince, Haiti has been at the center of his research for decades. The exploitation <laughs> of slaves was lucrative. Saint-Domingue became France's most profitable colony in the Americas. All Slave right. labor plantations attention. supplied roughly 40% of sugar imported to Europe at the time. Okay, slave it was labor a brutal plantations. system, both for the enslaved humans as well as the ecosystem. Okay, so it was, what, re-enslaved? You can still see the effects today. Just oh, look at these aerial images they, on the border with the Dominican Republic. On the Dominican side, you can see lush forests and green lands. On the Haitian side, the land is barren, trees gone. What happened? The, that was that. That's Back the history. to the French colony. They haven't, they haven't rebuilt. They have, that's from all the colonialism before the slave revolt. And they wow, they just totally raped the land, dude. Wow. <coughs> Back to the French colony yeah, of Saint Domingue. By the end of the 18th century, the slaves had had enough. Okay. Not surprisingly, yeah, they dude. revolted yeah. and made history. Woo, look the at revolution that shit. is something. Damn, that, that is an revolt. intense man. Because you know, this is you know, before photographs and everything, this is the best you can get. I mean, look at that. Look at that shit, dude. People getting choked to death in the streets, just utter chaos. You know, and would we? No, I better not. I better not say that. But this is this is really something. I mean, look at he's got his sword, you know, about to plunge right into him. Really crazy picture there. Altered and crazy made painting. history. 
The revolution is something that all Haitians uh, are very proud of. I mean, it persists. I mean, this is one of the, uh, as we say in French, myth fondateur, you know, the founding myth. Uh, and it's one thing that keeps us going. In 1804, Haiti became the first black republic in the world. So far, so good. Yep. But it came with a price, okay. a crippling one. All right. Well, other colonizers first don't like isolation. it? First uh, isolation. Nobody yep. wanted to do business <laughs> yeah. with a new nation. The new uh, black republic was cut off economically. I see. Surrounded this is a by big the deal. colonies of powerful nations using slave labor who feared their slaves could also revolt. Yeah. Haiti was the first black republic, reason enough for some of its powerful neighbors to refuse to even trade with a new nation. Because, you know, racism. <laughs> okay. And France? Republican revolutionary France demanded Haiti pay for its independence. Having lost its lucrative source of sugar, France sought reparations. A staggering sum of 150 million francs in gold. Over the next century, Haiti paid the equivalent of between 20 and 30 billion U.S. dollars. Haiti passed legitimately paying it? Well, because they can no debt, longer use the slaves the to, to the make money? Republic even have? After independence, Haiti suffered. From the burden of reparations, from isolation, but also from poor government. A series of bad governments, day, leaders who added to the country's misery. I believe that there is a such occurred? a thing as an, an opportunistic Under and slavery? ultimately detrimental convergence of interest between no, the Haitian rulers way, and dude. the international community. The interest of the Haitians and the interest of the foreign powers is not necessarily the same. France but is demanding the money from consequence Haiti. Consequence of that convergence, opportunistic convergence, is that it is detrimental to the country. So both domestic and international no. factors have led to the devastating status quo in Haiti. A symbol for that is Cité Soleil. The densely populated neighborhood of Port-au-Prince is now in near complete control of gangs. Nearby is the Fontaine Hospital Center. In November 2023, a heavily armed gang stormed the Look hospital back. and threatened people inside. Ribbon. It's okay. an environment of uh, really are, people are trying to, to survive and, and where violence is completely normalized right now. Diego Darin works at the International Crisis Group, a non-governmental organization committed to conflict resolution. He recently traveled to Haiti. The security situation rapidly deteriorated in July 2021. Back then, Haiti's president, Jovenel Moïse, was killed by Colombian mercenaries. It's unclear who paid them. The last time a Haitian president was killed was in 1915. That assassination opened a chapter of foreign intervention, which still impacts Haiti today. That same year, U.S. Marines landed in Port-au-Prince. Officially, U.S. forces were France there to restore order, back, but Washington dude. also wanted to block but European powers on the island. France shouldn't give that money back to a, a government that isn't stable. That's just, you know, that's just asking for trouble. But I don't know, dude. France should pay some reparations eventually. <laughs> what the fuck? Island from tapping into Haiti's resources. So we owed some money to uh, the U.S. banks and the instability in Haiti gave a pretext to the United States to uh, move in with the Marines. And the first thing they did was to go into the central of bank of uh, Haiti, I tell take you. Uh, the reserves of the central bank, <laughs> put the it on a boat and send it back to New York to <laughs> City Bank. And that's the way it was. U.S. troops stayed for 19 uh... years, but their footprints are still visible today. What happened with the occupation was the centralization of power in Paul press and the most important element was the creation of a centralized army, which became very much the arbiter of politics for a very long time uh, in Haiti. The U.S. occupation backed local elites and trained local There's security forces. To do Those this. forces would later back various regimes, including the brutal dictatorship of Francois Papa Doc de oh, right. and his son Baby Doc. Papa this Doc. led to a situation where Haitians became suspicious of power. And up until today, there is a vacuum of power 
with Haiti edging closer to failed state status. Interesting. A symbol for that, the National Palace. The official residence of the president was destroyed in Haiti's devastating earthquake oh, yeah. in 2010. The ruins were even then removed and the wow. palace never rebuilt. Wow. Uh, they, they have talked to rebuild, rebuild, but nothing has happened. Uh, the reconstruction that was promised never materialized. Uh, money was squandered, money was stolen. Wow. And again, foreign influence played its part. Maybe with good intentions, but again with a bad outcome for Haiti. Foreign powers wanted to bypass corrupt officials and gave their aid directly to NGOs. So the state became, you know, kind of a very weak structure. And people who were working in the state, they started moving into the NGOs. So when you have NGOs everywhere, no one controls them. The government loses its <laughs> financial its and once you have that, there is no. You just made that you know, shit so we up. So move from a very despotic regime to a regime that has no control over anything. Yeah. yeah. All this led to the situation today. No president, no functioning parliament, <sighs> just the acting prime minister Ariel Henry with no real power. One of the worst crises. And it's like the West. Surely the West has to know. The West has to know. The the you know the what's happening here you know and it, is this is, is there really no solution to this or is it just that there's no profit to the solution and you know Amer the american people aren't demanding it it's not an election issue so who cares right there's nothing to gain is it really just that cynical rich or profitable make flourish and profitable must die yeah, I mean, that's that's the current state of uh, hardcore capitalism that we're dealing with. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't think strategy was talking about that. <laughs> the acting prime minister, Ariel Henry, with no real power. One of the worst crises Haiti has ever seen. That's why Henri has once again turned to the international no, community I mean, and I, asked I, the UN I think for I agree help. With you. Yet another international Mama. player. For the moment, Les missions onusiennes ne sont sont très mal vues yeah, en Haïti. Sure Ces missions sont très très mal vues en Haïti. The last time the United Nations intervened in Haiti, things went horribly wrong. This is Haiti's main water source, the Artibonite River, and this is precisely where the last UN mission took a devastating turn. Interesting. In 2010, UN peacekeepers, mainly from Nepal, set up camp here just above a stream flowing into the Artibonite River. A few days later, close by, suddenly, the first cholera cases appeared. Oh, Investigations they were later the river. found that the UN soldiers had unintentionally released infected sewage yeah, into the stream in the river. flowing into the Artibonite River, leading to a cholera outbreak that cost 10,000 lives and spread across the country. Oh, you morons! Oh, you fucking idiots! And there was never really any type of uh, restitution for those deaths. Oh, so there is not. a very bad taste in the, you know, in, uh, in, uh. in Haiti for that kind of intervention. The UN mission that was supposed to bring stability and security to Haiti left the country in 2017. So what does all of this mean for today? Has the world abandoned Haiti for good? For and are moment. Haitians even glad about it? Not quite. In 2022, the Prime Minister called for a new international security mission to come to Haiti to crack down on gang violence and lawlessness. Kenya has offered to lead a new UN-backed multinational mission that could soon deploy to Haiti. So you say we need them. We need some kind of stability. But a lot is still unclear. The UN and the Kenyans and the Americans, the Canadians, and that the is such a failure of planning. Different intervention. Just no, shit I'm not in the river. Quite sure that this necessarily is going to be a very different intervention. 
The idea is to send just a small group of highly trained police staff to restore order and um, secure key what? infrastructure, such as the country's main airport. It's not a movie, So, dude. yes, now the international community is realizing that it must change the way it has acted and in, in the way it has um, intended to help Haiti. But gangs control some 80% of port au -Prince. They are well armed and know the terrain. Even if international forces are welcomed at first, that could change quickly. So there might in fact be support for an intervention, but I think that support may be very short-lived if it is not yeah. a, a no very one, effective No one has the money or the words, political welcome them. ability. But if they can't establish order fairly quickly, I think the population would turn against them. Sure. And then you have the mistrust of the people. For Haitians, the new mission raises once again the question, will it bring improvement or damage the country in the long run? A question with no answer yet. But Haitians have a resilient past to cling on to. Je pense qu'on a besoin. The had some fun here. Bon, on le dit souvent, mais je pense qu'on a besoin d'un peu de conscience, de de d'inspirer de, de nos aïeux. Parce the first que, free black republic, sure. Yeah. On n'est pas sans savoir qu'on est. This, this la person is a freelance journalist from Haiti. Libre. On a on a surmonté beaucoup de choses pendant yeah. ces 200 ans. Haiti clearly will people. face a number of problems for the foreseeable future. What do you think? Which geopolitical issue I mean, should we map out next? I mean, the, the, West, the West does have the ability to, you know, do more than just, you know, a couple thousand troops and good luck. Some special police officers. Are you fucking joking? You know, the, the, West, the West has the kind of, you know, because what you need to do is you need, to, you need stability, and that takes time, and that takes a lot of money, and, you know, and you need to be serious about, you know, getting the Haitians uh, involved in this, you know, and we've, we've shown the capability to do this, um, you know, Germany, Japan, you know, uh, I'm not saying they have to be occupied governments, but we've shown the ability to um you know assist with you know building the democratic foundations of a legitimate government and you know but then you look at projects like afghanistan and you're like oh my god you know almost almost 20 years almost 20 years of pumping millions and millions and millions of dollars almost 2 trillion dollars total into their government and military, um, and it, you know it just being just a, a, just a total colossal failure in in trying to introduce uh, you know any kind of uh, sustainable you know government democracy or or otherwise whatever you'd call it. Um, so I get it, I get it. It's like you know, and then you see situations like this where the the UN with NATO. Uh, was that NATO or was that was that a UN mission? Whatever, but they're shitting in the river. It's like you know, you what you didn't bring chemical toilets. You just is is that why you put yourself there? Oh, this would be okay. The UN, it was a UN mission. But uh, that that's just embarrassing. That's just absolutely embarrassing. Um. All right, so let's get our up to the minute update on what's happening right here on the ground. It looks like it, it, honestly, it looks like barbecue is is gonna going to take this shit, you know, and then the struggle is going to be you know, so here's the thing is that, you know, barbecue if if barbecue wants to keep keep power, he could just try to legitimize himself and at first the international community would ignore him. But if if the if if you know, he was able to actually, you know, form a, a cohesive government, um the international community would be okay, you know, Telling that other guy to fuck off, okay, but this is the new legitimate government of Haiti. Um, it's not it's not unprecedented. Not unprecedented. Um, the real question is, you know, what's up with barbecue? <laughs> Political activist Mertia Marcelin was greeted with excitement on Friday after he escaped from prison in Haiti. 
The country entered a state of emergency Haiti? last Sunday after fighting escalated and armed gangs broke inmates out of prison. He says he was kidnapped by the government of Prime Minister Ariel Henry. I wasn't imprisoned, I was kidnapped. The criminal government headed by Ariel kidnapped me. The god of life saved me by the skin of my yo. teeth. Months of violence have pushed Haiti's government to the brink of collapse and forced thousands to flee their homes. And increasingly powerful gangs are asking the country's prime minister to resign. Meanwhile, Henry remains outside the country. So people are fleeing, but they're not being to murdered. Return. Guy Philip, who helped lead a coup in Haiti in 2004, says he should not return. He had an agreement. He would resign and step down in February 7th this year. But he hasn't done it. And still, he's still having the, the backing of those big countries that say that they are our friends. So I think he should stay where he is now for the for the for, for, for the best. It will be good for the country that he stay where he is and let Haitians decide their fate. Well, this guy he was led a coup from the U.S. to Haiti in November after serving six years of a prison sentence <laughs> for money laundering derived from drug trafficking. Since his return to Haiti, he traveled the country, rallying support and calling for the government to step down. Henry's spokesperson did not immediately respond to a request for comment. Henry left Haiti last week to secure Kenya's leadership for a UN-backed security mission he first requested in 2022 to help fight the gangs. He is believed to still be in Puerto Rico, where he arrived on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, let's let's hear what George Conway has to say about the election. Why do they keep rolling this fucking guy out? Why? Anyway, no, so there you go about that was the latest news about um Haiti. Sorry about the George Conway. I just I just don't understand why MSNBC keeps interviewing this guy. Like, okay, yeah, he he's the husband of Kellyanne Conway, who was part of government for three milliseconds. Um, and he's a critic of Trump. You know, and I guess he's like a lawyer or something, but they keep interviewing him like he's some kind of expert or something. It's like, is there anyone else on your fucking roster? MSNBC, I'm sick and tired of seeing this guy. All right, but there you go. That was um, uh, that was your Haiti news. That was your Haiti update. Very interesting stuff. Um, wow. Um, the West has a lot to atone for Haiti, huh? No joke. And uh, it looks like they're protecting, according to this guy who led a coup in the past, <laughs> they're protecting uh, They're protecting this leader. Um, it doesn't look too good for him, though. Like I said, if Barbecue can, you know, within a couple months, start providing real government services, put together a cabinet, and start governing... Uh, he can actually turn this around. But if he just starts, you know, with the with the criminal dictator stuff, it sounds like uh, we might get some kind of intervention. Piss poor, what, 10,000 UN troops, maybe? Is the UN even capable of shit like that anymore? I don't know. I feel like they're, they're so dysfunctional. They're so scared of, of losing an intervention, you know, showing how weak they are. Ugh, why do I have him on my screen still? All right, moving on to world news. <clears throat> Interesting stuff about Haiti. Man. I mean, an intervention is necessary uh, for stability, but my God, the failures of the past. You know? And it's, and, you know, enabling, enabling these mediocre, corrupt individuals. I've talked about that before, you know, them enabling these, these characters. Gross. So jumping into our world news over to UK, um, you know, we were just covering the Tories uh, with a little 2P tax cut. Big, big time. And wow, big deal. Thank you so much. That'll really make up for the price gouging the inflation the the uh the wage the wage uh shortage you know ai taking everyone's jobs 
it'll really help us out yeah Leon, neoliberalism neocolonialism colonialism and imperialism it's a wombo combo and like just apologize man you know but I get it though at the same time it's like you, you can't it's it's something you can't just throw a pallet of money at um because then you know do you really want to just ship a pallet of money over to barbecue <laughs> you know, I'm like well we've atoned for our sins Hey, Tisriel, Brexit's working great. Everyone I, everyone I talk to that's a representative of the Tory government tells me that Brexit is doing smashing. Literally smashing. Uh, I really ignore the wails of, of regular people, though, because they're less important, obviously, than the words of politicians. Um, I put a lot of trust into the words of the Tory government. Brexit number one. Gonna be to all our They're calling for cuts to the cuts as councillors vote on 300 million pounds job. of savings. Completely fucked it up. It's Birmingham today, but it could be a council near you tomorrow as one in five are warning they face bankruptcy as they fight over funding with the government. Ramoners. The effects are being felt in local neighborhoods. Ramoners. This community hub in South Birmingham provides a warm, welcome space, yeah. a cup of tea and a hot meal. But for how long? Oh, yeah, you're all right. Hello, what's up? Uh, after me all for you. Ahmed comes here twice a week and says if it closed, it would be devastating. We are struggling to pay our bills. So why is he going to close this kind of services? It's a good place, warm place. I absolutely encourage them to open more places like this rather than to close the existing ones. It's not good. They dish up 400 meals a week here. Kirsty Palmer volunteers in the kitchen after being made redundant herself. They've always relied on different pots of council money, but more and more of those pots are now empty. Our budget is going to be cut. So what do we do? You know, we, there is no more blood in this stone. Right. What about the government's argument, right. though, that there just isn't the money? There's, there's no money um, for hungry people, Firstly, guys. I don't believe them. They're able to fund lots of other things. It's going to be the elderly. You know, they're not going to be able to get out as much. They're going to become isolated. The roads are going to be appalling. People's cars are going to break. It's, it doesn't feel like a single point attack. You know, we're being attacked. I don't really like the word attack, but we're being attacked from all angles. Druid's Heath has seen a steady and, you know, decline in still, services. I'm still curious who's who's making out like bandits in the United States. It it actually uh, the poverty. Um, it, you know, there's there's a there's a quid pro quo. Like there's there's a there's a big incentive for the for the ruling class for the people in charge in the United States, the people in the upper classes, to create this. Um, you know this this really starving and hungry and you know desperate and busy. Um, you know, uh, class of people, you know, they want to basically merge the lower and middle classes, make it into one kind of homogenous uh, group of, uh, of, 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 you know, starving millions. Uh, but right now there's, there's definitely some delineation, right? There's definitely delineation, delineation middle and, and lower class, but it's this, it's, you know, there, there's, it makes sense to me in the United States. Those people, those people work hard. They, they, they're too busy to complain. They're just trying to get by paycheck to paycheck. They don't really realize half the time they're voting against their self-interest or not voting at all. Um, you know, and the cycle perpetuates itself and, and, and the billionaires make out like bandits. It makes perfect sense. In the UK, I don't understand the incentive of this. You're, you, you know, you're, there's no, there, you're, you're, the, the capitalism that, you know, that you have in, 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 in the UK uh, is not capable of absorbing all of this and is, is not, you know, is not ready for this. Um, you know, it, it, it seems like, it seems like it's a, it, you, you guys are taking a bullet train into like instability land, like into, into really scary territory here. Um, and I don't understand who's been, like, I can't even think of like what, who's, who's benefiting, like who's the rich fucker that's actually benefiting from, from all this, uh, you know, all these radical changes and, and all these, the introduction of, uh, you know, a bunch of, uh, homeless people and starving people into your economy. Like, how is that actually going to help the rich? I'm 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 just I'm just like how does Brexit help the rich? I'm just so curious, right? Because like, there were who's making out like bandits? 
What do you have the House to represent to starve? How are they going to afford million-dollar mansions in France without those extra taxes? Yeah, this is what we call a professional fuck-up, a fuck-up done for no reason that cripples the economy for decades and benefits absolutely nobody. I, I refuse to believe that. I mean, like, the conservatives, Tories, um, at least the conservatives in the United States, they act, you know, purely out of self-interest, and every move they make is to either increase their power or, you know, you know, you know, increase who they are, you know, and their their power mainly, but, you know, maybe sometimes their coffers as well. But, you know, they don't, they you know, when they're cutting the taxes, they're doing it because, you know, they're, you know, they're friends with or they're connected to an industry that's going to benefit from those taxes being cut. With the implement of, uh, implementation of Brexit, I'm confused as to who's, you know, because it seems to me like the businesses are paying more. Things are getting more expensive for businesses, you know, not just small businesses, but large businesses, all businesses, like the entire economy has has gotten shittier, like, you know, uh, across the entire across the entire spectrum. And I'm like, what the fuck is the plan? What the what the fuck? You, you know, like, you know, because like I thought Nigel Farage and, and Jacob Rees-Mogg and, and Boris Johnson, I thought they were like lying to us about the benefits but there were there were actual benefits that they weren't telling us about that the oligarchy was going to benefit from, right? The, their money masters, the people that they hang out with, the rich people, the oligarchy, right? I was thinking, okay, well, obviously, you know, the 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 promises aren't going to be true, but surely, you know, the Jeff Bezoses of of the UK are going to make out like bandits. That doesn't seem to be the case. So what the f you know, okay. So let's get back to the video. But that's that's what I'm wondering here. I'm still I'm still wondering who with the quid pro quo, right? Who's follow the money? Who's making out? Surely this wasn't just a like, you know, like a, a, an entire situation where one side was bought its own bullshit to the whole point of being super self destructive, right? Like no one no one actually even even the rich people that were supporting this didn't actually have a plan to 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 benefit from it i just find that super hard to believe man i mean really birmingham's been struggling to fund a one billion pound equal That's pay tragic. supplement as well as complications over a new it system the government says councils need to stop what it describes as wasteful spending and then it's provided yeah, an additional yeah. 600 million pounds but that money has come after Someone's years of austerity this, all right here on this estate, they've who's, already felt who's the effects big money of budget now? cuts. This is the local youth club. Around 200 kids use it every week. But they say they're now having to review what services they can keep on providing. And this you is the local charging. library. It only stays open three days a week. The local government association says it's time for a radical rethink about how we fund councils in the medium and long term. Although the government's pointed to financial mismanagement by Labour councils, Tory-led authorities are also struggling to balance the books. One in five local authorities have warned they face bankruptcy, while eight are already in the red. And despite an additional £600 million in funding from government, two-thirds of councils have warned of cutbacks to local services, God, like why? bin collections, libraries and road repairs. Why? Three quarters report that cuts would need to be made in their adult social care budget. Why? On the eve of the budget, in the run-up to an election, the national row over funding can feel remote from people's everyday lives, but the consequences will be felt locally <laughs> as we face the prospect of fewer bin collections, street lights being dimmed, and services shutting. Well, that meeting is still going on. They've got a lot to get through. As well as considering those £300 million worth of cuts, they'll also have to decide whether to hike council tax by an eye-watering 20% over the next two years, and they're not the only councils. The government knows that in the run-up to the elections, this isn't a good look. They've been criticised for somehow trying to link the issue of council cuts to the culture wars by suggesting councils are spending too much money on things like diversity I and inclusion. <laughs> the local government association says that's just a diversion, that more councils have gone bust in the last three years than in the last 30 and as they say it's not just labor-led councils that are struggling to balance their books Darshna, thanks very much Good well God, let's why? talk now to sean davis he chairs the local government association and is the labor leader what did of they Telford. do to the crazy desk guys look what what is this is this a totally different area this must be a totally different area this is like a cross desk 
This, it's not. It's, it's not up. the. It, look at this. Look, what is this? What is this? This is not the channel for. This is not the channel for Crazy Desk that I know. It's the same height though. To Sean Davis, he chairs the local government association and is the Labour leader of Telford and Recon Council he does. in I think Shropshire. It's a cross. Thanks very much for joining us. I mean, by any measure, it is a desperate situation in Birmingham, and it is the public who will pay the price essentially, Bit isn't of it? A fool. It is. We're seeing a perfect storm in local government. We've seen a 27% real terms reduction in our government grants over the last decade. Okay. And we're seeing an increase Chair, oh, in the on, demand for So this, this is the chair local government association. He's a consular. Okay. Reduction in our government grants over the last decade. And we're seeing okay. an increase in the demand for services, but chip, also an increase in the cost of providing those services, whether that be adult social care, looking after children, we're looking after more children than ever before, or temporary accommodation with more people in temporary accommodation than at any point in this country's history. So okay. So that's so that's the shortage is that more people are using their services. Okay. The perfect storm, which is facing an impact on all communities and all councils. Interesting. I mean, Birmingham is not. So this is, and that, and the the reason why more people are using their services is not just because more people are getting old, but because the economy is shittier. Similar to some of the other councils who've also effectively declared themselves bankrupt, in that they're accused of poor management, bad investments. Members of the public will now face, as we've been hearing, either a, you know, a huge hike in council tax and cuts to public services. Who do you think they will and should blame? Well, listen, all councils, almost all councils in the country are in increasing their council tax by 5% and still making cuts in services. There are some councils increasing council tax by f uh, more than 5% and cutting uh, services. What we're seeing is uh, a simple mathematical equation here. Government funding has gone down in real terms by almost 30% and the cost of providing services has gone through the roof. And we're also seeing more and more councils having to cut services in, neighbor in neighbourhoods uh, because of the cost of adult social care and not adapted children. This year alone, 19 councils have approached the government for exceptional financial support, exceptional financial support. And as your report indicated, over half of councils are saying in the next five years, they're looking down the barrel of bankruptcy. But this you, is a systematic issue as a result cases. of government underfunding. You don't dispute in some cases that it's also been poor management, it's also been bad investments. That's been, that's been part okay. of the picture, hasn't Look, it? Look, all councils of all political persuasions have been encouraged to invest, act like the private sector, uh, the government said a few years ago. Of course, invest? there are examples where that's gone well. What? There are examples where that has gone less well. There's also other councils that have got themselves into difficulties by grappling with things, things like equal pay claims. But the fundamental issue here is uh, those are isolated examples. But what we are seeing this is real, a systematic that's, uh, underfunding an of local claim. government. And the, and the sector as a whole, over half of councils not understanding or producing predicting their future in five years' time. And that has a real impact on people's way of living and communities that we serve. I mean, briefly, if you would, the government say they gave councils a nearly 8% uplift in cash terms on last year's settlement, including the £600 million of emergency funding. It is probably not realistic or sensible to expect more, is it? Well, listen, that also assumes that councils put their council tax up by more. Council tax has doubled over the last 10 years, uh, but we welcome any additional funding. But we also need to move beyond these single-year um, funding settlements. We, um, we need to move to multi-year settlements so that councils can continue yeah. to plan services for their communities. Yeah. And uh, I, mean, I mean, in the end, Year, how does this play out for councils? Because, injections you know, of cash. there could be a change in government. It should be like you, a 10-year you know, Your party plan. could... Uh, be the party of government. They've already made it clear they won't spend their way out of difficulty. They won't promise spending on anything that they can't afford to, to fund. But what we also need to see is public sector reform. People are seeing in their communities waste of spending. You know, youth services have gone, antisocial behaviour has gone up. Reductions in social care and um, weights in A&E departments going up. Those two things are more expensive. Our alternative, working with local um, communities and local government, is cheaper and it's, it's better. Better for residents, better for communities and better for the public purse. And we want to reset that relationship between central government and local government. John mm. Davis, thanks very much for talking to us this evening. Okay, well, I, okay, it is a T desk. You're right. It's not a cross. It is. It's the T desk. <laughs> Where she doesn't. She's not drinking tea. Um. Okay, so that's the question. Is it incompetence, um, or is it uh, more people need these services? Times are tougher. Things are more expensive generally.
Um, and uh, these these budgets need to be adjusted, and maybe the the process. You know, he was suggesting maybe the process should be changed to uh, you know uh, you know instead of instead of a yearly. Uh, you know, I guess I guess that what they look at the budget every year. I don't know. It does sound like something that would require at least five years of like you know yeah we're gonna need this much money over five years. I don't know how the system works though, or um you know, how it's connected to things like the National Health Care Service. So I need to know more about this. So what do voters want to see in tomorrow's budget? Improved public services provided by a better funded NHS and enough money for local councils? Or do they want to see tax cuts or cuts to national insurance? Something that has been widely leaked today. Well, our senior political tax correspondent, cuts. Paul McNamara, has tax been to cuts, very huh? different parts of the country to really? try to find out. Tax cuts. They're everywhere. There are more of them than ever before, and they are doing serious damage. Wow, there was a huge one there, yeah, that was massive. Potholes aren't just a problem for Kent Council's Conservative deputy leader, they're a vast problem for the entire nation. But in Kent alone, there is an £800 million backlog to bring roads up to standard, numbers which are going up. Roads are deteriorating faster than, than we can repair them because we don't have the money to repair them. There was a massive cut pothole there. Um, it's like dodge the pothole on some of these roads. Why is it more of an issue now than it was 10 years ago? Because government continues to grossly underfund um, local authorities at every level. And is it is it that basic? It's that basic. It's your government. You're a conservative. Uh, I am at the moment. Yep. The, uh, the, 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 moment. the government <laughs> failed to fund social care, both adults and childrens. We're having to take money out of other areas in order to keep those two statutory services running. Interesting. Yeah, it's cuts. It's cuts. Every aspect of this council's budget is it's being cuts. cut. They've so it, it, the tax cuts. Let me guess. Big chunk of it is tax cuts for the rich. Maybe a couple bones thrown through the lower middle class. Uh, wh wh how old is this video? Uh, this came out just a couple days ago. Wait, March. Yeah, no, just a couple days ago. <laughs> I don't remember what month am I in? Um, so has this budget been? We I wait. I reported on tax increases yesterday, uh, coming out of the UK. Um, not tax increases. I mean the tax cuts, the two P tax cuts. Okay. Had to find so savings that's what was released. around one hundred million pounds, which, with one eye on tomorrow's budget, presents a dilemma for this Conservative councillor. Can Kent? afford cuts to taxes they've got to find the balance yes we want tax cuts so we can put and that and that's a pure conservative value yeah we want tax cuts we want more as leader of the council do you want tax cuts knowing what it will do to your finances well i think the government has got to find the right balance and hold on there's a tax, meme tax I cuts show that puts meme. more money into people's pockets but they've also got to find money for local government so we can deliver the services that we need to deliver so here's you know the, the someone put this uh leon put this in here but you know this th this is perfect i remember seeing this a long time ago but this is you know this is the conservative mindset i usually vote for whoever promises to cut the most tax you know and and when when and whose fault is it whose fault is it Right when uh, when they're intentionally misconstrued, when you say, "Yeah, we got we need more tax revenue," they're like, "Oh, well, they they assume it's coming directly out of them." When it's like, "Well, no, there's actually a lot of incredibly wealthy people who are incredibly comfortable, um, who can absolutely afford to uh, to have more of their taxes uh, increased uh, to cover to cover this wonderful society that they get to, you know." Um, prosperous in you know and it's like and then and then and then they go home and then they go home and they're like oh you know they 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 listen to the nigel farages uh telling them oh this is somehow because of the 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 labor party right this is somehow because they uh, because of them um all right so we don't have time for the rest of this if you want to see the rest of this video it's right here 
But thank you so much to Channel 4 News and your T-Desk. Moving on to the next bit of world news. We got this it, absolutely crazy um, uh, news setup that I need to emulate. I need to, set, I need to have a setup for this. I need to have my own version of like Indian news uh, stage, you know, where I put myself right in the center with some big, let me look at this craziness. But this is so distracting happening back here. You know, <laughs> she's like, whoa, 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 dude, you're about to get swallowed by your midday express logo, dude. You know, I need to, I need to have, I need to have set this up for myself. But anyway, the content of this is really something else. Uh, Myanmar nationals to be deported from uh, Impal airport today. So it looks like uh, things in Myanmar are not settling down. Let's go ahead and have a listen here. You know, Zelensky was famous for before the war started for fixing uh, like a large amount of roads around the country. Even uh, we finally got some repairs. Really? Uh, th before the war started, Zelensky was, you know, uh, was receiving praise because he was fixing roads. I mean, roads are pretty goddamn important, you know, and it's a really easy way to employ a lot of people, you know? You don't need a lot of, uh, you don't need a college degree to, to, to patch up a road, you know? All right, but let's get over here. Myanmar nationals to be deported from Impal Airport today and defunding the army. Ooh, smart moves, Zelensky. The first batch of Myanmar nationals deportation has begun, with seven of them already flown from Imphal International Airport to border town Moray on Friday morning. They will be flown in batches, and 77 Myanmar nationals are set to be deported from 8 March to 11 March in batches, said a Manipur government home department Ooh, order. Every day spices. These 77 foreign nationals will be flown to border town Moray from Imphal Importer International supplier. Airport by helicopters and will be handed over oh, wait, to Myanmar news. officials at Tumu, which is the Myanmar There's side of the international to be border. Wow, the okay. order by Home Department also mentioned that the Myanmar course of deportation will Nepal. be borne by the state government transport department. The immigration officer in Moray has been given the responsibility of handing over process with their Temu counterparts in case of attempted escape by the foreign nationals. They could be arrested without any warrant, be handed over to the nearest police station and also could be charged with IPC Section 224. Among the Myanmar nationals to be deported, 55 are said to be women and five children. Mention may be made that infiltration of Myanmar nationals in a major issue is in Manipur. As Myanmar is going through turbulent political upheaval, their citizens often infiltrate into the Indian side of the border, and Union Home Amit Shah has said that the free movement regime would be scraped and border fencing will be built. Interesting. In what could be done as so the government? So this is so these are Myanmar nationals that are what are attempting attempting some kind of settler colonialism. Is that what we're seeing? To increase the internal security of the state, state government on Friday morning deported around seven uh, uh, Myanmar nationals. Uh, they were flown from Imphal International Airport to border town Moray, from where they will be handed over to uh, 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 officials in Tamu. Uh, State Home Department orders say altogether 77 uh, Myanmar nationals will be deported over the course of next four days. Uh, this is Mubasi Razi reporting for Hornville TV. Wow, fascinating. Fascinating stuff happening there in Myanmar. Um, almost sounds like the, um, what's that U.S. movement? The, um, you know, they think that they're able to, uh, the sovereign citizen movement. It almost sounds like this, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think they were called the free movement or some some kind of free you know they they believe in the i guess they don't believe in the borders of countries almost admirable i'm sure i'm sure if we dug into into them anyone that's a national anyone that's described as a national i'm that's the big that's a big like uh oh <laughs> a supremacist of some sort right um but no that it kind of reminds me of the uh sovereign citizens who are like oh yeah well you know traffic laws don't apply to me because i'm a sovereign citizen you can't arrest me then they get their ass beat <laughs> um i have one piece of canadian news please leave me alone please um but no uh i just wanted to point out that this is the kind of shit that is is the reason why uh, Pierre Polyev is 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 you know the, the polls are looking better for him the conservatives liberals vote against disclosure of arrive cam costs as opposition MPs accuse the government of filibustering so real quick um, you know quick and dirty of the story 
is uh, arrive can was an app that was necessary uh to, to use for travel during covid um it allowed you you know, to preemptively get all of your um uh vaccine data you know to make sure that you were all up to date you were all boosted up and and able to uh take the flight so all you had to do is you know when you landed in canada you had the app uh, so I got to, I got I got a face full of this. I got the full experience of this because that this was like literally while I was traveling, you know, moving into Canada it was COVID was happening. So I had to deal with this app and it wasn't perfect. Uh, but my wife and I were able to navigate it well enough to get our information. And, you know, the process was pretty smooth for us. There were some people who were struggling when we landed and, you know, who had to be assisted with configuring, you know, getting certain information in the app. Uh, but apparently neoliberals picked a company wa that wasted an incredible amount of money you know pierre polyev says oh yeah these jokers uh, were able to make the equivalent in a weekend that's a total lie those jokers made a ui mock-up you know which if anyone who's done programming knows that's incredibly easy to do it's a simple ui prototype uh that you know they, they didn't make the arrive can app because the arrive can app had a lot of different you know functions to it but apparently there was a lot, just a lot of waste, uh, you know, a lot, too much money, a lot of corruption. And of course, some of the uh, liberal government uh, people might be associated with some of these people uh, where, you know, that wasted a lot of money, yada, yada, yada. So what do we see? The liberals now circling their own wagons, protecting themselves and their own corruption instead of being transparent, uh, you know, because they're worried about a win for Pierre over here. And uh, they're voting against disclosure of the costs when they know damn well that eventually people are going to know these costs, but they're, you know, they're they're being slimy about it. And this is the kind of shit that's going to lose you the election, Justin. We didn't we didn't vote for this. We didn't vote for this 14 years ago, Justin. You know, he if you look back to the campaign that he run, it was all about transparency. It was all about eliminating first past the post elections so that we could have, you know, a true democratic, uh, you know, set up here in Canada. All that shit went by the wayside. And now we have the only reason we have the liberals achieving anything like full blown pharmacare uh, in Canada, which is a big, big win for Justin. Right. But the only reason Justin's doing it is because the NDP is holding his feet to the fire. It's so ironic to me that it requires a, a, a progressive offshoot that wants to replace Justin. It requires them to hold Justin to his promises. To his promises. And it's like, you're hopeless, man. And you're what, what you, just like the neoliberals in the United States, with their lies and sliminess, they are creating a vacuum that's that the slimier and 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 you know even even more uh, uh, craven grifters are starting to fill. Because what does Pierre say? Oh, all the all the bad stuff you don't like about Justin, we're we're not going to do that. We're we're the opposite. You know, yada yada yada. Constantly, it's always about Justin. It's always about Justin. It's always about the liberals, right? Because they don't want to talk about what the conservative policies are. Because we all know what the conservative policies are. Oh yeah, same ones. You've seen them before, folks. It's that same old song and dance about privatization, but how we gotta cut, 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 cut. So anyway, I, I don't even hit this article. I'd, I'd have to get the uh, archive. But anyway, that was my Canadian news. Oh, who gives a shit about his fucking wife? Who fucking cares? I care about his, his, his optics. I care about his leadership in this party because the, the lead, a, a real leader would have said, I support this investigation. I had no idea that there was this kind of waste, right? Like this is, this is shameful and I'm going to follow this to the end. And I don't care who gets arrested, my party or their party, but this is unbelievable. This kind of waste. That's what a real leader does. But a coward goes, Ooh, this is really bad for my polity. This is going to be bad for my optics. Ooh, I'm, I'm going to have to circle the wagons. We got to delay this and do everything we can procedurally to make sure we delay this so this is not in the news. Meanwhile, Pierre Polyev over here slam dunking him on social media for obviously ducking accountability, being like, oh, well, uh, conservatives are definitely more accountable, even though the, uh, the fuck they are. 
Oh yeah, conservatives love accountability for other conservatives. Yeah, that's a, that's a historic precedent, right? Put your glasses back on. Fucking a Revenge of the Nerds. Fucking Pierre. Anyway, that was my comments. Canadian news over. There you go. You can you can come back. You can come back from your coma now. The anybody new? I, I'll take the NDP. I'm all my votes, all my support is going to go to the NDP uh, because, like I said, they're the they're the reason why Justin Trudeau is is you know has any victory has any dubs whatsoever, right? He did it with uh, the dental care last year uh, for kids, and now we're getting pharmacare in Canada. Those are big dubs. Those are big dubs, and we we have that because of the NDP. Pulling that out of the neoliberal Justin Trudeau government. So yeah, all my votes go to NDP. You know, they're not perfect though, of course. Guess what? That doesn't exist. But we all know that. So this son of a bitch, this piece of shit, this fucking floating turd monger. The Pope. Over here saying gender theory is ugly ideology that threatens humanity. Maybe you should stick to your lane, homie. Science is the, the science on gender theories is older than the fucking Catholic Church. Okay? Shit goes way back. Way back. Pope Francis on Friday warned of the dangers of gender theory. Oh, the dangers. Saying he had commissioned studies into what he condemned as ugly ideology that threatens humanity. Are you getting canceled, Popey? Oh. Well, maybe you should gild another building with actual gold. I'm sure your God is pleased with that. I mean, are we serious with this? This con man running his own little little fiefdom adorned, you know, in, 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 a, in a fucking palace adorned with gold? Supposed to be some pious, uh, you know, humble representative of uh, greater power. Li living like a fucking king didn't jesus do something about money changers so fuck the pope like i like i needed to remind anybody that i'm not a fan of the pope yeah i'm ripping that picture right in half addressing participants of a two-day conference in the vatican on the uh, evolving role of men and women according to the christian teachings francis said of what he called gender ideology was a threat because it sought to erase the differences between the sexes wrong do i need to say that no no that's not that's not an accurate description of gender theory in, in fact what it is it's a nuanced look at the differences between the sexes it's not an attempt to to merge them all together into a single unisex what a sophomore interpretation have you looked into this for even five seconds? Well, it, it makes me uncomfortable. It makes me, I don't know, scares me. Usual religious fear-mongering ignorance turned, turned into somehow some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of uh, uh, advice, you know? Oh, well, this is my, you know, it's, 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 it's the definition of feelings over facts. Um, I've asked that studies be carried out into this ugly ideology of our times, which cancels out the differences and makes everything the same, the Pope said. I mean, the 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 only argument TERFs and anti-trans people have that has any kind of weight is the sports competition thing. Because there's obvious biological shit happening there that's un you know, that is that goes beyond politics and identity sex and gender we also have that scientific part there and of course sex and gender there's science involved in that as well those definitions you know what i mean that's like literally the only thing they have um that is not enough that issue sports competition and fairness in sports does not justify this kind of language which is basically just you know erasing oh that doesn't exist those are, those are, that's just made up by mentally ill people. 
Yeah, no, Tisriel. I mean, they're they don't know what to do with their thoughts and feelings, you know? They don't know how to process emotions, man. They run away from emotion. They're cowards. Pope met with me uh Mealy, so all is forgiven while Argentina starves. Great. Yeah, no, he he warned everybody. He warned everybody he was going to chainsaw the economy and it was going to be, you know, bad times, but he said things were going to get better. Uh, he's kind of running out of time already. <laughs> Things better start getting better pretty soon. So we should remove... Sec Look, I'm not going to get into this sports debate, right? Because what I think needs to happen is that there needs to be a... lot. There needs to be some kind of trans lobbying organization that says, okay, majority of trans people, we did some polls, we funded some polls... Trans people across the United States, what do you actually think about sports and, you know, and this... So this this is what the because uh, can can we even agree on what the trans community agrees on? You know? There's a lot of different opinions, you know, a lot of a lot of people making a lot of good points. Some and some people making some crazy fucking points. Some points is like, "Whoa, that's nuts." Right? So who's so that that's step 1 for me is I feel like the the, the trans community needs some kind of you know, and obviously, you know, I think I, I would, if I were to pick a spokesman, it would be ContraPoints. But, oh, the, you know, there's a lot of controversy now about ContraPoints. And I'm like, come on. She's amazing. Are you kidding me? We're going to cancel ContraPoints? One of the most, you know, brilliant, you know, uh, thinkers and orators of, of our of our generation she the, the the videos that she's made perfectly explain some of these incredibly complicated and you know, esoteric you know issues that that are very difficult to have a debate especially as a straight person but no oh, we got to have a problem with contrapoints why because she's too successful like oh oh the the she she platformed a a trans person that it you know that has some right wing opinions. Okay. Okay. But no, I think the trans community step one needs a lobbying community. But then after that, I do think that lobbying community needs to have an opinion. Okay, look, you know, um certain amounts of estrogen, certain amounts of like, you know, okay, here's what we here's what the trans community in general agrees when it comes to sports competition. Right? It's, it's quite a debate, you know, and I, I, I'm a straight guy. I, you know, I don't, I don't have as much skin in the game. So I feel like I, I want to fall back to a representative of, of what a majority of the trans community feels like. And, and I, I, I got nothing. So I'm just pulling shit out of my ass. <laughs> it's kind of a, kind of a pun joke, I guess. Can, okay, never mind. Probably homophobic. Good topic to discuss. Sorry, we're moving on to the next story. Robot dog. Welcome back, Jano. Welcome back, borderline feline. <laughs> the petting the fish. Pet the fishy. Oh, our rip. <laughs> um. So, <laughs> Leon. Uh, so no. So this next article. So we'll just leave it at that. Um, is that I? I really. I. I don't know. I want to see contrapoints on. TV. I want to see her on Mor Morning Joe, you know, explaining to Joe, you know, hey, this is what the trans community actually thinks, you know. Um, no, Jano, you see, and that's those Jano that those are the misconceptions. The one that that you just that you just said that's the misconceptions that that a, that a that a you know a mainstream trans lobbying organization would be able to uh, push back on because there's this assumption that trans people are inherently mentally ill. And, you know, there's, you know, there's definitely a cross section. I'm not saying that there isn't, you know, some truth to that, but I, uh, you know, grand majority of the trans people that I've met are actually incredibly strong people who are, they're the main obstacle in their life is society rejecting who they are. Um, no, Jay, no, that's, that's, that's a generalization. You know, that's that's almost that's kind of like the, you know, uh, taxi cab drivers are all Arab. It's like, yeah, I mean, I've definitely had some Arab taxi cab drivers. There's a lot of Arab taxi cab drivers, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean all I've actually had, you know, you know, uh, quite a wide variety. Uh, the best 
experience I had in a cab has to be in London. Um, those cabbies are something else, man. Those guys are bananas. Um, really, really cool conversations I had with some cabbies there in, in London. Leftist community is just drama plus a feeling of intellectual superiority online. Yeah. No, but all right. So that's those are my comments on the trans community, and I, I disagree with, with Jano and his generalizations that, you know, all trans people are mentally ill. Um, and and the reason why I believe that is because I've interacted with and, and, and hung out with trans people for 10 years of my life in the Castro, in the heart of the gay community. And I can tell you, the biggest obstacle in their life is is society not accepting who they are for fucking arbitrary reasons what like you give a shit about the fucking bible jano you know what i'm saying you're over here repeating fears and and bigotry from a from a group of people long since dead following a book you don't even believe in you know what i mean doesn't that bother you that you're repeating ignorances and fears right yo strategy member over there on youtube i got a i got a um advertise that more go ahead and put the link to the youtube channel in the chat we uh, opened up a brand new news underground youtube channel make sure you check it out here's the link we got a live stream going over there if you want me if you want me on your algorithm want news underground on your algorithm live streams eventually once i once the money starts rolling back in for me i will be putting the edited content the curated content on this channel um, the the full live streams will be uploaded to a different channel. <laughs> yeah, you were faster. Congratulations. All right, so moving on to our next story here in world news. Um, God, gosh, guys, did you did you know that those those cute little uh, robots um, that you know that every everyone told us wasn't going to have guns attached to them? Yeah, no. Come on, come on. So China, China over here reporting that these these fucking uh, murder robots are actually more accurate than humans, and of course you know you make you make them bulletproof, you make that you make it hard for you know and look at this, he really he can't handle the the kickback at the moment, but that's you know that's a fixable problem. He's already he's he's compensating for it really well, yeah, he's compensating for it, which is really amazing that he's doing that in real time. But that's that's a fixable problem, right? This is just prototype shit. You know, this this thing could be taken down with small arms fire right now. So that that would be the first thing I would fix. It's America. They would attach uh, guns to anything that moves. I mean, it's just you know, I never, I no one bought it, right? I just think it was kind of funny that, you know, the the company that invented this tech. What what's the name? I can't quite remember the name. But of course, China stole this, obviously. Um, but you know they were they were telling us from the beginning oh these are no we're not going to put guns on this we're not going to put guns on them and it's like no come on, you're putting guns on these fucking things what are you talking about wait till they use them for political neutralizations sure yeah i mean because that's yeah the robots assassinating right who was who was you know who was guilty yada yada um huge implications for urban warfare Anyway, uh, a new Chinese study claims that machine gun armed robot dogs are as accurate as trained human marksmen. I mean, yeah, accurate, but not that's that's not battle ready. You know, that's another five, ten years at least uh, for, for those things to become viable on the battlefield. But we're seeing Ukrainians attach, um, you know, big, big ass, you know, C4 chunks, blocks of C4 and mines to you know, these, uh, you know, that basically look like, let's see here, RC cars. They look like those uh, sick ass uh, RC cars with big ass tires on both sides. See, the, the ones that you can't flip. Let me see here. Can't flip. Yeah, these these kind of things, right? They got big old, big old tires on both sides. So obviously think of a military version of this. Uh, strapping in, you know, a bunch of, uh, like I said, you know, bricks of C4 or just mines. I saw them stacking mines on them and then running these down into the, into, into the trenches there. Um, so that we're already seeing that in Ukraine. Um, this, you know, this technology is, is interesting because you could, you know, you can obviously far more versatile, you know, <clears throat> but yeah, this is not battle ready. 
Not even close. Big waste of money right there. But they're just saying it's more accurate. Um, which, yeah, it's a, it's a computer. Yeah, it makes sense. It's more accurate at shooting a stationary target. Yeah, whoop de doo Look up Metal Gear Rising Revengeance Blade Wolf boss fight to see a little spoiler. Yeah. Um, no, I've... I've... I've played that boss fight many times. I hate Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. Everyone loves that game. I'm actually in the, uh, I'm like the only person on planet Earth that thinks it's a shit game. Fucking controls like garbage. Terrible. Sucks. And I, I mastered that shit, dude. I mastered the timing, okay? I put the work in and it was not worth it. Okay, it was not God hand. All right. People praising that game because the first 20 minutes are really awesome and intense. They forget. They forget. It's actually a terrible game. They, everyone, everyone is praising it. They played it on easy. Fucking revengeance. Uthi drones. Okay. So moving on to our final segment of world news. Uh, some, uh, news about the uh the houthi rebels i feel like all minutes i played were amazing yeah you played it on easy didn't you you did didn't you i put a picture of the rc they used in politics and discord those interested in how it looks oh yeah okay yeah the one i was describing there yeah so here we go thank you um strategy no really oh really you mastered the timing really Really? Did you 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 learn you learned how to use the dull part of your blade and 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 you 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 got all the perfect timings down, really? No. No you didn't. No you didn't, Tisriel. No you didn't. All right, maybe it is just me. Maybe it is just me. I fucking hate that game, dude. I was like, I can't believe they made this. This sucks. This sucks so much. That first thing you have to do when you have to cut that guy's hand off? I was like, what is this garbage? What is this superhuman timing garbage? All right, maybe it's just me. All right. I'll take your word for it, Tisriel. All right. I'm just I'm just convinced the people that are praising that game didn't did, you know, didn't really play it. Like they just played it on cuz when you play it on easy, the game almost plays itself. You just have to like you just have to mash the X button and the box button basically. All right, anyway. Fucking young all you all you teenagers played it. I didn't have any problem with it. And I'm like I'm like I played it in my late 30s and I'm like what the fuck? Fuck this. Maybe that's it for you youngins. Grounded. It's a battle system and there's different events and can damage the perfect blocking. Um grounded the video game. Houthi drone. Okay, so over to, uh, to Houthi news here, the final bit of our uh, world news. Houthi drones shot down by U.S. forces in Red Sea and Gulf of uh, Aden. It doesn't look like they're slowing down. Um, I believe I have heard of... of I, 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 for some, I'm, I'm picturing a different... Uh, what's that Kung Fu? Uh, what's that Kung Fu game? When you're running, it's, it's all about masks, like Absolution or something. That's the game I'm picturing in my head right now. Um. Yeah, borderline. So jealous. Well, let's get All more right, on the situation in the Middle East broadly with our military analyst, uh, Sean Bell. Uh, hello, Sean. Yes, Talk hi. us through a situation which we haven't Paul really Rapper been talking about much on the program today, and that is the situation There's a good reason in the why Red the timing Sea screwed with up those Paul Rapper. attacks from the Houthi rebels. Yeah, good afternoon, Sam. Yeah, we've been uh, hearing that the Houthis have done another series of attacks against yeah, merchant shipping in the Red game. Sea and the Gulf of Aden uh, region. At about four o'clock this morning, there were two series of operations done that their spokesman has announced, one of which was against the bulk carrier, the US bulk carrier Propel Fortune. Apparently, a series of missiles were fired at it. They went into the sea. They missed the ship. Um, there were no casualties, and the ship sailed on its way. The second operation, though, was targeting a series of US destroyers in the region. Um, they claimed yeah, that... 
they are 37 here, inch drones. It, um, we believe some of them will be these Shahid 136 drones. The regular viewers will remember this is what Iran, uh, Iranians have been providing for Russia. They also have been providing them to the Houthis. Now, the US Navy claims that they uh, have been repelling these attacks. They've been using shipborne missiles and their fighter jets, and that they've shot down 15 drones. But all of this follows a whole series of attacks over the last uh, month or so, uh, which the Houthis attacked three vessels successfully, one of which was the Ruby Mar, uh, which we can see the wreckage here under the water uh, in, in relatively shallow um, water. Big symbolic victory for the Houthis. Well, and that's why that. it, this picture keeps coming up, because it absolutely no, is, although there was a later vessel was struck. That... No, we, we talked about this, dude. No way the Houthis wanted this, man. Three people were killed, far more tragic in, in, in my views. But it'd be interesting to see what uh, retaliation the US come up with now, because they don't want the, the work, the efforts to date haven't stopped the Houthis. They don't want to start a war with the Houthis. Houthis have been very clear stop the war between Israel and Gaza, and these attacks will stop. We were getting a pretty bleak picture of the aid situation in, inside Gaza with that interview I was just doing. There are several initiatives yeah. going on by sea, aren't there? We've been looking at, at the airdrops, but there's this maritime <laughs> there's a war corridor crime. and then also yeah. talk of constructing this pier, effectively, which is going to take some time. This but talk us pier. through the maritime this corridor and how quickly idea. we could see it more aid coming in that way. Yeah, this was announced just the other day by Ursula von der Leyen um, from the EU. And the ship we're looking at here is the Open Arms. It's been in um, Limassol at Cyprus for the last three weeks, ready to run this maritime aid corridor just as soon as the details. Now, we understand you can get about 200 pallets on, on this uh, vessel. Um, it's got uh, about a five-metre draft to it, which means potentially it could actually use the port that exists at Gaza and therefore could get straight uh, uh, run ashore. It's already it's a pier. miles from Cyprus to the Gaza. The plan is that they do a round pier, trip guys. every day and that will be quite significant. Um, it's interesting, each of the pallets, we think that this ship can probably carry about 10 truckloads. It doesn't look very big, Sean. No, exactly. It's about 10 truckloads of oh aid. There's talk God. about it also towing a it's barge not even with a 200 tons of rice pier, in the barge as well. <laughs> but if you add all that up, it's about 3% of the daily Hello? need of Gaza. So I wouldn't Hello? want to trivialize it but it is relatively small proportion uh, drop in the ocean the real volume will come when the u.s builds that pontoon uh, area but of course that's going to take weeks not days and in the meantime oh, okay. we've so been reporting on a massive increase in the number bigger. of airdrops but this comes on a day when the palestinian authorities say that four people have actually died as a result of these they are dangerous what? they've reported that some of the parachutes didn't open and struck but even those that where the parachutes have opened there's been some imagery off the beaches which look these are really dangerous when they come down in pop placed it's areas now the u.s have it? denied that any of anybody's died no, but that's the reports we're getting in getting no, the aid in is one matter died. but the crucial like thing the is of course distributing it one of the challenges that my last guest was was talking about uh, talk us through uh, the considerations and, and the complications it's incredibly complicated. No, I mean, Actually, it's exactly as you nothing. say it's one thing getting aid in there but we've been I mean, seeing whatever, the pictures build on the, the beach you know here. build the fucking pier whatever right but a, a pier a pier uh, without doing jack shit about Israel, without carrot and sticking Israel, right? Who are you kidding, man? Who are you kidding? It's of thousands of people. They're so no, desperate ahead, for aid that they're nothing. fighting. There's people, all sorts of tragic situations. So when this, enough, uh, it's not even this close boat, to the a open solution. arms arrives, how do you guarantee the safety of the crew and the boat? But also, how on earth do you get the aid off and distribute it safely? Equitably as well. Uh, yeah, and it looks very likely that the, um, the US doesn't want to put boots on the ground. There's no other appetite for anybody else to do that either. And so security is going to be... How's that going to be provided? I think what's most interesting as well, the time is running out. Tomorrow is the deadline for potentially the IDF going into, um, into RAFA. But I think the big strategic issue here has been fascinating. Right. Up till recently, the West has been unequivocally supporting Israel. Now we're seeing the West bypass Israel, providing aid directly into Gaza. It seems that the West is no longer prepared to sit back and watch with no a grim airport. total of 100,000 casualties and this spiralling humanitarian crisis. All right. Uh, pretty bleak picture, isn't it? Sean, thank you. Yeah, pretty fucking bleak picture there. Let's uh, let's make sure we ignore let's you know let's ignore a big chunk of the problem. Welcome back, Zeo Duke. For the Houthis, but the Brits launching their airstrikes from a trochi with a tanker aircraft. Interesting. Okay. Um. So I don't have time for the whole twenty-minute video here, but once again, you know, just like I was saying at the beginning of the stream. 
This is a fascinating video from a niche YouTube creator. Look at that. Uh, uh, you know, 201K subscribers, up and comer. Up and co He's a comer. He's a comer. But I don't know much about this guy, but just the whole, the whole setup, I would assume he's a career logistics man, and he speaks from a logistics perspective. You know, and it's very interesting about this Houthi story. It's in, it's in, you know, the, the, it's all about logistics. It's all about, you know, what, what is happening with these shipping lanes, how they're taking advantage of it and how the history of this, how, you know, it started off with just pestering and annoyance. And now we've escalated to a full blown, uh, you know, uh, several people dying along with a ship being sunk. Uh, so it's, it's starting to get very, very serious um and uh you know i think like i said i just think this man's you know perspective on this is very interesting very niche look, look at his whole setup this is great like he's, he's you know the naval stuff he's got he's got <laughs> he's got the little port clock he's got the cool lego globe so let's check out this guy once again make sure you're liking and subscribing to this fella here uh really cool what's going on with shipping uh that's the name of his question that's the name of his uh channel there uh no the west Knows they will lose votes. I guess it's a benefit of politicians needed to save face and modern information are democracies. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. And once again, it's like, okay, build the, build the pier or whatever. But, you know, like I said, man, if, this is not a solution to the problem. But anyway, we're going to get to Gaza in a, in a couple hours. This is about the Houthis. Let's get an update here uh, from, this, uh, from this really cool dude. I'm your host, Sam Ricagliano. Welcome to today's episode. Sam, so Sam, it's only a matter of Sam, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> What was his name? Sam blah, 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 blah. I'm your host, Sam Ricagliano. Welcome to today's Sam, Sam, episode. Blah, blah, blah. So it's only a matter of time until this happened. But an attack launched by the Houthis okay, against uh, a bulk right carrier gotta, Barbados right flagged back. vessel, the True Confidence, One minute. has resulted in two missile hits blah, blah, blah. on the vessel. Three crew members have been killed, many others severely wounded. Uh, the ship is adrift in a fire in the Gulf of Aden. The crew has been evacuated by the Indian Navy. The INS Kolkata has been able to get the crew off and deliver them ashore in Djibouti. We're going to take a look at this story, break it down for you and discuss the timeline of events of what happened and what this impact is going to be on global shipping. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell. So I'm going to highlight two stories here for you. One is from Jonathan Sauls over at Reuters. Uh, Houthi attack turns deadly. Uh, in this story, Jonathan discusses the attack, the two missile strikes. We know there is three dead. There was also an armed guard detachment on board. Uh, another story over at Lloyd's List, this one by uh, Richard Meade. Uh, three crew confirmed dead, several more seriously injured as Houthi claim a second casualty. Uh, both these stories are available for you to download and take a look at. This is an image of the vessel released by U.S. Central Command. The vessel was a bulk carrier sailing from China heading to Jeddah in Saudi Arabia on the west coast of Saudi Arabia in the Red Sea. The ship is Barbados flagged. Uh, bulk carrier, she's carrying down in her cargo hold steel. So she's got steel plates and rails down. And on deck, uh, you'll notice are what appears to be buses, uh, large trucks, maybe rail cars. It's kind of hard I'm to tired? identify. Bitch, I'm never, I never sleep. I'm never scared. I'm never scared. What? I'm never scared. What? I'm never scared. Yeah, we have a Discord. Exactly, but these are, are, are oversized cargo. This is not unusual for bulk carriers to carry <laughs> such oversized cargo. The ship was struck on the port side because it was sailing away from the Gulf of uh, Yemen and in, into the Gulf of Aden. I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, you'll see that the missile struck right here. We believe it was two Damn. missiles. One appears to have hit further aft here. Another one more up Great forward job, between Muhammad. the after cargo hold and the house. Uh, it is not remember, unusual. Remember I did the whole sketch where it was like the Houthi pirates like, bro, you know, like, oh, you fucked up. I told you not to bring this guy, man. I told you he didn't know how to use that fucking rocket launcher. Right. They just bring some new guy along. He's got a big rocket. He does has no idea how to use it. He creates an international incident. Fuck, we're supposed to steal it, not blow it up. Muhammad, no. 
available for missiles to strike like, like this like if they are radar guided media. that's the largest part of the vessel that they would hit <laughs> and if they were using infrared then they would be homing in on the ship's engine plant this is a, a view from above you can I mean, see do, do we know it was intentional do we know that this was this was the intention e the the buses or vans whatever these it are rail cars here stupid, it reeks of you can see the damage here like, on the port side of the vessel and fire has swept across the house fire is inside the vessel <laughs> uh the superstructure here contains is it really this easy to take out a ship though i mean i know this is not a battleship this isn't you know this is like a a transport ship but is that all? You just need one missile. You just need one rocket, huh? Some RPG, some... I know that wasn't no top-of-the-line technology. You know what I'm saying? Is that That's really all it takes, huh? ...means where the crew sleep, uh, uh, the galley, where they basically uh, spend their time up on top of, obviously, this the die. bridge, uh, the wheelhouse, where they pilot the vessel, and then down below, underneath all this, would be the engine space. Just after that would be the after machinery room, uh, the rudder, and then forward are all these cargo holds. And the vessel is afire at this point. So this is a video posted on X oh, at India Navy. You can see this is INS Kolkata. This is the same vessel, Injecting by the way, right wing, that was right uh, veins, involved X. in the rescue on board the MSC Sky 2. Uh, there you can see a true confidence on fire. Uh, the crew had abandoned ship. They were not able to get the lifeboats out, so they used a life raft. I'm going to go ahead and let Hey, Tisriel, put, it, put them in the meme section, first of all, and also... Uh, keep the, you know, super gross, nasty shit to yourself, okay? okay? Come on. Fucking, <laughs> who was it? Clutch car? No, it was Chrono Stampede. He put a fucking picture of some kind of, some, some Muppet birthing an egg, and you could, like, see the, it was just terrible. It was so disgusting. I'm like, what the hell is that? I had to delete it. How do you people have these disgusting images on your, on your cellular phones? You're disgusting perverts. Let this play. I'm going to edit part of this video because there is some graphic images in it. However, I'll have a link in the show notes to the full video here. Graphic images. Uh, the huh? uh, they interview the with bodies. the ship's uh, captain, the INS Kolkata's, uh, the destroyer <laughs> captain, said that they lifted eight crew members out of the raft via their helicopter. Wow. Uh, however, they didn't get all the crew members out of the raft. They had to use their small boat because of injuries suffered by well, the crew. Maybe it so the Indians, once again, maybe showing their professionalism. They've been out there doing amazing work. Go back to... Uh, I don't know. I just don't... I don't. Is there is there enough organization amongst the Houthis to, you know, to, to, to claim that it was intentional? You know what I mean? I thought it was just a bunch of pirates that are working... You know, that's like a loose collective of uh, of, of scoundrels and, and pirates who are, you know, working loosely working together because they're 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 making, you know, millions of bucks on the ransom, you know, uh, uh, Marlon Wanda go back to MSC Sky so 2. And now this effort situation. right here yeah. has been really good. They provided not just rescue, but also immediate medical aid Commanders from the for Islamic the personnel on board. Over there, so here you I see their rescue boats enough. heading I out see. to grab uh, the crew members who are too injured to Houthis be moved by helicopter. Spokes, military spokespeople. Okay, so there's some organization the to this still frame ship. in the video okay. talks about the ship's crew. Okay, so unfortunately, I don't have time to get into it. And it is, it is incredibly tragic. Um, so if you, if you would like to see the rest of this from this channel, Make sure you like and subscribe. At least give them the like. Um, I'm going to, you know, let's go ahead and give them the subscribe. We'll see if I'll stick around with it. Because this, he talks about all kinds of like other like mundane, to me mundane. But if you're into logistics, really interesting stuff. You know, niche creator. If you're into this kind of stuff, definitely support him. Give him the like and subscribe. We'll see if we'll keep him on my algorithm. Folks, I'm very excited. Very exciting. Very exciting day. All right, here we go. Okay, uh, I got a brand new segment. I'm happy to announce, uh, you know, because I'm constantly shitting on the neoliberals, just like I'm constantly shitting on the fascistic conservative right. Um, uh, I've created a new segment. All right, is everyone ready? Where's my Where's my drum roll? Put my drum roll here. Oh, there it is. Okay. So much shitting. All right, here we go. Here's the new segment. It's attack from the left. Got him. Yeah. We're attacking from the left. 
Oh, it was such a good idea. Oh, come on, Bolt. But we're gonna. I want to make fun of Nancy Pelosi, but. Oh, leave me alone. Just trying new stuff. No, guys. This is the new segment Attack from the Left. Uh, where I just dig into some of the stories specifically where I'm going to criticize the neoliberals. It's a, it's a pun. See, because I'm normally on the right. I'm on, <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. Yeah, I get it. You're funny. No, we're attacking from the left. Okay? Because, look, the, the neoliberals claim to be liberals. You know, they claim to be... Some of these sh frauds claim to be um progressives and we know that's a joke um it is it is you know like i said earlier it is uh does require a bit of uh tightrope walking when criticizing neoliberals because this is a war against fascism and ultimately you know there are decisions to be made in our first past the post electoral system um, so we have to vote strategically lest we allow right-wing fascists to have complete control uh, let me just hide this right there sorry to hide that from my source the video audio it should be muted but anyway uh, we can't allow the neoliberals to <laughs> What you want me to do the the uh the Whopper song? Dig fries are done. Dig fries are done. <laughs> no, I, the next the next one I'm gonna make is the Indian news one. I want to do an Indian news one where I'm like a small, right in the center of the screen, and I'm like really small with like a big, loud, <laughs> crazy animation happening behind me. With the like, a, like advertisements and stuff going beneath me. But no, let's get to it. Attack from the left. I wanted to dig into the neoliberals here. Um, Nancy Pelosi strikes again with Palo Alto Networks Investments, purchasing two massive lots of cybersecurity stocks. So once again, Nancy Pelosi, how does she do it, folks? Someone, someone tell me how she does it. How does she do it? She, you know, some people have pointed out that she actually has better, uh, a better stock pick um, skills than professional hedge funds that, you know, that make billions of dollars, billions of dollars a year for their clients. Nancy Pelosi seems to know exactly when to buy and exactly when to sell. And gosh, I just can't figure it out. Why is she so good at this, guys? Of course, I'm being facetious. The reason is she, she enjoys a lot of insider trading information. And unlike, uh, you know, unlike regular citizens, she somehow gets to be exempt from this. And we're all just supposed to ignore it. And in fact, she wants to pass laws to make it so that we don't get to see this information, right? Because this is supposed to be a liberal organization. And, you know, they retort with like, oh, you know, you're being hyperbolic. Everyone does it. We, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm a private citizen. I, I can make private decisions. But your track record's pretty clear. And there's, you know, where's the enforcement, Nancy? Where's the enforcement? Right? Where's the, you know, how, how come you get, how come you get away with all this shit? Everyone does it isn't a good excuse. I mean, you should hear some of that. You know, Denny Hassert is a, is a good one if you want to hear a Democrat justify. Was it is it Denny Hassert, right? Yeah, Hassert. No, he's the former. He's the pedophile former Speaker of the House. Oh, I'm thinking of a different guy. He's a, he's a he's a Democrat. Sorry, glad I checked that because yeah, no, wrong person, different Democrat. But there's you should you should hear some of these Democrats justify. Their corruption. Um, it's sickening. It's a bunch of, you know, what, a, oh, so, you know, we're, you know, private citizens, we're allowed to make our decisions. No, 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 no. Nancy, your track record is criminal. You need to be investigated for insider trading. Oh, well, I should be exempt and yada, yada, yada. 
This is, and you know, if you don't think it, it affects you, look what we see now with the neoliberals and their failure to go after, um, uh, you know, Donald Trump truly for all of his crimes, right? To, to, to have an AG that has the balls to go after financial criminals, you know, in that, that currently sit in Congress, right? Both sides make sure they pick an AG that protects politicians. Oh, we don't go after them. They get to be exempt. So this stuff absolutely affects you. It comes back. It's not it's not just innocent. Oh, well, she's a, she's you know, she's one of the good guys, so she should be given a break. You know, I mean, you know, when 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 you weigh out the good and the bad, she's done more good than bad. No, that's actually not true. Weigh it, if you if you were to weigh it out on a scale, it would be actually a lot more corruption than progressivism, leftism. Uh, quite frankly, she's simply everything that's wrong with the neoliberal party and establishment. And she's being celebrated, you know, lionized in her retirement, replaced by someone who's doing exactly the same shit, probably profiteering in the same exact fucking way. Probably less, though, because she gets to be blatant about it because she's Nancy Pelosi. You see the problem. You see the problem with turning these people into cult of personalities, turning them into larger than life people. We talked about this yesterday, I think, with uh, political parties. You know, how political parties should be treated like tools. You know, not extensions of you as a person. You know, you is it useful to you? That's great. Respond to it. Use it. The moment it's no longer useful to you and you start in engaging in voting against your own self-interest for the sake of tradition... You have lost your uh, ability to see the forest for the trees. You see, as a citizen, it's your job to protect democracy, not to protect party. Whatever party wants to uh, sustain liberty, sustain democracy, uh, should take precedence to whatever kind of allegiance you want to have. But we don't see that. We see a tribalism. And, found, and the Founding Fathers, frankly, were quite concerned about this this was not a this is not a new uh development this is not this is not something new the founding fathers were quite concerned it was it might have been jefferson who wanted to abolish you know, political parties like every two or four years or something he's like a full reset or like no abolish or like uh, reset the whole congress or something like that but you know there was there was a lot of skepticism about political parties um and it looks like their skepticisms had come true because there was you know there was concern about tribalism and and all that and that's exactly what we see so the last bit i wanted to show here and yes i'm sorry this is puke worthy this is absolutely disgusting but i wanted the reason why i want to show this is that uh i i, I want to point out how dangerous the neoliberals are because they they are dangerously delusional so here we have top liberal neoliberal supporting nicole wallace and uh rachel maddow having a heart-to-heart about Biden and you know why he's such a you know why he's such a competitor and all that. This is before the State of the Union, by the way. They did this before the State of the Union. This is two days ago. Yeah, this is after Super Tuesday, but before the State of the Union. And and they're just and they're just blowing their load over the State of the Union. So that's just nothing would have changed here. It just would have been more wank worthy. Um. Yeah, Zeo Duke, exactly. Zeo Duke saying alternate power structures are subject to the same corrupting influence as the primary power structure. Yes, yes, yes. The, you know, that that's why the, the system was built with inherent checks and balances that are being in, ignored. And one of the checks and balances that's being ignored is the, the people checking their politicians and voting for representatives uh, that actually, you know, that are they're following through and, and listening and, and actually seeing what their representatives are doing instead of listening to the lies. Um, people are not doing that. That's one of the essential checks and balances that's not happening. But like I said, people are just voting tribally. All right, but anyway, no, I wanted to show this. It's 10 minutes, and I'm sorry. It's wankworthy. Absolutely gross. But I, I need to show you this because at several points, the delusion is, is peak. The delusion is peak. Like, these people are going to be utterly shocked. Utterly shocked. And honestly, I don't know what direction, what direction do you go in if they're defeated electorally by the Republicans, by the conservatives in the next election? 
where do you go? They're all in. They're all in. You would think you would think these people work for the DNC. And it's like, you know, there there is zero, zero pushback to the strategy or anything. And um, quite frankly, it's the reason why that's important is that if if we don't if we don't push if we don't hold them to any account, there's no mandate. And if there's no mandate, they're not going to there's there's no need to govern. So like when Joe Biden says, you know, guaranteed we're gonna we're gonna restore Roe v. Wade, you know, uh, really, really, right? Ow. Uh, you, you you don't have the balls to install more Supreme Court judges to to make the Supreme Court. They could do that. There's a whole procedure to add more seats to the Supreme Court in case the Supreme Court turns into a lopsided nightmare like it is now. Their weak cowards refuse to do it. Precedent, precedent, precedent. You, you to this day, refuse to do jack shit about the filibuster and insist that you need a supermajority to pass everything to get past the inherent uh, filibuster that will be put forward. Refuse to change that because you're cowards. Okay. These are things that neoliberals can do, man. Oh, you know, it sounds pretty insane. Wait a minute. You're telling me they have the ability to get past some of these blockades? Then why are they pretending like they are insurmountable? Why are they pretending that they're insurmountable? Gee, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um... Davin, I mean, sure, whatever. If they want to chat, I got I, I set up. I set up this new email with for this new YouTube channel for News Underground. So I'm gonna have a link tree. So yeah, uh, soon I'll have a link tree that you can you can spread to other people if they want to get a hold of me, talk to me. What does it matter? I guess it'll be all gotta talk to each other. I guess, but I don't want to be a fucking Brady bunch, man. You know what I mean? I don't want. You know what I mean? They get like they get like twelve of you. You're like over here. You know what I mean? You're like you're like you know. Oh yeah, hey, how you doing? Oh, abandoned nihilism. What do you think about this? That you know, with like sixteen other fucking people. I'm not interested in that nonsense. <laughs> you know what I mean? Some Brady Bunch panel. That's what I call them, the Brady Bunch panels. But no, I'll talk to somebody. I guess. All right, but I set this up. Let's let's dig into this before we talk about that, Davin. Hit me up on the Discord. Hit me up on the uh, on Twitch. I'll get back to you. Uh, no problem. All right, so let's get into it. You'll see what I mean. This is just disgusting, and I'm sorry I'm showing this, but this is important because these people are fucking delusional and they need to be called out. This is the last segment, by the way. About sort of the things that are still in the DNA of the two parties that the Republicans fall in line. And the Democrats sort of wait to fall. I think they largely love Joe Biden and what he's done, but they want to be more madly in love with someone or something. And it was on display last night. I mean, Donald Trump has all of this resistance. He's losing like 35 to 50 percent of the primary voters. And Mitch McConnell falls in line after Trump assailed his wife with a racist attack. You could Joe Biden. I mean, and you kept you, know, you cracked me up with, you know, Biden wins 98 percent and then like 2 percent goes uncommitted. And, and, and Democrats are still wringing their hands. Like, well, I don't know. Will Newsom get in? What it, it is? It is bonkers. Can, can you make sense of that for me? I mean, yeah. Why? Why would why? Why? Why would people criticize the neoliberal strategy right now? That is, you know, that is going to get you know thousands, tens of thousands of Muslims to sit sit at home. Why would people? You know, there's only two percent, two percent, right? And so hand wave it away. Like, why don't we just ignore this? There's two different things going on in the two different parties, right? The the Democrats are renominating an incumbent president who has been a very yeah, successful Devin, president. Yeah, I don't know about that. He's not the world's most popular president, I'm but he's been very successful. Lots of bipartisan legislation. All the stuff he said he wanted to get done, he's mostly gotten done. We've got this really like best in class economic recovery post COVID of all of the big countries in the world. Everything that he's set out to do, he's done, and he's kind of done it on the terms he said he was going to do it. Joe Biden got in there saying, "Listen, I'm going to be the president for everybody, and expect all my big legislative stuff to be by." partisan and that's exactly what he's done no no and there's another big lie too coming up that i'm going to comment on but i just wanted to say no that's no correct so the democratic party is like marching down the middle lane of normalville right 
Republican no. Party is engaged in a different project. And this is true. there's a reason that nobody in the Republican Party cares that the Republican controlled Congress isn't making any policy say. Um, there's a yeah. reason nobody knows what Donald Trump's policy is on Gaza say. True. There's a reason nobody in the Republican Party is contesting what's going on with Joe Biden because they have a different idea for what we should be doing on infrastructure. There's just no governing talk happening at all in the Republican Party. It's instead about this idea that America is a disaster. America's in decline. America's being laughed at. America is humiliated. And there must be extreme measures taken to fundamentally change the course of the country or we're all going to die. Okay. So that, that is a perfectly accurate description of the new fascistic right. She's too cowardly to say fascistic or fascist in any way, right? She just simply refuses to do that. Welcome back, Ponder Monkey. Um, but, okay, my beef, it's, it's great. I'm seeing a lot of acknowledgement of Project 2025 and the fascist agenda and, and all this. And, and, some, and sometimes you will hear the word fascist on here in describing the conservatives. A lot of the, you know, autocratic, authoritarian, you know, they try to be safe. Um, whatever, whatever your word is, dictator. Um, my problem with MSNBC is that they acknowledge this, but then there is literally no comment about the current strategy to combat this, right? Where are the, where is the Rachel Maddow 40 minute, uh, segment about the voting rights act? Okay. When are we getting the voting rights act? Hey, remember that voting rights act that was supposed to pre prevent the rise of fascism? She'll do 45 minutes on Ted Cruz and, and, and the, you know, and Jim Jordan and, and, uh, uh, my God, Steve Bannon and, and, uh, Charlie Kirk and, you know, and all these, and all these characters, she'll, she'll do, you know, 45 straight fucking minutes, really great stuff. Factual journalism doesn't spend a single minute of that. Talking about, okay, these characters are basically running unchallenged. There really doesn't seem to be any kind of attempt to call them out for seditious behavior. There doesn't seem to be any pushback whatsoever, uh, you know, by talking heads. You know, there seems to be just, you know, total uh, obliviousness coming from the neoliberals when it comes to this uh, fascistic threat. You know, there's, you know, things are being ignored, uh, uh, you know, and then, and then, you know, their MSNBC is doing a very good job of ignoring some of the polls, some of these legitimate polls that are coming out and uh, showing Biden, uh, you know, almost neck and neck with Donald Trump. And, you know, it's because they're carrying water. They, you know, they feel like it's they're obligated to their owners feel like they're obligated to ignore certain criticisms about the neoliberals to protect them for the election. But they're basically running that, that mode 24 seven. There's never a pre period where MSNBC gets more critical. Like during the primary season, it doesn't, you know, maybe once in a while you get an interview with Bernie Sanders, right? Once in a great fucking while, right? With a little bit of pushback, but these, these hosts never do that. And their assumption is that the neoliberal strategy is correct. They're they're knocking it out of the park. They're doing everything they can. They're all shucks. They're just the, the the only resistance to their big progressive agenda is you know are, are these nasty Republicans and and they intentionally ignore the the actions that could be taken that would actually that would you know like you know like I said before the filibuster. Where's this Voting Rights Act? You know, and she's gonna make she's gonna make she's gonna say some shit that's just incredibly. Uh, false when it comes to Joe Biden's agenda and how much he's actually achieved of that. So let's wait for those comments. Those are just two different things. And what that latter thing is, the reason you've been doing this series on autocracy, is, is not the project of a governing party. It's a project of a party that is trying to get rid of the form of government that we have and install something else. Yeah. But Factual. where I where I lose the plot is that is that the Republicans are the re to the degree that the country's in any decline, it is the threat of a second Trump turn. I had former Australian. So, I mean, no, that's that's factually not true, you know. And it's there there is a failure for, for, of the neoliberals to govern for the middle class to help the middle class, and and you are intentionally ignoring uh, all kinds of uh, you know failures, local and national, by neoliberal uh, politicians. Uh, to come through for their constituents, they're pocketing money. They're 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 super corrupt. 
Uh, look, I mean, you know, one look at Cory Booker's record, uh, you know, where, you know, it's, and, she, and her said, well, I just don't understand why people don't like neoliberals more. Like, how, things are really great on paper. Didn't you see, don't you see these numbers that we keep repeating over and over again? The economy's doing great. It's doing gangbusters. Everything's doing the best, most progressive, most successful president in history. I can't believe people don't like it. And it's like the reason why people don't like because there's a real economy, there's a fake economy, and you are intentionally focusing exclusively on the fake economy, and you've and you've done that for so long, maybe your entire fucking life. That is like your myopic fucking uh, you know, porthole that you look at the fucking world. Meanwhile, you know, gas is still like over what, four bucks a gallon? Right? What the fuck? That's new. That was that was new just a couple years ago. The food, you know, uh, price of milk, eggs, bread. That shit ain't going down. Well, I don't. I mean, I'm a millionaire. I can I don't know. It's you know, things are going great. I look at the stocks. No, stocks are great. Yeah, Nancy Pelosi's doing great. All right, but the real folks, the real people, these kitchen table folks that that fucking Morning Joe likes to talk about. <laughs> anyway is that is that the republicans are the re to the degree that the country's in any decline it is the threat of a second trump turn i had former australian prime minister malcolm turnbull on also and a I said, failure of the neoliberals to govern five eyes intelligence sharing he said i don't know yeah i mean america becoming a threat which is what it becomes a threat to the world order if trump is reelected, is a known known to quote Don Rumsfeld, it yeah. is a known known, and and, it's a known and unknown. I don't know if if former Defense unknown. Secretary Mattis or, or 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 Mark Milley will come out and say those things, but everyone in the national security establishment who worked in and was around the Trump term will tell you that, and and what they would say privately and by the yeah. end publicly is America yeah. and and the, and the party that you are bending over backwards for to 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 you know to hold their diapers in place. Uh, is is losing it, man. They're losing it. Their strategy sucks. This Clintonian strategy of like, yeah, well, you know, I mean, like that State of the Union, like I said, there were some solid promises there. You know, are are the surrogates really going to be getting on TV, repeating that shit 24-7? Where are the Democratic sur surrogates, right? So, yeah, this is the agenda. This is the plan. Like, you know, America 2.0, bitch. You know, you you know, taxes cut for the middle class and bop, zap, 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 zoop, right? Or is it just a bunch of words and fire and fury? And then it's kind of back to, yeah, well, we're not the Republicans. We're not the Republicans. We're not the Republicans. You can expect less, you know? I mean, you can expect, you know, status quo at best, you know? All the corporate gains, those are not going to go away. You know, all the... All the money the corporations made, they're not going to be punished at all. And any changes made that benefits them, there's, that's going to stay in place. We're not going to challenge them. So your life isn't really going to get any better. But, you know, we're going to do our best to make sure your life doesn't get any worse from here on out. We, we promise. If that's the message, right? Yeah, you're going to get about 50 fucking 50. Right? And, who's, if, if, and, and who do you think Nicole Wallace blames for Hillary Clinton losing? Right. Oh, them dang progressives. Oh, them dang them lefties that just refuse to vote for Hillary. Except if every goddamn person who voted for every other person except for Hillary voted for Hillary, she still would have lost. She looked like a wet fucking blanket next to fucking uh, a, 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 a carnival barker. That's how embarrassing she was. America can survive one Trump term. It won't survive a second. That is a fact of yeah. uh, the view of those who your party were tasked with protecting our national security during his presidency before Thanks, Mary and, Garland. And, and and probably some are, are still in those agencies. And yet how many how many how many segments on Merrick Garland you think Nicole Wallace has done? Right? Uh fucking uh, yeah, yeah, a whole bunch. A whole bunch. She's real concerned. At Mitch McConnell. Yeah, Baron Trump, yeah. Fucking gigantizoid. Who has access to that? If I have access to that information, Mitch McConnell does too. Endorse Trump today, because the Republican Party is Talking engaged in a group decision that they are trying to change yeah. what the United States is. Right? Yeah. I mean, 
Yeah. If you yeah. want to support the, the idea of America as a democracy, democracy. we are a multiracial pluralistic society with lots of different kinds of people yes. and economic freedom yes. and all of the other civil society things that support us being a big, complex yes. society. No, we're it's lose really it all, hard man. to have for centuries a pluralistic, egalitarian democracy. There are very few of these in the history of the world. And if you don't want that, if you don't want everybody to have a say for us to decide what we're going to do based on democratically held free and fair elections, then you have a party here. I mean, there, when Trump used violence yeah. and fraud yeah, and intimidation to, to try to throw out election Democratic results experiment. and stay in power anyway. Yeah. The response of the Republican Party was not to be horrified. For the most part, the response of the elected and leading Republican Party was to enough. figure out how they could help him get away with it. And McConnell, this brief and shining moment where he orchestrated the acquittal of Trump in the Senate so that Trump would, Trump would not be banned from holding federal office ever again because he said yeah. the courts will take care of it. I and then all the shocked, justices who he... By the way orchestrated getting onto the court said if you're no, shocked, we are not going to take care of it and now McConnell and we're going to make sure that no that, that judge Chuckins I mean we're going to make sure that no court spineless. Can take the courts care. will not will not save us here the only thing that will save us here is if the what I believe is, only is the pro because of democracy supermajority in this country decides we're not only going to stand up for democracy in the abstract by saying nice things about it, we're actually going to use our democracy mm -hmm. to stop this iteration of the Republican Party from getting rid of it. The Republicans have to not be counted on to sort of do this themselves. Mm -hmm. We can all see what's happening in the Republican Party now. There was a primary, didn't work out to oust Donald Trump. There was a chance for leaders like Mitch McConnell to literally have Donald Trump barred from ever holding Are you federal surprised, office again. Rachel? They didn't do it. We Are saw you Republicans on the courts who have yeah. lifetime tenure. No, I mean, so this is, it's amazing, right? They list off all these things. Wow, totally and utterly shameless. And then they continue to praise Joe Biden when he's like, I'm still interested in bipartisanship and I want to work with and I'm, you know, I'm really sad to see Mitch McConnell go and it's you know I know we butted heads a lot in the past and like statesmanship presidents wow wow he gets he gets pissed on the face with such honor you know what I'm saying it's the same it's like what is it Rachel what is it right is this a real threat or not right I mean so the, the totally accurate description of Mitch McConnell over here do, do, do the do the actions of the neoliberals reflect the severity of what she describes? I don't think so. I don't think so. That was time better when I hit the button. You know what I mean? <clears throat> that That's my problem here. It's like going to a strip club, dude. You're not allowed to get off, right? You get you get rock hard. You're like, yeah, give it to me. Give it to me. Now fucking slam dunk it. And they don't, dude. You're left totally fucking waiting, dude. Got to drive home. I've never been to a strip club. I assume that's what happens. You just drive home with a boner. <laughs> Not everyone takes a thousand dollar hooker home, I assume. But that's what MSN feel, MSNBC feels like uh, as a progressive. Because it's like, yeah, give it to me. Yeah, this fucking description of the fucking fascist takeover. Serious threat. Th serious threat. W what about, you know, okay, so what, you know, why are the neoliberals you know, faltering and floundering? Oh, they're not. They're actually doing great. And the economy's doing wonderful. And you're looking out and you're like, what? What? I, I, I just took an honest look at the whole situation. The neoliberals are absolutely not doing great. You know, like this is like the, the, in this scenario. Donald Trump is, you know, in the situation that he is in, the neoliberals, this should be, a, you know, the poll numbers should reflect a slam dunk. Like, yeah, grand majority of people are like, yeah, okay. I mean, we got the crazies over here that are diehard Trumpers, but obviously Joe Biden's going to win in a grand majority of locations. That is not the case. That is not the case. Um, and that is, yes, that is a failure. And they're all like, oh, I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. And th the reason is, is that the neoliberals are not the left. The, these so-called liberals are not governing. And, and you are carrying water. And it's like, do you know? Do you know? Or do you just buy? Do you just sniff in your own farts, man? You're just like you're literally in this weird, you know, it, it, your own version, your own bubble, right? Your own bubble. Your own delusion, very similar to the fucking fascistic conservative right, who's like, you know, every, everything is like different. What is it? I don't know. I don't know what it is, man.
protected from the kinds of blowback that other politicians might be worried about, nevertheless get in line behind their partisan patrons. The you Republican right, Party brother. will not save us here. We cannot wait for the Republican Party Absolutely to not. wake up. Nothing is going to happen inside yes. the Republican Party other yes, than Rachel, yes, efforts we can't wait to for them get to wake Donald up. Trump yes, what he the wants, Republicans. which is to get rid of our form of government. The yes. only way the country gets saved is if Republicans are blocked by the Democratic process because Democrats win instead. That's the only thing left to us. Yeah. So, so what, you know, so this is a pretty serious threat, right? So just, so just give them a, give the neoliberals a total pass, carry their water. Strategy was right. Even though we have an, a, a perfect example of how the Clintonian strategy failed last time with Donald Trump, let's repeat those same mistakes. Let's defend those mistakes. And, you know, and let's just use the strategy of shaming Right, because voters love to be shamed at the polls. That works, right? That doesn't make people fucking disgusted in the process and just want to sit out the whole experience, right? You know, smart eggheads like you being like, well, you know, if you, you know, you know, you don't want to, you, I know you, I know he's a corporatist, and blah, 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 I'm carrying a bunch of water for this, you know, for this obviously corrupt party, but you know, you, you basically have no choice, and you're, you know, if you don't, you support this, you support this, uh, you know, this conservative party, and it's like, yeah, okay, you know, uh, you know, uh, Manhattan elitist. What is it like? I mean, I, I always try to get an answer to this question because it's it sort of I'm burning with curiosity about it. But what is it like for lifelong progressives to have Magaconda, to hold space it's a plan for Republicans for to be in their it's coalition a plan for, you know, if all they have in common is a love for our democracy? Yeah, I mean. Listen, I, I have always felt like, you know, I'm a I'm a liberal and uh, as as liberal as they come and always have been. Um, but I've always felt like I had more in common with people who care about what happens to the country um, than people who don't care, who are checked out, who don't think it matters. Even if you have radically different ideas. I mean, about I'm thinking what, of your interview with Liz Cheney as yeah. you're talking. Yeah, like come I mean, back so we can fight about stuff later. But <laughs> there is there is nothing on which I agree with Liz Cheney. Like even the easy stuff we don't agree on. Like we both fish. I hate the way she fishes. <laughs> you know, like it's, like it's, I mean, not exactly, but you know what I mean? I mean, it's absolutely everything. But if you care about the future of our country, that is grounds for us to work together. But I do think we have to recognize after Super Maybe Tuesday last night, I after agree. Mitch McConnell today, now with Nikki Haley out of the race, I really, th and now with the Republican appointees on the courts doing what they have done at the highest court in the land, I really think we need to get clear about the fact that the project of the Republican Party is to install a strongman form of government in the United States and get say rid the of word, democracy. Rachel. And that is the project say of the Say the word, Ray. She can't, she's such a coward. She can't say the F word. She can't say the D word. She can't even say the autocrat word. Look at how she still continues to tiptoe. Yeah, no, Rachel, you're right. But do you think we're going to get there? With uh, you know, with uh, with 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 we with weak academics like you, don't you think we need some firebrands? No, we had to get rid of Mehdi Hassan. No, that was a smart decision. I bet you Rachel Maddow said fucking shit about that, right? The exact kind of uh, academic firebrand, you know, person who's really to the point is has no problem challenging, uh, you know, Israeli representatives to their face. Your network got rid of them. Rachel couldn't even put him on the main channel. Hell, you got him on the goddamn online shit. Still couldn't handle it. Still couldn't handle Mehdi Hassan. Had to get rid of him. Where's where's your call out on that, Rachel? Form of government in the United States and get rid of democracy. And that is yeah. the project of electing Donald Trump. That's and that's right. what the Republican Party is for now. That's and right. so if you have been part of the Republican Party, you have to They're recognize that that's now the new project of your party. And you may need to leave that party now in order to work with the rest of Americans who disagree with you on a lot of different things, but who want our country to stay a democracy. Sure, technically and that, correct, but that shit ain't happening. We're just in that extreme a place. And how do you unbraid how tongue-tied democrats get trying to communicate that they want oh sweet jesus thank you here we fucking go is this really tongue-tied yeah the neoliberals tongue-tied yeah let's call let's call an utter disastrous failure to communicate for the last several decades as tongue-tied i'll take it one more time for that as i see that hear that sweet fucking you know moderate milk toast pushback but sweet god i'll take it one more time you unbraid how tongue-tied Democrats get trying to communicate that. They want right. to bring their white papers and they want to solve all the policy. How do you make them just say that? <laughs> I mean, you just say it, right? I mean, you just do your best. And Nicole, I feel like one of the things that is, um, that we can't
keep coming back to, and I so appreciate you being willing to talk about like the big, deep, dark stuff alongside the daily news. That's thing. all I want to talk about. When they're like, there's breaking news, I'm like, just wait a minute. Just wait a minute. I got two hours. I have a historian who I want to talk to. Oh, I was desperate to get to Tim Snyder yesterday. They're like, but Super Tuesday. I'm like, oh, all right, fine. But Tim Snyder was brilliant. He's the here. best. I mean, listen, the, I feel like the reason that I've been spending the last year and a half basically just reading history all the time is because what we've learned from history is that no, there isn't a magic bullet. The courts don't save you. No individual I institution know, right. saves you. All that stuff. But what does save you, what people count on, what matters is for us to all keep making the case. Right. Explain how authoritarian is. There's one fucking party in charge right now. There's one political entity that has gobbled up the entire left, you know, universe, the DNC, that have, that have you know, if you're progressive, you either go through the DNC or you get annihilated. And she's all like, you know, there's just nothing more that they could do. There's just, they have all the power. They have all the control. And there's just nothing more we could do. The best we could do is just keep doing our 40 minute academic rundowns on TV and just, I guess, cross our fingers and hope for the best. This is what your average MSNBC wine mom is gobbling up, dude. It's pathetic. It's pathetic. Thank you, Nicole Wallace and Rachel Maddow. That is the ending of our Attack from the Left segment. I had fun. I had fun. <laughs> Moving over to an old, an old favorite, an old favorite. Here we go, on the right. Hey, look at that. Movie magic. Over here. Nope. Over here. I do need to change the background. This is far too distracting. This this was distracting the hell out of me. This liquid background. This was so cool. It was utterly distracting. I need to change this. <laughs> I was like getting mesmerized by it, dude. All right, but no, we are moving over to... What is up with the fascists? Yay, what's going on with those right-wingers? The good old insurrection update. The, in the insurrection never stopped. For, tell me I'm wrong. They, they, th this insurrection, they never, they never denied it. They never apologized for it. In fact, they're doubling down on it. They say they want to do it again. The insurrection never stopped. In fact, I think it's fair to say that this was a trial run. Um, with that said, I don't think the next the next uh, inauguration they're going to have the balls to do it because they know that the police are not going to be fucking around. They know that Trump is 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 not in charge of the Capitol Police. He did not put a you know a Trump flunky in charge of the Capitol Police. That you know that they, they don't have a Trump in charge who's who's not going to call the National Guard for several hours, giving them as you know as much time as possible. So I think a lot most most people are going to puss out on the next inauguration the security is going to be gonzo the security is going to be pornographic right um but we'll see unless they win then you know god the despair the despair that will that will be cast across the country if the conservatives win Oh, Lord. For my German view, a starter would be if Supreme Court justices weren't elected for life, but for a term. I, I think I agree. I think I agree fully. Uh, it shocks me that there there is there. Uh, I'll have to look it up to confirm it. But I'm almost certain that there is a process that the, 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 the liberals could could engage in in adding more seats to the Supreme Court. They would just need to add, I think, one. Right. And and they get to appoint the person to the seat. The reason why they say, well, we don't, we won't do that because, well, then once the Republicans get in charge, they'll just appoint, um, you know, they'll just make it lopsided again. They'll appoint someone. Say, okay, whatever. That's, that's a problem for later, right? That's a problem for, you know, for later. But aren't you, you know, look what the damage they've already done with their, with their, you know, aren't, you know, wouldn't you want to use every tool in your tool belt to fix that? Oh, no, no. Tradition, tradition, tradition. We're... You know, 
we're uh you know we're um lap dogs we're you know doormats right you can have my social security check when you pry for my cold dead hands lenny i want to double your social security check so uh lenny over here would probably uh, uh, know this guy tom hartman here old school um old school political commentator you know a little bit of a mixed bag during the bernie era you know he played games with elizabeth warren uh with that said pretty pretty steadfast progressive pretty steadfast progressive uh all throughout you know definitely don't fully agree on everything but tom hartman deserves props thank you tom hartman um, he just had a little bit, you know, I just wanted to start off with this just as, you know, it, you know just as what we were talking about. So we're, we're done talking about the neoliberal failures. Uh, now it's fair to talk about these unrepentant, shameless fascists who absolutely have no shame in telling us exactly who they are and exactly what they want to achieve in this country. And why, you know, and the reason why I'm taking it so seriously, the reason why I'm dumping all over these neoliberals. Nowadays, it's less about qualification, but about the age, the younger, the better. Sure. All right, so here we go. Peter Montgomery, the research director with the Overseas Right Wing Watch, People for the American Way. Yeah, so if you don't know what Right Wing Watch is, it's a great organization. They put out a bunch of uh, videos. I've, I've shown a bunch of them. Right Wing Watch is great. They watch all this right wing content and they, you know, they pick out the most fascistic nuggets and they, they really give us a look. You know, here's here's what they really think. Here's what they're really talking about. Um, you know, and it's, you know, these people are not just kooks. A lot of the time, these are people that are talking to politicians, people like Nick Fuentes, like they are interacting with politicians, you know, Charlie Kirk saying some incredibly racist stuff during Martin Luther King day. Uh, and then he's of course, working very closely with right-wing politicians, right? IPFAW, rightwingwatch.org or pfaw.org are the websites, Right Wing Watch on Twitter, People4 on Twitter, Pete Mont, P-E-T-E-M-O-N-T. Yeah, uh, so Peter right Montgomery's wing watch is great. Uh, uh, well, X handle. Uh, Peter, welcome back to the program. I, uh, I, this Project 2025, you've been writing about it, and I, I think a lot of people, you know, they've heard about it, but they really don't know what's going on, or they think it's just some little thing that the Heritage Foundation came out with, you know, this following on its uh, mandate for leadership that goes back to the Reagan era. I, number one, what is it? And number two, how is it different from previous efforts to help Republican presidents? Sure. Well, in the Heritage's own words, and it's a plan to take the reins of government uh, when Trump or another Republican president takes office. So they uh, believe that Trump— And the, the last analyst we saw who was on Morning Joe and, and only talked about this for five minutes before he started plugging his book, um, you know, his, anal his analysis was is that it was less of a gutting, uh, a, a prescription to gut these departments— but more to, you know, definitely cut and streamline, but really more to, you know, uh, you know, weaponize them and use them for their own purposes. Um, you know, you know, not, you know, they, they understand how powerful these institutions were, are, and they want to use them for their own, you know, conservative, nefarious things. So I guess, I don't know. <laughs> what would an EPA that's pro-pollution, uh, you know, try to achieve? Right. God help us. All. It'd be like some, uh, you know, Captain Planet cartoon, but a ship just dumping pollution in the ocean for no fucking reason other than to be evil. Like what, what, what would an EPA dedicated to, you know, poisoning the American public look like? I don't know, man. Was uh, stymied in his first term from accomplishing all that the right sure, Davin, yeah, would have wanted him to accomplish. So oh, yeah, they of course. have Sorry, set forgot. a game plan. They have a 900 page battle plan uh, for every uh, uh, government department and agency. They have plans to purge tens of thousands of professional civil service employees to replace them with MAGA loyalists. Yeah. So Trump Partisan doesn't have loyalists. to uh, stumble over anybody telling him Not what he wants to do brother. is against the law, as he did in his first term. And they want to uh, end the independence of uh, law enforcement agencies like the FBI and the Justice Department, as well as uh, independent agencies. Yeah, so they don't want to remove them. They just want to remove their independence and make them a weapon of their new authoritarian government. 
agencies like the Federal Communications Commission, which oversee the media. Yeah. And they want to so do the that. FCC will be weaponized by the right wing and then go after MSNBC and shut their ass down and then replace it with One America News, yada, yada, yada. So that Trump can use the full power of the federal government yeah. to take revenge on his personal and political enemies. Yes, so that's right. That's, it's yeah, in there, on dog. one hand, you could say this is uh, part of the tradition of heritage, which does these mandate for leadership policy wish list documents that they've done since the Reagan administration. Yeah, partner monkey, yep. But this is uh, just Stab an order him. of magnitude different. He knows what to do. In, in addition to laying out this back. The, the dictator would prefer to take over without violence, but he's happy to use it to secure it, right? Battle plan, they are uh, recruiting and pre-vetting uh, thousands of <laughs> MAGA loyalists yep. to fill the jobs Artisans. that they hope to create by firing uh, the professional civil service employees. That's right. And uh, I saw them Real at scumbags. CPAC. Uh, Heritage was there recruiting people to uh, get their footage. names in the database. Wow. Uh, they're, they're, they're trying to come up with 20,000 people because they're going to do Schedule F. And, yeah. And so, no, no, literally, they're, they're doing pre, like, this is all part of, like, Steve Bannon's initiative, and, and Charlie Kirk, I think, is involved as well. But, no, they're pre-recruiting people that, you know, have some kind of experience, you know, not just, like, schmucks off the street. I don't even know how to use a fax machine, right? No, like, you know, somewhat mild professionals, right, that are ready. It's like, yeah, no, I'll switch my job, I'll quit my job, and I'll, I'll join this initiative. Uh, you know, ready to go, ready, you know, ready for this mass purge and replacement, um, filling these positions with hardcore MAGA loyalists. It's legitimately happening, man. Yeah, it's sounds pretty fucking fascistic to me, man. It really does. It really does. Welcome back, Davey. It's your boy. Fire basically the the cream, the, you know, the the top Devin, level of Democrats management. Democrats agree with all right federal wing agencies in America. Do I have that right? Uh, policy. That's right, and 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 maybe not just the top level. One of the groups that is uh, part of Project 2025 is actually focusing on more junior people. So they're recruiting young people who uh, watch the Bannon show online and others to be ready to be the foot soldiers, to be ready to That's fill right. lower level positions. So they're That's looking right. not only at the cabinet and the managers, but really uh, how to um, you know, just have give Trump total dictatorial control over the over the executive branch. I've been been watching the Heritage Foundation slide farther and farther to the right. I mean, uh, a decade or so ago, actually, we used to get guests from there all the time. In fact, our our studio when we were in Washington D.C. was literally the building next door to the Heritage Foundation, which they eventually bought, and and we ended up uh, having to move the studio. Um, but uh, you know, they, they they seemed reasonable. And then uh, Jim DeMint came in, and, and they started getting very, very Republican partisan. Prior to that, it, it, my sense of it had been that they had been more about conservative, you know, individual conservative issues. And now they've got this guy, Kevin Roberts, running the place, and he seems like almost a, a, a QAnon guy. I mean, how, how, how radical has the Heritage Foundation become, or am I misreading this? No, I right. think you're exactly right. We'll That's the trajectory. They were always very conservative. They, uh, you know, often were very kind of intellectual. They had a lot of uh, intellectuals on staff and, and, you know, would have policy debates. But uh, Jim DeMint really started moving it to the right. And as you said, uh, Kevin Roberts, the current president, is just full on MAGA. And he's, he's very clear about that. And um, yep. the guy that they have running Project 2025, you know, is uh, just clearly a flat out culture warrior. He's always on Steve Bannon's show. Uh, recruiting people, talking about, um, you know, the the MAGA agenda that they're going to be able to uh, to do. And, you know, one of the other people who's part of this is Stephen yeah, Miller, yeah. who uh, most people know as the architect of Trump's, uh, you know, severe anti-immigrant policies. And he's been bragging about how aggressively Trump's anti-immigration policies will be, but that's not it. That's not all he's talking yeah, about. Yeah, monkey. This is it. Yeah. CPAC. And, and it's money well spent. You know what I mean? It's money well spent. Uh, just talking about it's how um, conservatives have to jettison uh, this libertarian ideology, which used to be the hallmark of CPAC, and just to to embrace the raw use of government power to uh, punish fascism. their enemies and to impose their will. And <laughs>
Oh, it's so funny. It's so funny to see because, you know, the fascist, you know, saying the word fascist allows, uh, you know, allows the right to weaponize, you know, like, oh, uh, what's the definition? You don't know what you're talking about. You're being hyperbolic. Blah, 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 blah. It is. It's just so funny to see to see people who clearly know what they're talking about. Clearly, they know it, but they don't want to use it because, you know, because of the silly games we have to play semantically. It's just so fucking funny. It used to be the hallmark of CPAC and just to to embrace the raw use of government power to uh, punish their enemies and to impose their will. And Autocracy. we've seen the whole conservative okay. movement go in that direction, whether it's Ron DeSantis or whether it's the oh, Heritage Foundation and the increasingly aggressive uh, Christian nationalism we see throughout the Republican Party and the MAGA movement. Yeah. And Steve Bannon is, is cynically um, uh, adhering to this, to this Christian nationalism, when you when you hear him speak, it's very much from this, you know, this this you know, biblical sense of liberation, right? You know, like we're freeing you from the shackles, right, of their of the liberal perversions. Yeah, this piece that you published on Project Twenty Twenty Five, we're talking Peter Montgomery. Uh, the, I I read it over at PoliticalResearch.org. Um, you you note that uh, First of all, you're quoting one of these Project 2025 Here people we go. who Let's says, get into this, though. when the founders spoke of pursuit of happiness, what they meant might be understood today as, in essence, pursuit of blessedness. Uh, this is an individual. There it is. That is an individual. Total misinterpret, intentional misinterpretation to turn, you know, what, you know, what our founding fathers created, which was separation of church and state into, oh, no, this was, it was actually all Christian, to, you know, that, that was all just a big, you know, whoopsie, you know, that wasn't true. Right. Individual must be free to live as his creator yeah. ordained. Blue Brother, uh, we covered also, that yesterday. They uh, also say that um, uh, declaring that environmentalism is not it's a political cause response. but a pseudo-religion meant to baptize liberals' ruthless pursuit of absolute power in the holy water of environmental virtue, um, that they are anti-feminist, anti-choice, anti-LGBTQ, uh, calling for American government power to restore the American family, uh, that the federal government By must force. protect fertilized eggs from the moment of conception, By force. calling for criminal action against uh, distributors of abortion medication, and decreeing that religious yeah. business owners should be able to ignore non-discrimination laws. Um, and it does, that's the start. That's the beginning. This all sounds pretty extreme. Is that, are, are these actual solid examples, or is this just stuff from the fringe of the report and the effort? Or is this no, that's, core to it? That's solid examples. Yeah, that article, I encourage people to read it. It's at the Political Research Associates, the Public Eye magazine. It's available online. And yeah, people can, can look through the Heritage Foundation's report. Most people don't want to plow through 900 pages, but you can you know, take a look in the table of contents. You can look at the agencies and issues that you're interested in. You can see uh, you know, the disastrous um, climate agenda you, they have. You can see the horrific... Uh, restrictions on uh, bodily autonomy that you just mentioned. And, and, you know, we see how this is not, uh, these views are not fringe. We just saw the Alabama Supreme Court declare fertilized eggs to be humans. We uh, yeah. are the current Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, and 125. Yeah, this uh, is the shit they're pulling off under a Biden administration. God help us when, when, they, when they get full control. Republican House members have signed on the legislation that would declare... And, and it's it's uh, counterproductive. Well, that's what, another crazy thing. It's 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 like super counterproductive. Like there are female Republicans who are like, no, I'm, I'm having a hard time in my reelection. People, you know, Republican females uh, don't want to vote for this, and it, they're like, yeah, too bad, too bad. I mean, you're seeing you're seeing like speaking out of both sides of their mouth because they don't they're they're on autopilot on this messaging. You know, the I like I said, the idea is to change government to change the foundations of our of our democracy instead of change as a party. So they're barreling forward. ...sized eggs to be persons from the moment of conception. And one of the main architects no, of we don't the, need to please uh, the people. right anti-gay movement, a guy named Robert George, who's a Princeton professor, not a fringe guy, he urged the Supreme Court to do that in his amicus brief in Dobbs, the decision that the Supreme Court used to overturn Roe, Robert George urged them to declare that fertilized eggs were people under the 14th Amendment and to require every state to treat abortion as homicide. So uh, that's, you know. It's very Catholic. The the Alabama Supreme Court is, you know, we've talked about, sometimes we talk about dominionist Christians and Christians who are, uh, believe in seven mountains dominionism, uh, which is that, that the right kind of Christian should, should 
be in control yeah. of every aspect of society. Yeah, that's that's the that's the game plan to convert America into a theocracy. Well, that's what it looks like in action. Mm. Here's the Chief Justice of the State Supreme Court, straight up quoting the Bible, citing God as uh, the reason um, uh, for his ruling, and yeah. um, you know the consequences would be really far-reaching yeah. if these people have more power than they already have. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine They're if, not if a Supreme there. Court justice interracial marriage? Anal sex, you know, uh, the, 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 the inspections of your kids, you know, before, if your kids want to join a sporting event, oh, well, we're going to have to inspect their genitals. Uh, it just the madness that that's the stuff they're proposing now. This was quoting uh, Thor or Odin, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, it would it kind of put a, put all right, so we're moving on to the next segment here. If you want to see the rest of this, it's, they got he's got one more question. But check it out. Tom Hartman, great guy. Thank you, Tom Hartman. Like and subscribe, folks. Good stuff. Tom Hartman program. Big pre big pedigree. I got big shoes to fill. He's he's one of those, you know, in independent journalists has been around a long time. One of those guys, you know. I'm sitting on the shoulder of giants there, Tom Hartman. Um we got to talk about Trump and his dalliance with uh, Viktor Orban. You know, uh, we we don't need to um, dwell on it because you know it, he's he's proud of this uh, association. He thinks it's super cool. Um, that's obviously a problem. He has a history of you know praising dictators. He says himself, "I want to be dictator for a day," which is really cute, right? Anybody who takes democracy seriously wouldn't even say such a such a ridiculous thing. Um, well, Trump needs money. He's going to get money. He's he's you know the RNC is now going to now going to pay for his legal bills. You know he has successfully taken over the RNC. I don't know if I have something about that uh, in 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 this, but yeah, that is one of the you know Mary Trump is now the the co-director or whatever, and a MAGA sycophant has replaced the other MAGA sycophant who just wasn't a MAGA sycophant enough. Uh, but yeah, no RNC money is now going to go into his hundreds of millions of dollars of legal fees. But anyway. If 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 you're cool with this, if you hand wave this away, you are a fucking moron. If you go, yeah, well, whatever, I'm still MAGA, I'm still Trump, you're a fucking moron. Uh, you 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 hate America, you don't care about America, uh, you're naive. Um, and it, you're you know, I mean, you're you're either just wildly ignorant to what this means, what this is him telegraphing us. Um, or you know this and you're a monster and you're like, yeah, no, that's exactly what we need. We want a strong man. We want a dictator. I want to, I want to implement my religious dogma into, into your heathen liberal life. I'm going to shove my book down your throat and you're going to like it. And you're going to like it by force. I'm going to put a gun right to your head and you're going to say, yeah, I, I love it. And that's good enough for me. Listen to some, I've showed it, Right Wing Watch. We just saw an interview with a guy from Right Wing Watch. We've seen these clips from these guys who talk about explicitly that. Like, yep, we're going to, we want a strong man to in, install a, a religious theocracy. And it's going to be enforced with, you know, with violence and with, you know, with uh, troops and, and all that. Morality police, they think morality police from Iran are really great. So if you still support this, you're part of the problem. You're a monster. Um, and at, at the very best, you're a naive idiot who is not really paying attention. But at worst, you're a fucking monster who wants to, like I said, impose your worldview on the people around you because you think that's somehow going to make, I don't know, your pathetic life better. Little mini Goering over here. Right, I, whatever the justification is for those fucking people that are like, yeah, no, I know he's a good, wants to be a dictator. I think that's great. Oh, okay, so you're just, you know. President Trump is hosting Viktor Orban, the authoritarian leader from Hungary. So the two met Kristen for, I guess, about an hour and a half. What do we know about that conversation? What happened behind closed doors? Yeah, so we don't know jack shit, and she's going to do some speculating and give us, you know, a, a, the details that she can give, but we... Nothing. We don't know anything about it. 
Well, Erica, we're still trying to get a readout. We were told that they were going to give us some sort of briefing on what the two talked about. We were also told we were going to get some set of sort of images from this meeting. So far, we have absolutely yeah, nothing. I did talk to sources who said that they were still in the meeting. That's why we know the length of the meeting. Resurgent but so far, right wing in Germany, that content no has been kept under wraps. I'm still reaching out to sources as yeah, they Dari, kind of disperse after that meeting. Again, it was just at five, oh, so uh, broke up rather recently. But uh, the interesting context around this meeting, obviously, we heard Biden talking about Orban, so it's not surprising that the White House did not issue any sort of formal invitation to Orban. But also, Orban did not reach out to anyone in the White House or the Biden administration to sit down for a meeting. He is still a world leader, as is the president of the United States, Joe Biden. It's and yet he's here meeting right? with the former president. One right. thing to know. He'd, he'd, he'd rather meet with, with you know, it, it is a little embarrassing, right, that he'd rather meet with uh, with a future fascist than, than the current leader. Is that Donald Trump's not just a yeah, former Alexander. He is also right. the presumptive Republican the nominee, arrested, and but... he could be president again. And this really gives us some kind of insight into how Donald Trump might align himself in the world stage and what leaders he might stand by. As you noted in your intro, you talked about all of the things that Viktor Orban has said that he stands for. But one thing you didn't note is how much he praises yeah. former President Donald Trump. He has praised him oh, on his immigration it. stance. He has said over and over again that Putin oh, it's, would it's not have invaded. Ukraine do. if Trump was still Absolute in the gift. White House. That goes a very long way with the former president, that kind of loyalty and that kind of praise. So when you're talking about this meeting today, that might be something that pushed it into ha into existence because of the fact that Donald Trump takes those kind of compliments so seriously. Eric? Okay. As you can see, speculation, we don't know anything, yada, yada. It goes on from there. They get, they get a whole panel of people going. All speculation. Shaming, pointing out how disgusting it is, yada yada. If you want the whole thing, it's right here. You don't, you know. We we know he's a disgusting dictator. I'm not a coward. I'm not. I'm willing to call him exactly what he is, which is a fascist. You know, I'll be charitable and say he's fascist. He's a fascistic autocrat. If that really triggers you, right? But that's that's about as best as that's about the best you're going to get from me, uh, Lenny. Absolutely agree with you. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the the he he should be you know being bugged by the FBI. He really should be. Um, his communication should be monitored heavily. Um, so I'm not going to read this article. It's just pathetic. Get out while you can, just for the love of God. Look at this heart, you know, headline: Anti-Trump Republicans wonder if they still have a political home. Mm -hmm. Sir, you don't. Right, these are these are Republicans who attended CPAC. We're like, golly gee, there's a lot of fascists around. There's a lot of anti-Semitic, uh, you know, anti uh, anti-black, super racist fascists in this part. I didn't know. I didn't know that. I didn't know. Oh, golly gee, I didn't know that's what the party I I I was in that I've been creating for the last you know four four or five decades. Do you know we're a bunch of Republicans? Do you know Republicans are a bunch of racists? Did you know that? Sir, leave the party, sir. Okay, at the, just do humanity a favor and just stop voting. You know? Well, I can't vote for Joe Biden. He wants to turn my kid into a kitty cat. Okay, yeah, okay. You don't want to drop the, the right-wing nonsense. But you still want to who me? You know, why? You know, woe is me. Oh, my precious party. Here, I'll read a little bit of this. For Ken Basler, who consistently voted Republican until Trump and his Make America Great Again movement transformed the party, that political scenario is disconcerting. Quote, the Republican Party, part of me, and that's, see, that's right there. This is exactly what I'm talking about. You shouldn't have a, a, a part of you, a part of your personality aligned with a political party. Right, you should be asking. You should be, you know, going to the menu of political parties. Hmm, which one aligns with my values, and which one is going to help me make my life and my life of my family, life of my state, life of my, you know, country better? Oh, it's this one. Oh yeah, well these guys say they're going to do something, but then I looked at I looked at their record, and they totally lied last year. Literally, all you, all I'm asking is for you to vote for your self interests. Be be the most selfish diva 
at the at that voting booth right like you didn't give me shit boy and you lied to me and you you know you weren't right to me and no and i'm gonna try this other one right we're gonna try different choices you should have no allegiance outside of what these parties are gonna do for you to political parties the founding fathers knew this they're like this is really dangerous people are gonna cult or they're gonna have cults around this shit and they were right Back to his quote, the Republican, the Republican Party part of me that's left that's left is hoping Ronald Reagan jumps out from the grave. Yeah, buddy, it's not happening. And saves us all. Not happening, dude. Right? The, Romney left. All the all the so-called moderates left, right? Jeb, he's gone. Okay, and and if you know anybody that was like you know maybe pushing back, they're all kissing the knee or they're or they're rhinos, right? Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham, they got their mind right because they wanted to stay in power. Mitt Romney couldn't couldn't hold down the ruse, right? He tried. Mitch McConnell, right? Eh, okay, okay. He's gonna he he's he's gonna go down in history right as 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 the most one of the most powerful yet spineless politicians right he, Mitch McConnell got everything that he wanted it just so happened that everything he wanted was the work of a uh, a coward right and who's to, who's to blame the people that should be stopping him. Oh, they back rubs and oh, and you know, my buddy Mitch and I can't wait to work bipartisanly with Mitch and reach across the aisle. Still saying it, still saying that shit, the neoliberals. Didn't know that you love founders. Um, I believe the founding documents of the United States are, you know, one of the finest, uh, you know, pieces of, uh, uh, you know, I know, it's, the, it's the best worst system for democracy that we have so far. One of the main problems that we have with uh, American democracy is that we have a party like the neoliberals and, of course, the Republicans that just ignore, they just don't enforce. You know, they just don't enforce some of these laws, right? And the, the, Trump, Trump and the current, you know, Mike Johnson's a great example. Mike Johnson helped plan January 6th, has not seen... A, not even an investigation, nothing, not, not not a single thing. Why? Because the neoliberals don't want to set a precedent where sitting politicians can be gone after. So they make sure that they put a Merrick Garland style AG in charge who's going to make sure that none of that shit really happens. Problem compounds on top of each other. So the problem is, you know, the, the founding fathers, you know, they built something great. Problem is, is that we, we have corrupt people that are not implementing uh you know the the checks and balances that that were put in place it's gone it's gone blue brother it leaves me in a quandary yeah this this guy looks like he well i'm just i just don't know what to do i like the hatred i like the anti-semitism i like the tax cuts for the rich that i don't get to enjoy yeah, you look you look like a multimillionaire, buddy. You look like your your part you look like the the exact kind of guy your party wants to cut taxes for, you fucking idiot. You you, you goddamn uh uh sucker. Right? Oh, it's a quandary. What do I do? Can't can't somebody like Jeb Bush put a happy face on all this all this tax cuts and corporatism and can't we just go back to the uh, Dick Cheney, uh, George Bush style of destroying the country piece by piece slowly or slower? Moving on. I've insulted that man enough. I'm going to get in trouble. Just wanted to just wanted to show you this, you know, speaking of suckers, speaking, speaking of naive, easily grifted idiots. Listen to this from NBC News. Some of former President Trump's most fervent supporters are being swindled into investing thousands in, quote-unquote, Trump bucks that promise riches once cashed in and said they're receiving memorabilia that no bank will cash. Some of these idiots are putting money into buying Disney bucks, basically, credits, 
okay, that they think that they will then be able to take to the bank in exchange for money, some of them have, when really what they are buying, like I said, credits, you know, and it's, of course, you know, pennies on the dollar, right? Like one credit is like $10 or something, right? And it costs, you know, 20 credits for a, 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 a Trump uh, bumper sticker, right? So you end up paying $100 for something that's 10 cents. You know, Xbox Live was criticized for this, making you buy points instead of, you know, you know selling things for real money. Because they, you know, they priced things in a way that forced you to buy a certain amount of points. It was a ripoff. It was a scam. Remember George W. Bush? I didn't agree with his politics, but I still to this day respect him as a person. Why? Why would you respect a, a war criminal as a as a person? A war criminal that 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 killed uh, a million plus Iraqi civilians for no reason. Why would you respect that person? To be fair, at this rate, when Donald's first day of dictatorship is on the 2000th day, Trump bucks will be worth more than US dollars. <laughs> Great point, Holsky. I hope Trump implements social credit system based on Trump pumper, bumper stickers. Pumper stickers? Is that like big fat guys pumping it up? Pumper stickers? Moving on to the next story here. Um... I wanted to I wanted to showcase that there are individuals who maybe appear on the left or who might have some veneer of leftiness, like the mayor of New York, who is a psychopath, basically, uh, that there are people who will happily go along with Trump's fascism, that will happily become part of this new dictatorship. They will they you know, they 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 will not stand up for democracy. They will not defend it. I do believe Merrick, uh, Mayor Eric Adams is one of those individuals that will fold like a paper plate uh, in a Trump dictatorship because this is, these are the kind of actions that we are seeing uh, from him and how he's treating New Yorkers. It's really quite despicable. From the AP. Uh, also, Woke Patriot put a link that we're going to show next. New York City Police Department is leaning into a more aggressive role on social media, embracing a combative and at times controversial posture on platforms like X and Instagram. NYPD officials say these videos are supposed to be intimidating, and they say that their rhetoric on social media is intentional, trying to clear the air okay, around the department kid. and make jobs for their cops easier. Anyone that commits any act of harm against one of our New Yorkers, water. we're going that to find you, we're going to arrest you, we're going to bring you to justice. But critics of the new social media policy say the department is going beyond their public safety responsibilities, at times engaging in politics and putting people at risk when they target them by name. Last week, yeah, well, look at that criminal. Chief of Patrol John Chell went after a state Supreme Court judge, using her name in a post that accused her of letting a predator free. The post racked up hundreds of comments it later came out that Chell had misidentified the judge in the post. He apologized, but the NYPD defended his right to go after the judiciary. Later this year, <laughs> they'll release new episodes of the long-form YouTube program documenting their exploits, essentially their own version of the long-running TV series Cops. We've asked the NYPD how much they're spending on all this. <laughs> they declined to comment. Million dollar propaganda, you know, uh, operation. So I do believe New York, you know, the current government in New York would go right along with the Trump presidency. There, there, there will be there, there will be a reckoning, right? There, there will be changes made. It's like you either go along or we're gonna, you know, come in and enforce them. And I do think I do think these Republicans have no problem, you know, coming into, uh, you know, uh, San Francisco and you know, knocking on the government, doing. I mean, who knows, man. It's really wild to me that neoliberals are operating, you know, they're they're war they're they're fundraising and and raising the alarm and then they're operating as if well, if we lose we're going to get another chance at this. Oh, but this is also the most important election and a total existential fight, but I mean, you know, we're not going to we're not going to do, you know, we're not going to get rid of the filibuster, you know, we're not going to do historic things because we're because we're fighting a historic fight. <laughs> Should we watch the ambiguously gay duo? I love the ambiguously gay duo, dude. I'm gonna get DMCA'd. 
My ass gonna get DMCA'd. The ambiguously gay duo. The ambiguously gay duo. I don't know, does SNL even still do this bit, or are they too cowardly even to do this stupid, silly animation that was really hilarious? Ambiguously gay duo, tonight's episode. <laughs> Favorite part is always, always when, okay, like, the setup is fine, but it's always when they, when they confront the villains, and the villains are like, you know, they're like, <laughs> they're like being super gay, but they don't know how to act. Invading our private fortress. We were just in the area. <laughs> wow. I must be going. Yeah, everyone gets hey. super awkward. We'll talk. Kajoro, no. We need the answers. Wait, come like, back. Master, just... don't take your wisdom from us. Please. Now what's everybody looking at? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> An ambiguously rocking summer from... <laughs> Dude, I forgot. I didn't know Stephen Colbert did the voices on these, right? Uh, but this is probably the funniest thing SNL actually does. Like they're the, the the sketches where they're reading off of cue cards and the sketches that are commercials for Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, it's turned into a real embarrassment. Well, that was fun. All right, so moving on back to serious news here. Um, I just wanted to follow up this other story. I think this one's from Woke Patriot here. New York is expanding bag checks on the subway. How is this legal? So once again, we just see more uh, fascistic, you know, action targeting. They're probably using, you know, they're probably claiming that it's not racial. But if you look at the, if, if they were to release the number, they probably don't release the numbers. But if we had numbers, we would probably see a lot of, right, uh, black and brown people getting stopped more than white folks. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if that was happening. Oh, it's all random. It's all random. That's what they say. Um so I, I, I didn't get the archive here. I don't have time to read it, but just more evidence that, you know, they're, the overreach is ridiculous. And this is not, this, the solution is to make people's lives better. The solution is to make the middle class stronger. That reduces crime. That reduces the need for crime when people are happy and healthy and, and they have a future and they don't feel the need to steal from other people and they feel like they can get on their feet and society cares about them and they want to contribute to society. 99% of people, that's what they want. You know, this idea that we, we need this kind of strong man tactics to stop the crime loving crimesters who love to do crime for no other reason than they love crime is so fucking ridiculous. Uh, we need to, we need to spend these resources spent on this nonsense on making the middle class stronger, making the middle class better. Like this is money better spent. Um, you know, uh, getting a college education um, for a poor kid than it is, you know, checking some some guy's bag at three o'clock in the morning to make sure he doesn't have a a baggie of coke or uh, or some weed on him. Oh, heaven forbid. So anyway, more authoritarianism. Next story here. Uh, I, I have I have to talk about this even for just a microsecond. Only only to point out that mediocrity. Uh, that nepotism and mediocrity go hand in hand and in in the in the world that the republicans want to create where they have their dynasties you know and we saw this with trump immediately putting his family in charge other republicans want to do this too i think jeb bush was somewhat guilty of that as well um that some people in some political love crime really dari really really you're gonna go ahead and repeat that right-wing nonsense in my fucking chat you know, over 90% of the BLM protests were peaceful. Do you really feel comfortable repeating those lies that the people that were protesting the uh, the uh, ill treatment of cops uh, against black people across the nation were crime loving, you know, as I describe people who, who love doing crime? Really? Wow, Dari. I had no idea you were uh, uh, ignorant. I had no idea you were actually that ignorant. I know you, you sometimes say some spicy stuff, but I had no idea you were this fucking ignorant. That's a pretty embarrassing comment. Over 90, like I said before, over 90% of the BLM protests were peaceful. Um, and by the way, the, the police brutality problem was not fixed. 
um oh yeah there's nothing but riots all the riots you mean the blm riots you mean the blm riots no it, it wasn't it wasn't there were riot there was rioting um in pl in certain places grand majority of places were peaceful protests grand majority of them oh yeah right yeah every time you know so now every time so now every time we fucking protest um uh you know against um you know police brutality against people of color oh yeah no just like the blm riots you're gonna start rioting again huh regardless of what we do or we don't right and the people making this disingenuous argument uh i guess they're perfectly okay with passing legislation that would make protesting harder right because that's that's what the end result of that rhetoric is well we got to do something about the ability to protest I mean, these people getting together are dangerous right they just want to burn stuff down I'm gonna burn my wendy's down I'm gonna ra I'm gonna I'm gonna rob the apple store right that's all these protests want to do that's all these protesters want to do they just want to rob and steal right i'm not racist though it's cute it's cute I bet he's giggling. I think Dari's the type of person that thinks this is funny. And think, I think, I think I, I feel a smile from Dari from a million miles away. Um, well, there were also a lot of agent provocateurs. That was also proven. There was a lot of cases of police, you know, who were very frustrated with some that were, that was, that were being very peaceful, that were just occupying like, a, you know, like a crossroad in the street. And they were actually quite frustrated that things, that things weren't popping off. And there were plenty of agent provocateurs, but we'll never know the full number, the full tally. It, I, I, it, it is, it says everything about you that one, you don't look up what you're saying or you don't care and that you, you're, you're, you're repeating a lie that reflects what you want to believe, which is that black people protesting against police violence were just out there to steal some iPhones from, you know, from the Wendy's, right? They're just thieves. They just like crime as uh, Dari foolishly said. Pretty pathetic shit. Pretty ignorant bullshit in my chat right there. Tempted to ban you, but I'll move on. I don't have time to take the trash out right now. Um, partial summary of, uh, uh, so I wanted to bring this up though. I, I honestly, I, I have yet to find a person who defends the, 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 the actual, you know, the, the riots that did go down the, the property damage. I'm, I'm hard pressed finding anybody that has, you know, what more than a hundred viewers on Twitch that would, that would defend that violence. Certainly mainstream politicians on the left, even in some of the most progressive corners would not defend the damage to public property. So... I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Sounds like you're repeating nonsense once again. It's like it's like those idiots that say, "Well, you know, I don't I don't believe in the left who says we should have an open border." No one on the left talks about an open fucking border, dude. No one. In fact, what do you see? You see the mainstream Democrats pass the fucking Heritage Fund legislation on the fucking border. Oh, that's not good enough. Blah 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 blah. There are mainstream politicians on the left. Barely. <laughs> and the one, you know, AOC, you know, perf you know, doing a really great performance during the Trump administration on the border with the migrant children. Uh, you know, silent, dude. Crickets, crickets from AOC talking, you know, the neoliberals over here passing a draconian, draconian right wing immigration and uh, patting themselves on the back. I don't know. Barely. Uh, you can be on the left and support capitalism. That kind of gatekeeping is not going to uh, is not going to result in the increase in socialism that I think you think it will. Yeah, you can. Yeah, don't be such a hardliner. Okay, we're not going to get rid of capitalism in one day. It's going to be a hundred year project. Okay, all right. I'm not going to talk to a fucking tanky. I'm not going to talk to an idiot. Do you even vote? Do you even participate in this system? You don't, do you? You use your, your your silly commie rhetoric to defend your inaction, right? Waiting for a revolution, you fucking waste of space. Yeah, I think I've had enough of uh, 
Dari. Go ahead and I guess I guess we'll just do the 30 minute, but I'm I'm tempted to do the full ban. All right, back over to my conversation about Lauren Boebert and nepotism. The Lauren Boebert and the Republican Party uh, want to install a system that would allow their family to inherit their political power, right? They would they would prefer to have dynasties. They of course want to get rid of democracy. And we must remember that the spawn of characters like Lauren Boebert are gross, petulant uh, mediocrities that, you know, don't have to succeed in life. So apparently this guy was like completely zonked out, robbed. Uh, let me see here. What does he say? Oldest child departing Representative Lauren Boebert was arrested at 1.30 Tuesday on a home county road, according to documents obtained by the Rifle Police Department. Interesting. The home is roughly, I guess that's the name of the county, is roughly 1.3 miles from the Silt Town Center, but it was not the location of uh, Tyler Bobert's purported crime, whatever. Okay, so police documents state that Tyler Bobert allegedly broke into a vehicle at a home in a residential neighborhood east of Wamsley Elementary School and rifled alongside three additional counts of criminal trespass. The 18-year-old and three other people, all minors, are facing several other charges, four counts of stealing a financial device... What does that mean? Financial device, like a, a cell phone that had a, you know, a bank password on it. What does that mean? And four counts of identification document theft, allegedly making off with a total value of less than $300. This guy, he's, there's no way he's hurting for money. There's no way. The group is also facing a charge of conspiracy to commit a crime and contributing to the delinquency of a minor, both felonies. It's not yet clear, but all right. Yada, yada, yada. Lauren Barber released a statement before her court saying, I love my son Tyler, who has been through some very difficult public challenges for a young man subject to it, blah, blah, blah. Attention didn't ask for. Breaks my heart to see my child. Okay, so blah, 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 blah. Wants to get her life back on track. All the pressure because she's a, she's a figure, guys. But we, we need to be, you know, the problem is, like I said, when characters like this um, inherit power, and that stealing credit cards is that with the financial device um that's what i'm worried about is when these criminal mediocre silver spoon mediocrities and maybe he's not even silver spoon doesn't really sound i mean lauren, lauren bobert used to be like a <clears throat> uh escort is that fair to say <laughs> hey she's the sugar mama so it, it and it look and, and listen to the the, ta the name of the town rifle and silt Right, so I, I don't think this guy's like really Silver Spoon per se, but you know Lauren Boebert. Normally, if the if the system was working properly, Lauren Boebert would have been weeded out. She wouldn't have won a race, or would have won and then immediately been, you know, quietly let out the room. But you know, Davey saying she might lose her seat, which is great news. But um, the trajectory of the Republican Party is pretty clear, right? More Lauren Borberts, more MTGs, more Matt Gates, not less. God, we even saw Santos at the uh, at the State of the Union. That was really quite embarrassing. His robbery was very hard for him. It took all of his problem-solving skills and really stressed him out. God, Mom, I did the best I could. Yeah, Blue Brother. Well, we see people doing that all the time. Um, just want to give you an example of what your life is going to look like when, if the Republicans get in charge. And yes, the neoliberals are to blame for this because the Republicans are proud to show us exactly who they are and who's the only other party in charge. But here's an example of what the Republicans want to do to us. House Bill 500 takes away Kentucky workers' lunch and rest breaks and cuts their pay. Isn't that great? No breaks and cut your pay. House Bill HB 500, which may receive a vote in the House in the full House soon, would take away Kentucky work Kentucky workers' rights to lunch and rest breaks. I believe Kentucky is the home of Mitch McConnell. Uh, workers' rights to lunch and rest breaks at work and would would eliminate pay protections. Awesome including uh, for time spent traveling to and from a job site. Sometimes that could be hours. Sometimes you have to get up at five o'clock in the morning, drive two or three hours uh, to get to your construction work site. You got to work eight or nine hours, 
and then dog tired, got to make your ass back, or you got to do a hotel, you know, with your own expenses. Uh, it is an assault on longstanding basic rights and dignity on the job that will harm practically all Kentucky workers, spe specifically HB 500 repeals the requirement that employers rep uh, provide a lunch break. Repeals the requirement that employers uh, provide a rest break. Well, have a good night, Blue Brother. Thank you so much for that follow. Welcome to the News Underground, the hardest motherfucking news channel on Twitch. Hope you enjoyed, uh, you know, real information, real news. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for coming. Hope to see you again. She recently finished fifth in a straw poll for Republican Party in her district. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And was it was it her? She switched. She flipped her her district. She was the one, right, that moved to a different district because the one that she was in, she was going to lose. Um. And please apologize, mistakes I made in my English. I tried my best. Hey, you did a good job. Not bad. Not bad at all. Keep up. Keep practicing. You're you're almost there. English is a disgusting language. It's very hard. Uh, so yeah, repeals the requirement uh, that employers provide a rest break, repeals the requirement that employers who work seven days in a row receive time and a half overtime pay. So you, you know, that's a good one, right? You work eight, nine, 10 days in a row, no break, and you don't get any extra compensation for it. Eliminates employer liability for failure to provide proper pay for work time spent traveling between jobs. So you know, if you think your employer's ripping you off, you know you don't have you no longer have a legal resource uh, recourse to follow to challenge that and get any money back. And for the and for time spent on certain activities associated with starting and wrapping up a job. So this is this is great. You know, if you're a, a, a air stewardess, don't you love that? How air stewardess they they have all this work they got to, all, you know, all that time you, you think right? Well, well, this the stewardess is getting paid to to tell me how to. Buckle my seatbelt and unbuckle my seatbelt. No, that person only gets paid while they're in the air. So all that shit they do before and all the shit that they do afterwards, they don't get compensated for. And the and the Republicans, of course, want to make that just the standard for everybody. You know, of course, the executives that run these companies will have their travel expenses covered and all the benefits and bonuses, and they won't. You know, their cell phones paid for. All these executives, you know, the company pays for all that shit for them. Um, that won't change, of course. It also decreases the statute of limitations for labor violations for, from five years to three years. So workers have less time to report issues. And of course, they will have right-wing judges that will make sure things drag out. And eventually, once things get bad enough, they'll do another reform that will just eliminate these protections all together. That's the goal with Steve Bannon and our uh you know and our federal agencies the goal is to make this would make this completely redundant uh uh you know you you would not be able you know you get you get poisoned on the job you get cancer because they your your job exposed you to some chemical and they didn't tell you about it they didn't give you the right gear to wear exposing it to it you only find out three or five or ten years later you have no recourse that kind of shit happens every day look into it industrial uh accidents and industrial um accountability it's a real thing real crimes against real people coal mining another great example anyway just thought just thought i'd show you this is what this is what the neoliberals are playing politics with okay right with their little stunts, right? What, what did we see Joe Biden at the State of the Union? Oh, shucks, I know you want to destroy the country. I know you want to eliminate my party. I know this is an existential fight for my existence. Oh, shoot. You guys are real ragamuffins. Did, did he look like a fighter or did he look like a guy that still wanted to reach across the aisle because he's a fucking doormat? Of course, MSNBC fucking from both sides, dude. Oh, wow, the best speech I've ever heard. Pathetic. It was okay. With a couple solid promises that I don't think he's going to follow up on. Last little bit of our uh, section. What about the fascists? Uh, CPAC speaks for itself. Prepare to be shocked. Or I guess not. If you've been following this, prepare to have your 
assumptions uh, reaffirmed and doubled down on. This proudly anti-democratic, proudly fascistic, proudly theocratic, violent, and, and, and just overall frightening. Big props to the Majority Report. Make sure you like and subscribe, folks. Tom Figarino doing an absolute wonderful job. Mike, Mike Figarino. I'm sorry. Tom Figarino. Tom Hartman. Yeah. Mike Figarino. Thank you, Mike Figarino. Doing a great job. Wonderful lefty journalism. I like to show him every stream. Does a really wonderful job. Check him out. We're going to watch this whole segment here. It's only a 10 minute segment, nine minutes, eight and a half seconds. Eight and a half seconds, eight and a half minutes. <laughs> uh, so we're going to watch the whole thing. Uh, prepare to have your assumptions about, you know, and like if you think, oh, I'm being hyperbolic. Oh, these people, they're not that far. We're not that close to the edge. You know, this isn't, this isn't the, you know, existential fight for democracy. What's this maniac talking about? Okay. All right. Well, let me know after this eight minutes, if you still think like that. This is CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Committee meeting. This is like the fucking Super Bowl for right-wingers. It has been for a really long time. The organizers of CPAC are in hot water again for making another really big oopsie. And I say this because at this year's CPAC, aside from the typical extremist Welcome rhetoric that we've Reed. come to expect from conservative okay. speakers, it seems like they may have actually let a few Nazis slip through the cracks. Or as Ben Goggins of NBC News puts it, Nazis mingle openly at CPAC, openly. spreading anti-Semitic conspiracy theories openly. and finding allies. And as the subtitle uh, points out, it's not necessarily a new phenomenon as Robert. they've had had a problem with Nazis in the past, but they ejected the Nazis last time from the event. This time, however, not so much. Now, the first question that I've got to ask that's on all of our minds is why on earth would Nazis be drawn to this event? I just can't figure out why they'd be attracted to an event like CPAC and feel as if they're welcome here. It's so perplexing to me, but as perplexed as we all are by the presence of Nazis at CPAC, uh, you know, this isn't surprising. I think nobody's surprised by this because it's happened before, obviously. But this time it is different because Nazis, at least some of them, had official CPAC badges and they faced zero resistance from organizers. So even though Nazis showing up to CPAC, it's not necessarily groundbreaking news. The fact that they were allowed to be there in and of itself is a little bit problematic. In fact, the reception to them was actually friendly, according to Goggins. He reports, at the Young Republican Mixer Friday evening, a group of Nazis who openly identified as national socialists mingled with mainstream conservative personalities, including some from Turning Point USA, and discussed race science and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. One member of the group, Greg Conte, who attended the deadly 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, he said that the group was prepared to be ejected if CPAC organizers were tipped off, but that never happened. Another, Ryan Sanchez, who was previously part of the Nazi Rise Above movement, took photos and videos of himself at the conference with an official badge and touted associations with Fuentes. In a photo published on his ex-profile, Sanchez shook hands with Jared Taylor inside CPAC's secure conference area, writing, Jared Taylor is a hero of our people. Taylor founded American Renaissance, an organization that has published racist pro-eugenics writings. The Southern Poverty Law Center describes Taylor as crudely white supremacist. Now, Goggins reports that Sanchez also did a Nazi salute in the lobby, and there's a video of this, while his posse was openly using racial slurs. But they were just allowed to be there. And because they were allowed to be there, this was kind of seen as an implicit endorsement by the organizers of CPAC. Now, in response to this report, CPAC is crying fake news. So uh, let's hear from CPAC Chairman Matt Slap about these allegations. Mr. Schlapp, what's your response to the allegations against you at this moment? Really? Yeah. You know, you need to drop it. It's false. It's fake news. What, 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 Mr. Schlapp, what are your response to the allegations against you? I need a document about the, about the war on our kids. Open the door. Open the door. War on our kids. What are you talking? Oh, I think I know what happened. I think I accidentally mixed up the Nazi allegations that he was supposed to be responding to with the sexual assault allegations that he was refusing to address where he allegedly groped a male staffer. My bad. Here's the actual response to Nazis posted by the official CPAC Twitter account by Matt Schlapp. So as you can see here, he is quote tweeting his personal account calling presidents of college campuses. The Sorry, folks, I'm back there. Had to take care of a family situation, but we're good to go. Back to it. 
the real Nazis. But as for the uh, self-identified Nazis at his event, he writes, NBC's claim that there was a Nazi presence at CPAC 2024 is false, misleading, and grossly manipulative, mm. no, especially isn't. coming from a writer who has carried water for Hamas in much of his reporting on the Israel-Gaza war. Right. Now, isn't I think he's great? probably speaking to Goggins. A a acknowledging the humanity of the Gazans, you know, basically. But there, there are some people who take it too far with the, you know, Hamas freedom fighters, resistance fighters narrative. Like, they try to defend that, and I don't think that's the right direction to go in. I see what they're talking about, and I don't necessarily disagree. Um, but there has to be a delineation between groups that are fighting oppression that actually do something to save their own people versus groups that cynically use their people, the people that they represent, as a tool, right? Some kind of political tool. Um, and and I am going to show in the Hamas coverage, I am going to show some reporting exclusively from Israel. I don't know how true it is, but um, there is there is a report from one of the leaders of Hamas um, saying that the current strategy is working of, you know, of putting citizens in, harm, in harm's way. Um, like, there's other evidence. It's not just one statement. There's other evidence to show that Hamas putting civilians in harm's way and knowing that Israel is going to be brutal and kill as many innocent civilians as possible because of their own xenophobic, bigoted reasons against Arabs, um, that they weaponize that and they cynically put men, women, and children directly in harm's way. And it's like there does need to be some kind of definitional uh, title difference between, you know, rebels... You know, because when you're thinking rebels, you're thinking of the goddamn Star Wars rebels, right? You would, Star Wars rebels would never kill innocent civilians, right, to achieve their political goals. Well, I don't know. I just feel like they need there. There does need to be a better. The left does need to have a better definition for for uh, people like Hamas, the Taliban, that yes are technically fighting against Western oppression, but you know don't exactly have the best interests of their people in heart, right? I don't know if that's what this person, this person that's being criticized by the CPAC Twitter account is talking about, right? Or if that's what they said. I only bring that up because I do, I do push back a little bit against the left that like to, um, I don't know, come to the defense of Hamas in a way. And it's like, that's, that's not a winning, you know, we got to get rid of Hamas. And the best way to get rid of Hamas is to create a strong middle class of Palestinians Obviously, getting rid of terrorism with a bomb or a bullet doesn't seem to be very effective, guys. I don't know. I don't know. We have a, we might have a little bit of recent evidence the last twenty years to 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 show just how ineffective that technique is. But I don't know. You know, let's go ahead and repeat history a couple more times. See how well it works out. Moss, in some sense, does BB's bidding. I mean, Holsky, I, we've talked about that. How it's like they're the perfect. They work almost in lockstep, like the perfect boogeyman for this these right wing you know demagogues to come in and take advantage of the whole situation a picture of national socialists was hilarious uh they're over there in the black leather trench coats they're all missing is the fedora yeah his aversion to genocide which would make him a normal and reasonable human being but nonetheless schlapp goes on to argue that cpac can't possibly be anti-semitic since their official position is that they support israel um okay interesting defense here but he's ignoring the fact that the anti-semitism that these nazis were espousing had nothing to do with israel and had everything to do with the fact that they were talking about how jewish people control Run the world, the world. Uh, but my favorite the part world, about man. this post aside from the ratio is that it got community noted like, isn't, it, isn't it funny it's like oh i got proof and then they point to like a successful person who's jewish you're like yeah see see you're running the world it's like, all right buddy Levian is stating quote there yeah. are actually were multiple yeah. attendees no the the jews that run the world put donald trump in charge because <laughs> he's because he's so because he's been so great he's been so great to them to proudly identify themselves as nazis this is confirmed by a plethora of video and photographic evidence now that link takes you to a thread written by ben goggins where he not only defends his reporting but provides people with photo and video evidence confirming that nazis were indeed in attendance quote the nazis introduced themselves to me at a mixer and said they were national socialists yeah, started talking yeah. about skull measurements and pushing it's the 
conspiracy joke. theory that all races were being controlled by Jewish people. They were posting about their presence at CPAC online, and he includes a picture of Sanchez tweeting about him being at CPAC and includes a video of him doing a Nazi salute while laughing as well. Now he continues, Sanchez also posted a video of himself in the leather coat, the haircut. Yeah, no, we're 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 supposed to ignore this shit. They think they're they think they're playing funny fucking games, huh? Yeah. Well, I'm I'm against violence against Nazis, uh, unless we declare war against them. And uh, I don't see a problem with declaring war against Nazis. Do you? I don't have a single problem with that. Do you? But right now. We're not fighting a war against the Nazis, but I think we should change that. Tell me what you think. Inside the conference's secure area, shaking hands with Jared Taylor, cute, founder of the Nazi coat. publication and website American Renaissance. Cute now there's coat. more, but I think we can pretty much stop at one of the Nazis doing a Hitler salute in the lobby. I feel like that's sufficient evidence that yes, at least one Nazi was in attendance, but there were multiple. Now, the question is whether or not CPAC's organizers actually knew about the Nazis that were there. Because if they knew but didn't do anything about it, then that makes them complicit. Now, if we're being overly charitable, I'll concede that it's entirely possible that they didn't actually know that they were there. But it seems really unlikely that that's the case for the fact that they were made aware by the presence of Nazis because they were literally heckling prominent conservatives, including Matt Schlapp himself, about why his neo-Nazi friend Nick Fuentes wasn't allowed at the event. I'm not yeah. making this up. The, the Groypers got there, and the, the Groypers do what the Groypers love to do, which is howl like the incels that they are. Up. Excuse me, Matt. Uh, why is uh, oh, Nick Fuentes on, not allowed at the event? What? Where are the, we need answers. Why is Nick Fuentes not allowed here? You can literally see. You can you can feel his smile through his through his statements. Isn't that weird? Do you see my hat? It's for your show. It's for it's your show. Tell Nick Fuentes he's a short little sad man. I'll tell you you're a fucking. F oh, what are you doing, dude? There you go. There's your constituency, I Gorka. I said you're. A God. Man. Yeah. What are you guys doing? There you what go. Are you fucking doing? There you go, Gorka. I mean, they, they, this, these are the people that, you know, are going to make you irrelevant, buddy. Yeah, so I feel like I personally might have been tipped off by that, especially for the fact that it seemed like Matt Schlapp actually recognized the guy who was heckling him. But I mean, even if he didn't they recognize know. him, if it were are. me, I would think mm, it seems a little bit weird that this person is heckling me on behalf of his neo-Nazi friend. Perhaps he's yeah. also a Nazi as well. I'd at least think he's sus at a minimum, right? But apparently Matt Schlapp had no idea. Sure. So, I mean, Ben brought the receipts and proved that Nazis were indeed in attendance at CPAC 2024. Yeah. But there's a reason why they were there, even if CPAC's organizers didn't approve of them being there. It's because the Nazis thought that their politics were a good fit for the mainstream Republican Party, who is also routinely promoting anti-Semitic conspiracy theories like the Great Replacement Theory, which the Nazis believe too. CPAC is a- And look, man, you talk to your average conservative, you know, in most, you know, conservative areas, and they repeat, you know, they don't repeat the stuff maybe word for word, but the, the assumptions and ignorances and, you know, all these things that are reflected back at them, you hear them, you hear them repeat it. Um, they, they, they are absolutely, they are absolutely convinced uh, at some of this stuff, you know, and the only the only solution is the, is the solution that's always been, you know, they it goes all the way back to the uh, original Revolutionary War, where it was like, well, what do we do with these people that are that are anti democracy, that are anti American? You know, they want to the Confederacy wanted to, you know, and you know, make you know make this whole you know country a bunch of slave owners, and you know, of course, it was more complicated than that. Yada yada yada. But you know what I mean? You know, it's like, what do we do with all these people that supported, you know, this seditious action? Well, we, we kind of have to live with them because what's the alternative? What do we do? Exile them? Kill them all? You know, so it, it's like it's the same quandary that, you know, we fought the original Revolutionary War over, really. Um, and the only way to defeat them is to defeat our own apathy. And that's that's what's destroying us is this political nihilism. It's absolutely destroying the left. Even if I, uh, yeah, okay. Would you say that? All right, so thank you again, Mike Figarino.
hit this other one up. I like this one. Album's the shit. Um, so we're moving on from our assholes to the United States. Here we go. Like this, biatch. Bug, 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 bug. News on the ground, bitch. For, for some reason, uh, uh, Woke Patriot, um, you like weird music? It's, it's underground. It's, it's the genre is underground. <laughs> There's a connection. There's a connection. But yeah, I do. I do enjoy uh, fun music. Lots of fun. Uh, uh, YouTube. They did. They gave me that recap, and they said your favorite genre is sad. <laughs> they literally said that, dude. <laughs> You like sad music. Oh, sorry. Uh, but no, for some reason, uh, Woke Patriot being uh, negative Nancy in the Discord about this, I think this is great. So it was bad news. I didn't report on it. Um, I didn't report on it because, you, know, you know, there's so much else, else to report on. I do feel bad for not reporting on it sooner. I should have. But the story is, is that Elon Musk, Tesla... You know, I don't know if Elon Musk was, you know, in charge of this decision or whatever, but Tesla ordered um, a, like a thousand pies for this big event that they were going to do or anything, right? So this, from this small business that they apparently, they make amazing pies, but it's like a small mom and pop shop, right? But they make these homemade pies that are simply delicious. And it's like, you know, it's a big hipster thing to eat there. So someone was like, okay, let's order a thousand. So they, you know, that's a big deal. They order all the ingredients, they start making these damn pies, and then, whoop, rug pull, Tesla cancels the order, and they're totally screwed. They already pulled the trigger on the order. Um, they were like, can you help us out? Is there anything you, you can do? You know, maybe just buy half of them, something, nothing, Tesla, nope, screw you, we suck, we're a horrible company, we don't fucking care, uh, we're cheapskates, you know, we're, we're run by a brutal oligarch, we're heartless, we don't care. Well, people said, hell no. It, it could have potentially put the whole company out of business, the whole small business. You know, it was like it was like that crippling, apparently, which tells you everything about how small, struggling small businesses are in this country. But apparently, uh, they were pulled out by the people. So this is a feel-good story. I, want, I wanted to show it here. Thank you so much, Davey, for posting this, because I think this is great news. And doesn't need to be said, but motherfuck Elon Musk. <laughs> Right for life. I put that shit on my on my uh, my my little hoopty, my shit box Civic. When I drive and I put an aftermarket muffler on it. And blah, blah, blah. Stock stock everything, but it's it was some for some reason it sounds like it has something that's worth a damn in it, just because it's a, like a forty dollar muffler from Walmart. All right, you know what I'm talking about. Let's get into it. Feel good story. Wanted to start off U.S. In news. In South Bay, Elon Musk is vowing to make good after Tesla abruptly canceled an order with a popular pie shop that cost. Oh, I thought the people rescued the pie shop. Elon Musk made this promise. Oh, dude, this might this. Okay, I should have. I should have actually. Okay, this isn't good. Thousands of dollars today it was the community showing its support for the small business. Wait, okay, in a it big is. Way. Okay, the community didn't come through. Oh, hell yeah. Okay, nice. Okay, nice. Nice. Elon Musk made some stupid promise, but no, these people came through. Okay, awesome. Think about that. Hell yeah. Hi. The community okay, is giving back like to Elon the giving to pies. On Saturday, a line of customers stretched out the door. Hey, oh, I look just at want this. to support her because I felt bad that she lost a lot of money. So I just want her to know that uh, we as a community, we will help her out. We care. News spread about what happened on Valentine's Day. Fawangi Rasateranera said Tesla placed an order of 2,000 mini pies. 2000? A couple days later, the Tesla employee doubled the order. Rasateranera said she bought ingredients and turned down other orders. When she reached out about payment for the invoice, she received a crushing text message that Tesla 
decided to cancel the order. Sam and I heard that Elon Musk stood you up, so we thought we'd come try to pitch in. San Jose Mayor Matt Mahan and former Mayor Sam oh, Licardo mayor wanted to got, rally well, behind the small business the and were pleased so many others. Slam dunk, man. Smart move. Smart move. I know good politics when I see it. Did as well. I was really overjoyed to get here and see a line out the door into the parking yeah, lot. No, me too. It's a community good story. Support. This is what San Jose is all about. Rosa Terranera yeah. was overwhelmed to see the large turnout. Anxiety. <laughs> but grateful nonetheless. Oh, the that's amount great. of support that we have received, it's <laughs> beyond like a, I didn't even expected people from around the bay area even as far as manteca are buying pies and news spread around the world this morning i look at my paypal and i have somebody from netherlands sending me four dollars uh, yeah i'm like that's amazing on friday elon musk <laughs> posted months, on x uh. <laughs> that he will make things good with the bakery and that people should always be able to count on tesla trying its best okay yeah yeah too late Elon, nobody, nobody believed you. You're, you're off the hook, buddy. Okay, we don't want your help. We don't really want you to hear. Um, we don't want your charity, right? So just keep to yourself on this one, okay, bud? Wouldn't that be something if he showed up, right? Wouldn't that just be the best if he just showed up, tried to get a little positive PR out of it? I want them to always remember that everybody's action happen. has an impact. And it can be good or it can be bad. And when it's Tesla, it's better to choose the good. Instead of focusing on the botched experience, she's focusing on her kind-hearted customers. Everybody go. has their views, but inside, there's a heart, and I love it. <laughs> That's the right move. Rasa Terranera says she has worked with several of Silicon Valley's biggest companies, including Apple, Google, and Adobe. Yeah, apparently her pies, uh, those pies looked amazing. Those pies looked amazing. So apparently this, you know, this company is blowing up. I don't know if they have an online shop. Let me see if I can get the sign here. But it's called the Giving Pies. Yeah, I think, where was the sign? Yeah, right here. The Giving Cafe, the Giving Pies Cafe. Yeah. So make sure you check them out online. I don't know if you can order online. But check them out if you're in San Jose. I'm definitely going to check them out next time. I'm in, I'm in San Jose. Actually, I'm in San Jose quite a bit. So, uh, We're not going to watch the whole uh, uh, Democracy Now! headline segment. But um, I did want to... Uh, they, they did showcase a, uh activist, American hero. And I wanted to also repeat that showcase and, and show my respect to somebody who uh, dedicated their life to change and was uh, uh, effective in that change. You know, people, you know, people that we probably don't know about that we should try to emulate. So it's just, a, it's just like one minute or two minutes here, but this is a uh, RIP segment, you know, Democracy Now! often, you know, uh, you know, pays tribute to activists that have died. Um, and I just wanted to repeat that right here. And the Norwegian sociologist Johan Galtung has died at the age of 93. He's widely credited as the principal founder of the discipline of peace and conflict studies. He was a past winner of the Right Livelihood Award. He appeared on Democracy Now! numerous times. I look forward to the U.S. instead of intervening militarily, starting solving conflicts. There are so many bright people in this country, so many well-educated people. And you see, solving conflict, you have to talk with the other side or the other sides. Visit democracynow.org to see all our, all our interviews with the late Johan Galtung. Yeah, I, I totally recognize this guy from Democracy Now. They do a lot. He's a very, very smart fella. And, you know, he's not talking about defeatism. He's talking about exactly what I was talking about, is that the United States only has one modus operandi. And unfortunately, Davey, you kind of agree with this, right? But this American exceptionalist POV that it's, it's our way or the highway— you know, better to deal with us than to fight against us. And, you know, and, you know, I guess the idea is that, well, if everyone plays along, then, you know, everything will work just fine. I think that's what American exceptionalists believe. Um, but honestly, um, I think smarter people uh, like to point out that we're not going to get to a sustainable global future where we're, where we're truly working together 
where you know the you know the countries that that need a leg up have given a leg up things have really become equalized amongst the countries things have become stabilized that you know that system can't work with one country um you know having economic dominance over everyone else um some argue though that the only way a global system could work a global system of peace could work is with uh, an actor like the united states a strong actor like the united states who keeps the peace um, but for that argument i would look to america's history in that effort and just how bad they are sometimes and how sometimes america needed to listen to the international community um, instead of doing its own thing and going its own way um <clears throat> yeah davy that might be true that might be true but um, there's no discussion about eliminating the concept of a superpower and representing ourselves equally as a, as a, as a planet, you know, with each region working amongst each other, right? There, there has to be this idea of superiority of, you know, one empire more powerful than the other. And I don't think we could ever get to a point where we eliminate empires except for one, you know? I'm not cool with that. Um, you know, and they're like, well, that's the best we can do. I disagree. I don't think it's easy. Um, but I do think with, uh, as we, um, you know, it, the idea is, I guess, right, to implement more liberalism, to implement more enlightenment, to implement more progressivism across the world, more democracy, more liberty across the world, um, and these problems would eventually iron themselves out because the human nature, um, you know, for the most part, when funneled through a democracy, human nature tends to want peace and stability, um, not chaos that can, that can come from empires wanting to destroy each other. Well, with the majority expansion of NATO, the U.S. is like, yes, yes, I know, Davey. <laughs> I know, and I, I guess you would say that's not a problem, but I would, I, I would argue, and, and I'm definitely not the only person on the left, there's definitely smarter people on the left, who would also like to argue that that is an unsustainable um, modus operandi for the United States Empire, that the United States Empire needs to come to terms with the idea that um, it needs to operate uh, you know, uh, you know, in a more fair fashion. But how do you do that when you're, you know, is the only is the only way to take the United States down a peg is to confront it, right? Is other militaries and other empires to confront it militarily? Well, that doesn't sound like very fun. That doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I don't like that. To me, that sounds like the United States justifying a lot of foreign adventures, a lot of, you know, war with other countries that, you know, a bunch of Americans dying for no good goddamn reason. That's what it sounds like to me. Call me crazy, though. Moving on to our next story. Uh, this is really great. More Perfect Union put this out. Once again, we're kind of highlighting a hero uh, in, in, in America, a hero, an activist. And in this case, this person is, uh, you know, an activist lawyer who's going after corporate America and who's actually been extremely effective. And, you know, it's, it's rare to see. It's rare to see this. Uh, we actually get to see some uh, hucksters, some banksters, uh, held some somewhat accountable for their actions. I don't think they're going to jail. Maybe they do, but I don't think so. But anyway, I think this is really great, and we should highlight it. This fellow here is really cool. Um, yeah, so he's apparently works for the Department of Justice. So, you know, Biden administration, Department of Justice, um, doing something, right? But at the, we should support this, right? We shouldn't. Let's try not to get cynical about it. Companies in America hate. What is going on in this building for reasons that most of the public are Sorry, completely unaware guy. of? I came here Wait. to the United States Department of Justice yes, to guy. talk Sorry, about a sure. specific 800 person unit yes, that works guy. in that building. It's called the Antitrust Division, headed by a man named Jonathan Cantor. If you look. Or no, it's this guy. Sorry. <laughs> it's this guy. <laughs> All right, let's start over. Let's start over. This is the journalist. This is the journalist. Okay. And he's talking about. Okay. The department of this guy inside the Department of Justice. Okay. Restart. 
some of the biggest companies in America hate what is going on in this building for reasons that most of the public are completely unaware of. Yeah. I came here to the United States Department of Justice to talk about a specific 800 person unit that works in that building. Mm. It's called the Antitrust. Do you, I mean, as a person who loves America and wants to see America succeed, do you really think Rome is the best uh, example for, uh, for America to be emulating? Division, headed by a man named Jonathan Cantor. If you look at the headlines about Jonathan Cantor's work, you will see on a daily basis, Wall Street is angry with Jonathan Cantor. Mm. They've never seen a regulator like this guy. They've never seen anyone like him. Angry really? with the antitrust enforcement actions that are going on in the guys Biden in jail? administration. I think if you're Google in particular, I, I would kind of be shaking in my boots. Why? Why do you think really? corporate America is so scared? I hate a guy who plays for free. That's a dangerous thing. So upset with what's going on here in this building behind me. This is a proud oligarch, talk that. so that means something. One of the if, reasons if I was Jim most thinks he's dangerous, to you, Jonathan, is because of your job, an interesting and exclusive perspective on America's economy. You look at a whole host of industries across the board. You think of shipping and rail, okay. private equity, and just want to point out banks. Uh, Clear difference between the neoliberal Democrats, even now with Merrick Garland and their embarrassment, you know, and, 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 and all this, there's a clear difference because the Republicans will get rid of this guy, shut this shit down. The Republicans want none of this, right? They would, the person they would put in charge would, would you know, try to help, help the, these companies commit crimes and be corrupt. It would be the anti-justice department, right? That's what they want to turn it into. So another clear delineation between corporatist neoliberals and fascistic Republicans. Ticket vendors, you know, all kinds of things that you uniquely have perspective on. Do you sense an economy that's getting more complicated for the regular person to navigate? Absolutely. We hear about it every day. We hear from consumers who are increasingly finding it Baby. impenetrable. Companies should be out there innovating to make things easier. And I don't even know what to say Healthcare should man. be about <laughs> delivering the best possible outcome to a patient, not about um, a faceless intermediary. Increasingly, we're seeing these, you know, the rise of intermediaries, platforms, multi-sided markets, things that um, sit between the person who makes something and the person who buys something, the person who offers a service and the person who consumes that service. One of the most important cases that Jonathan is bringing okay. in involves this company called Agristats. Agristats is one of these many middlemen in today's economy. They don't produce anything. They're a data warehouse. They find a price point, a price point that works for the profit maximization of the largest meat producers while keeping the farmers' take as low as possible. More money is being gobbled up by those intermediaries. If you look at a lot of, not all of them, but if you look at a lot of our cases, they're focused on those intermediaries and in making sure that they are not becoming choke points in our economy that they are not becoming facilitators of more money being sucked out of the middle and less going to the people who actually make and build, deliver things, and the people who buy and consume uh, and enjoy things. For many consumers or people who are wondering why they're paying higher prices for X thing, it feels or seems, just reading from your complaints about some of these issues, that it is the role of data being uh, transacted by these middlemen that is playing an inordinate role. Is that fair? Absolutely. So um, the the asymmetry of power, the imbalance, um, is made is amplified by data, and it will be continually amplified by uh, things like AI, where machines can more perfectly and more um, and more quickly figure out how to charge you more, yeah. or how do you. Sure. Um, keep you from going to a competitor that charges less yeah how to extract uh -huh. more from you yeah um, and avoid competition this issue mm -hmm. of algorithmic price fixing that jonathan's talking about is critically important one of his major lawsuits that he's brought involves this texas-based company called real page a pro public investigation of real page found that it is using software to inflate rents that people are paying all across america your yeah. housing price. And that wouldn't be a problem if it if the problem wasn't out of control. And the problem is, is that these big corporations come in, they buy up whole towns, dude. They buy up whole blocks, blocks and blocks and blocks, right? So then they all raise the prices all at the same time. And they've bought so much of that area. They have, they functionally have control 
over that market, very similar to a cartel. Prices are going up because of an algorithm that's telling landlords that they can get more money kind of, out of Jimmy, it. and they're no longer that doing it. Involved data <laughs> are more likely to um, tip to one player uh, and result in more centralized choke point economy. That's a problem. One of the things I'm learning from you in this conversation is that the future of quote unquote price may be less static that what we're seeing through algorithms and the transaction of data okay, what you gonna is do if you about walked it, up Department virtually of to a cereal box now, that price is rotating and moving on you because I, it's gauging who you are, what your consumption no, habits are, how much money what are you we might talking have to spend, about? and literally changing it what? on you. This and those prices aren't just crap. moving what on is this? the consumer, they're moving on everybody in the supply chain. I talk about how yeah. people used to con transact business. And it used to be people, uh, our cases in the antitrust world involved um, smoke filled rooms where people would, you know, shake hands and agree to fix prices. Well, the new theater for that kind of conduct is going to be giving information to um, a, uh, a robot, to AI that steps in and does that same thing, but can do it faster, it can do it more precisely, uh, and it can do it in a way that's more insidious and nefarious. Yeah. And so it's really important that we say, okay, just because it's a one and a zero, it's just because it's being done by a machine instead of a person, doesn't make it any less problematic. In some ways it yeah. makes it worse. How yeah. much does the consideration- Yeah, so he's the... talking about corpor corporations removing accountability for themselves and just saying, well, we, the, the, the price is set by this algorithm that works you know, on its own. And what he's saying is, is that this algorithm is really no different than a cartel working together, you know, a cartel working across states, right? That, you know, that has gobbled up, gobbled up all this uh, property. That's no different than a bunch of people in a smoky room getting together and agreeing to price fix and drive the market up. There's no, that's, the, the algorithm is no different. It's just bigger, you know, it just, it's just doing it on a grander scale but it's the same exact thing. The, the price is not being fixed by, the, uh, by a reflection of the market, right? It's not uh, supply and demand. It's, uh, an, an, it's a company that has an inordinate amount of supply that's choking the market and, and artificially setting the prices higher, of course, for their own gain. Um, if you want to do that with Laffy Taffy, okay, I'm not going to trip. You want to do that with homes you know and other essential commodities you want to you want these you know these these oligarchs these disgusting slimy landlords and fill in the blanks these black rock you know trillionaires to just be you know gleefully playing with uh, with with our entire generation with our entire generation's ability to own a home and why so that they can enrich themselves and turn themselves into billionaire trillionaires and then what do we have to deal with? We have to deal with their silver sp spoon nepotism children who have never struggled a day in their life. Now, all of a sudden, they're running our lives in one way or another, right? It's a nasty little cycle, isn't it? The laborer in today's economy factor into how you think about the cases that you bring. This is essential. There's one case that we're very proud of where we, it was a private case, but where we took an important role um, in arguing uh, for precedent. And this was a woman, a hardworking woman at a McDonald's, and she wanted the opportunity to get a managerial position. She couldn't get it at her current establishment. So she uh, interviewed and got an offer to be a manager at a different franchise. And so this was the path where drop in mobility and go from being a fry cook to being a manager. Yeah, well, there was thing. a non-compete agreement that said she couldn't take the job Ridiculous. at the other fast food establishment even though that job was not available. That's ridiculous. And she had the courage to sue. And we went to court and said, she is right. No, she's a non-compete totally right. agreement that keeps a hardworking woman from having the opportunity to earn more money, not by putting a handout, but earn more money by working harder, by succeeding and getting an offer to be a manager. That's exactly what we should be protecting. Mr. Yeah. Cantor, thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. It's great to be with you. You know, you want to you want to diss on his fashion sense? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, it's it's number nerds like this that get you know that make the world sometimes a better place, oftentimes a worse place.
But let me tell you, I'm not smart enough to keep up with uh, Captain Numbers over here. So, uh, you know, we need we need we need guys like this. Is what I'm trying to say. You know, maybe he's not the most exciting fella, right? Maybe he he goes home and he eats a uh, you know unflavored Wheaties and you know and goes to bed at at six o'clock. No, don't be sorry. I'm just I know. <laughs> I'm just fucking with you. I don't know. I just think it's funny. Um, I he seems he seems really earnest. He seems like he's you know uh you know it, his pedigree speaks for itself. With that said, I'd like to see more. Am I am I too greedy to say that I would like to see more? You know, uh, maybe give this guy a raise, give him more money. He's sus. I don't know about sus, but I mean, I want to. I want to believe this individual is doing everything in his power to do his job to the best of his ability. And if Joe Biden and Merrick Garland or whoever's whoever's in charge of the Department of Justice, however that works, um, you know, they would want to put more resources to this to this guy's effort. That's what I would hope. That is not the history, but what do I know? I'm not a smart guy. Suits suits are great. Suits can make you look really, you know, snazzy. Um, you know, I've been lacking on this story. Um, been totally lacking on this story. By the way, if you're sticking around, uh, congratulations. You know, four hours of straight hardcore news. Congratulations to you, the lurkers, people in the chat. Feeling tired? I'm starting to feel a little tired. But I'm still here for this shit. Uh, I've been lacking on this story. Yeah, big props if you're still here. Still still chatting. Getting an energy drink. Oh, those are terrible for my stomach. Thank you, Lenny. Yeah, one day I'll be as good as your chat, though. As, as good as your stream, I mean. Um... I've been lacking on this story. I want to talk about it. Basic freedoms at stake in the Julian Assange case. This is a Jackman story, uh, but get over it. You know, commies, yada, yada. Uh, exercise on stream. And, you know, as soon as my as soon as my child gives me some time back, um, you know, I'm very lucky to get six hours straight. You know, my wife is actually working very hard to, to give me these six hours to do like this marathon of news, right? Uh, I get it once a week for a reason because it's very difficult, so. Um, and let me tell you, as soon as the stream is over, I run back upstairs and I grab the kid and I start, you know, it's like, okay, you can take a break finally, right? Tea, energy, yeah, tea over energy drinks, big time. Yeah, big time. I had a big thing of coffee. I think I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the coffee crash but I'll get my second wind. I'm drinking water. I'm going to get a second wind here. We're good, folks. We're barreling forward. But we got to talk about Julian Assange um, because, you know, this is, you know, whistleblowers should be protected. He did humanity a favor. He did us a favor showing us the brutality of the military industrial complex because of Julian Assange. We know what a double tap is. Uh, you know, a double. If you don't know what a double tap is, this is when the United States would bomb a target. They would then wait five or ten minutes for emergency vehicles to show up, and then they would then strike the target a second time, intentionally targeting uh, journalists, uh, you know, civilians that are trying to help these people. Uh, he showed us uh, direct evidence of that. Uh, the the gleeful, happy uh, chance. Uh, not chance, but like, you know, just they were celebrating and, and hot, you know, like, a, you know, woo, yeah, good job. We got them, smoked them. Really disgusting stuff. Uh, what was the name of it? Coming to my mind. It's not coming to my mind. It's got a really snazzy name. It'll come to me. But, you know, and, and of course, all the other stuff that WikiLeaks has done. Real journalism. Real muckraking. The exact point of journalism. If you defend, if you defend the government actions of censorship and uh, uh, you know the outright attacks against Julian Assange, then you defend empire uh, treating people 
uh, like, you know, like animals. Um, you know, if, if you, well, Chelsea, yeah, Chelsea, did Chelsea Manning, what was the, damn it, uh, what did, what was it released? Uh, no, but it, it was uh, Bradley Manning. Manning released, what was it called? What was it called? Um, yeah, so I, I knew Davey, I had a feeling Davey was gonna be repeating these, these uh, the, uh, he's a bad guy. Oh, you know, oh, did he rape somebody, Davey? Even though that entire thing fell apart, that entire case fell apart just recently. Uh, God damn it. It was called, uh, da, 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 da. is it, is mainstream even going to call it what it actually is? Lease Manning Chronicles. What was it called? Oh, I'm floundering. Lucifer 2.0. No. <laughs> um, yeah, I've heard, I've heard some of that as well, uh, about Julian Assange, uh, you know, but Honestly, WikiLeaks has done um, an amazing amount of uh, it, it, WikiLeaks has done an amazing thing for humanity, showing us the callousness the uh, of these empires, just showing us just how brutal these empires are happy to be. Um, what was it called? In What was it called? Classified databases. What was it called? Whistleblower court martial. Da, 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 da. Early life. Yeah. Da, 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 da. They posted papers. Yeah, Iraqi war logs. Yeah, he, he disguised it as a Lady Gaga CD. Uh, uh, sorry, this is really slowing the stream down, but this is important. I can't believe I can't remember the name of, it, of, of this incident. And I can't believe I'm not finding the name of it here. I'm sure it's in here somewhere. Uh, it'll it'll come to me like six hours later. Um, collateral murder. Yes. Thank God. Found it. This is what this is what it was called. Yes. Found it. Found it. Collateral murder. That was the the video I was describing earlier. They they literally got it in Wikipedia right here. Um, Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, um, and Julian Assange whistleblowers heroes and you know it's it's really frightening to see you know people that you know in the chat right now we're like oh yeah well you know it's so it's justified it's justified it's you you know he's a bad guy he's a bad guy it's really sad to see that because the the things the things we know now um about these empires um, really, you know, there's, there's a reality. I'm curious though. Let's see this Russia, WikiLeaks, Russia ties, because of all the characters of all the characters that, you know, cause I really support Chelsea Manning. I really support Edward Snowden, but you know, I do. I've heard, I've heard some of the criticisms against, uh, Julian Assange. I don't really believe all of it. Um, uh, but is he one of these, the, the phenomenon of lefties, supporting russia uh is very real and of course julian assange what he stayed in a russian embassy how long how long was he there so let's see here um this is this is very interesting wow 2017 we're going way back but that's okay interesting um Julian Assange insi insists against all evidence that the hacked Democratic emails WikiLeaks published didn't come from Russian intelligence services. Yeah, yeah, okay, I see. That's what people are pointing out. The stupid election crap. God, all the good journalism that he's done, right? And all the, all the focus is on the stupid... 
you know, information about Hunter Biden's fucking PP, you know. Quote, our source is not the Russian government, he said in a Tuesday interview with Sean Hannity. This is a touch hard to believe. Publicly available evidence, including unique code and Russian writing in the hack documents themselves, link, link the document theft to Russian state-sponsored hacks. So that's interesting. They put little codes and stuff in there. Every U.S. intelligence agency that has investigated the issue has concluded Russia is, in fact, responsible. Leaks from their analyses reported by CNN and the Washington Post indicate the U.S. has identified the go-betweens used by Russia to hand documents to WikiLinks. All right. Yeah, I don't like that. And and the reason why I have an issue with this is because, like, well, if you're going to lie about this, right, what else isn't exactly true? So this does kind of taint that body of work. But... I mean, WikiLeaks stands on its own, right? The the work that WikiLeaks has done stands on its own. And there's there's definitely been WikiLeaks that are anti-Russian. But this is troubling. Yeah, I, I kind of forgot about this. But yeah, this is definitely troubling. Indeed, when it comes to Russia, Assange didn't have a ton of credibility. Throughout WikiLeaks' existence, the allegedly pro-transparency group has had a strange, shadowy, but very well-documented connections to the Russian state. The connections range from a shared purloined documents with a pro-Russian dictator to Assange receiving money for appearing on Russian state TV to WikiLeaks key involvement to NSA whistleblower Edward Snow and ending, ending up in Russia. Oh, God. We just can't have any nice things, can we, guys? These incidents don't prove, as some have alleged, that Assange is some kind of paid Russian agent or that WikiLinks is a Russian front organization. Well, that's in this own article here. But they do show that WikiLeaks, an organization purportedly devoted to transparency, is at a minimum okay with helping out the world's most aggressively authoritarian leader. That's a good point. I, I'm not really going to contest that. Ugh. Oh, I have tiny nuts. Wonderful. That's the name. This person's in my chat. Name. I have tiny nuts. I don't listen to true facts if it comes from people I don't like. Hats off to you, sir. Hat, hats off to you, sir. The fact that the Russia really ruined his credibility, his entire purpose was to expose illegal government spying, and he literally moved to a dictatorship. What kind of choice did he have, Davey? He had to get from out the uh, American Western umbrella, though. Right? You're not safe. You're not safe in Switzerland. You're not safe in France. You're not safe in Germany. Right? You're not safe in the UK. You're not safe, you know? Didn't he have kind of no choice but to pick an empire? China, Russia? Sure. Thank you. No, no problem. So, uh, folks, I got to get my kid in the car so my wife can do some grocery shopping and keep my beautiful family afloat here. So I need to find a video uh, to play uh, for a couple minutes. Um, this is all very interesting about Julian Assange. You know, at the end of the day, I, I want to let me let me just finish my thoughts, though. At the end of the day, I do think Julian Assange, WikiLeaks, Edward Snowden, uh, Chelsea Manning, especially, did humanity a favor to show us, you know, it does look like in some cases, maybe they did the right thing for the wrong reasons and that there were some, you know, interesting motivations. Um, with that said, um, the people that are, you know, to the, let me ask, let me ask Davey and the other people in the chat that are showing me these facts here. Um, do you really want to see a system that goes after whistleblowers in this way turns them into criminals uh you know there's you know they the system claims to protect whistleblowers but honestly tries to destroy them you know do we really want that to be the precedent are we okay with that regardless of the motivations of of these individuals why they release this information you know what i mean do we really want anti-whistleblower legislation do we want that to be the precedent Davin saying yes, that's frightening. Really sad. All right, well, I'm
I'm going to show this uh, this piece of good news I had queued up for after the mass shooting update, but I need a couple minutes. Um, could you tell me why? Could you tell me why you think empires should go after whistleblowers and why that's a good thing for society, Devin? Could you please tell me? Oh, just kidding. Okay, well, you're fine. Okay. Just kidding. All right. Uh, but let me show this was supposed to be the good news that I was going to show. We're going to see it a little bit early. This futurist... This is boring. I need I need to I need to put more oomph behind this. I, I can't just show this without without proper uh shit. Um uh, uh, uh. No, hold on. No, you're good. Hold on. Um ba -ba 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 -ba. Man, I have a lot of articles set up here. <laughs> Okay, here we go. This is great. Nice 10 minute video about women in the Ukrainian military. This is really cool. Absolutely cool stuff. Let me show this here. We will wait. No, 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 no. Let me get you something here. This is a really great story. Women in the Ukrainian military. Out of more than 400,000 soldiers currently serving in the Ukrainian armed forces, about 20% are women. The majority serve in supporting roles, but some have gone to fight on the front lines in Ukraine's ongoing war against Russian in Russia's invasion. Getting that chance was a fight in itself, as DW's Max Sander reports. One shot. one kill. Meet Alexandra. She used to work in a bakery. Now she's a sniper. Today she shows us what she does on a hundred meter range somewhere in central Ukraine. At the front line, her targets can be more than a kilometer away. Her job takes skill and a certain mindset. Well, I see my enemy. I see the occupier who came to our land to destroy our state, our people, nothing more. She says many still question her ability to do this because she's a woman. Women have long served in the Ukrainian armed forces, but few take part in combat. Oh, no, the woman who shot this video is another one. It's last fall near Avdiivka. Ukrainian soldiers are holding the line against a Russian onslaught. After hours of battle, they bring their wounded to safety. We meet Elena in Donbas region. When not fighting, she stays in a village. She says joining the war changed her life. Here I feel life on my tongue, on my lips. I feel much more than I did in civilian life. Before the war, she was a communication trainer in Kyiv. A few months into the full-scale invasion, she signed up. She felt she'd ignored the war for too long. Now Olena clears trenches with the infantry. She had to push for a frontline job. He asked me, do you really want a combat position? It's difficult, and not all commanders accept girls in combat positions. I said, I don't care. What's going on with the commanders? I don't care how hard it is. I know for sure that I can. Women have been allowed to serve in combat roles since 2018, but not everyone sees their worth on the battlefield. Olena says her experiences are overall Alrighty. good, but she too had to prove to her comrades she was a good fighter. I have never heard such words of admiration towards me. Everyone told me the same thing. Olena, you have bigger balls than some of our guys. You're one of the best because what you did there deserves a lot of respect. And after that, everything changed. Frontline fighting, right? These ladies are on the front line, right? Yeah, no, I don't care who you are, dude. You know, I don't care if you're like, you know, you know, transgender, ace, ace queer, you know, you got purple mohawks. I don't care what's going on, dude. If you know how to handle yourself on the front line, that's all I would care about. She has been decorated for her courage Dang, she big. by President Zelensky. Yet, it's not all bravado. 
She's used social media posts to show her reality of the war. Very nice. This video was recorded after a battle with heavy losses. <laughs> Be cursed, everyone who's behind this. <laughs> Back in central Ukraine, sniper Alexandra takes us to the temporary flat she shares with her husband, who also joined up. Oh, wow. Her theory is that gender stereotypes can become self-fulfilling. Yeah. Unfortunately, men, probably without realizing it themselves, with their exaggerated care and attitude towards women, make women calmer, prevent them from becoming stronger and being equal with them. As a sniper, where you need to be invisible, she says being as small as she is can be an advantage. And women in general can be less emotionally driven than men, she suggests. Mm. They are not only less aggressive, I think both genders but also are capable think of more about kind of each stuff. task. That is, they do not do it suddenly, but try to think it over analyze it, and carry it out with a cool head, thinking more about safety and those around them. That's not a view shared by many in the military. Every woman in the army has to show that she is worthy to be in the same combat position and fight on an equal footing with a man. That's something infantry soldier Elena has also had to do. She says she has been accepted by her peers, but two years into the war, as Ukraine struggles to fill the ranks, many women who want to follow her example have a fight on their hands to do so. And for more on that, let's bring in Sabina Frazier from Kyiv. She is a Okay, so unfortunately, I don't have time for this amazing interview with this amazing woman who's gonna give us more amazing information, but please make sure you uh, if you want to know more, here's the link right there to this DW report. Uh, once again, I do apologize, uh, you know, for, for this abrupt break there. We were talking about Julian Assange and, uh, and whistleblowers, and I had to shift over to this. I really couldn't find another video. I had no idea. I had so many articles lined up. Uh, but let's go ahead and finish up our U.S. news. Um, let me just read a little bit from this article. You know, we've, like I said, like I said before, um, you know, and I didn't see a lot of responses in the chat about, uh, you know, do you agree with whistleblowers? Do you think whistleblowers are a good thing? We really only saw, uh, let's see, tiny nuts here. You can see the government is full of it. The FBI constantly leaked out at a journalist and government never goes after them. Yeah. I mean, can we, can, okay, whether we like Julian Assange or, you know, we think, okay, something's up with Ed, Edward Snowden in Russia, okay. Um, can we all agree that whistleblowers are, we should support whistleblowers, like as, as citizens should support, you know, well-meaning uh, people in government who are like, this is wrong, this is a crime, we're going to tell the world about it. Do we really want to discourage that? You know, are we, are we China? You know, like, no, no, we're too stupid. We can't handle this information. The government should keep us in the dark uh, about its crimes and the government should be allowed to commit crimes and we shouldn't, we shouldn't know about it. And, and, and people who tell us about the crimes are the real criminals. Do we really want that? You know, that doesn't sound like America to me. Um, so I fully support whistleblowers. And, you know, I, I do think though that we do have, we might have a case of, um, people doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. It, 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 you know, as more information comes out, we, that might be the case. Um, at least half an hour before the Royal Courts of Justice opened their doors on Tuesday, February 20th, thousands had already gathered outside the courthouse in two hours, yada, 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 yada. yada. My opinion of the protesters getting outside could be heard in the chat. There's only one decision, no extradition. I agree with that. Over the next two days, protesters remained outside the courthouse. They gathered before court opened, and many were still outside when it ended. Okay, lots about the crowd. Members of Assange family, family's legal team, free Assange ribbons, across the street, courthouse, podium, speakers addressed. According to Corbin, so, okay, Jeremy Corbin was there. Jeremy Corbin told the protesters, Assange is a real journalist. Real journalists take risks. Real journalists go, uh, journalists go for the truth, whatever the cost. I agree with that statement. Um, according to Corbin, Assange, prior to his imprisonment, was telling the truth about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's a true fact. That's a fact. Corporate greed and exploitation of the poorest nations. I believe that's true. 
like I said, WikiLeaks has released a lot of really good information, journalistic, you know, uh, sourced information that helped us help, you know, I think continues to help us get a better idea of the world around us. And it's like, do we really throw the baby out with the bathwater here? Um, you know, it's such an amazing resource. Anyway, as you can see here, more about Julian Assange. Uh, really, I just wanted to talk about whistleblowers. Hopefully, I, I'm seeing a lot of silence about whistleblowers in the chat. That's very troubling, quite frankly. But my consensus is that whistleblowing is good. We should support more blowing. I mean, whistleblowing. But I would like to see more blowing. I mean, whistleblowing uh, in the government. But no, for real, I, you know, I think whistleblowing is a good thing. Uh, as a citizen, as a citizen who would like to see less crime and corruption and, you know, overall, you know, terrible actions from our government, I'd like to see more whistleblowing, quite frankly, and have them supported. I wanted to take a shit. I should have added this to my uh, attack from the left here. Go ahead and do this. I'm going to add this to my attack from the left segment. But I'm so sick of these neoliberals, right? So fucking smug. So fucking smug. Depends on what they're whistling about. Yeah, okay. Mr. American Exceptionalist. Um, but the, the smugness of this. I still haven't finished thanking all those swing state purity test libs for helping kill Roe v. Wade. So the, the, uh, implying that the people who voted Bernie Sanders and voted Jill Stein are somehow responsible for for us losing Roe v. Wade. That's a crackhead. Right? It had nothing to do with I mean we we gave we gave several super majorities to the to the neoliberals. <laughs> several super majorities to the neoliberals couldn't do it. Every for people who didn't want to vote for Hillary, everything SCOTUS does is your fault. Was it is it really the progressives fault? that Barack Obama allowed Mitch McConnell to play him like a little bitch and prevent for an for an entire year uh, a nomination from getting in is that really our fault the the people who supported Bernie Sanders is that really our fault that Barack Obama let Mitch McConnell play him like a little bitch John Fusel Fusel, Fusel saying no C level celebrity some actor and commentator Alex Cole, don't even know who the fuck you are. You know what I mean? Hey guys, did you know if you supported Bernie Sanders, you supported the uh, the 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 end of Roe v. Wade? Did you know that? Such such bollocks, and we're still getting it from these MSNBC M MSNB soaked MSNBC irony soaked dumbasses who think they live in an episode of West Wing and applaud like seals when the neoliberals say something moderately progressive, don't bother to follow up and see if they actually accomplish it. Happy to celebrate the victory just in the rhetoric. Just tired of it. Tired of the lies, dude. If it, it, we were trying to, we were the people, the people who supported Bernie Sanders were the people screaming the loudest to the neoliberals, we gotta do something about this. We got to put somebody in charge who can actually win. People hate Hillary Clinton. And we were right, John. Oh, no, no, no. It's it, it, the progressive's fault that, that Hillary Clinton's shitty political strategy failed. Her, her focus on, on conservative, moderate conservatives over, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, rock standard, rock bog standard, you know, democratic locate, you know, doubling down, going in and getting out the vote in some of these locations. She thought she could appeal to moderate conservatives to vote for her because that's what a moderate conservative wants is a Republican light who they hate. Because people loved Hillary Clinton, John. And the problem was the progressives. So expect... If if the if the neoliberals lose to the fascists this you know this this election cycle, expect these assholes to have no remorse, to have no like ability to look at their own failures, to look at their own party, and they're going to be looking for the finger to blame. 
How can they blame the progressives, though, when we have been a the the, the uh, Cornell West, uh, you know, uh, Marianne Williamson has been a non-factor, zero factor, right? Exclude no debates, excluded from the debates, right? Never has has uh, progressive challengers uh, been so left out of this year's election cycle for the for the Democrats, right? Will, will John really have the balls to blame us this election cycle if Biden loses? Right? The, the progressives are less than relevant. I swear to God, more, Nick Fuentes has a, loud, has a louder voice politically right now than the squad, than AOC, than the Bernie Sanders, you know, Bernie bros in this election. Right? But who do you think John's going to blame when the neoliberals, if the neoliberals loot? God help us all if they do. Um, I guess, I guess this is, we're just going back to these segments that I thought I left. Oh, here it is. Sorry. Um, but no, here we go. Another right wing fash update. Utter stupidity. Missouri Republican bids to bring back dueling for senators. <laughs> This is the modern Republican Party, folks. Hillary was a disaster. But no, no, it was the Bernie bros. How do I feel about Biden reaching out to Haley supporters? I mean, it's release the statement, but don't make that a core part of your strategy. Right, Davin? You know what I mean? It's fine. Release the statement. Say, hey, look, you know, you, you know, you might actually find, you know, that Unfortunately, you know, your values as a person who supported Nikki Haley might align with the modern neoliberal party, which is a pretty gross thing to say, but who cares? I mean, the, the neoliberals never care about progressives. Fuck. It, with, with, you, it, the, the neoliberals are the party most responsible for crushing progressives in the United States. And I would say with this election cycle, they have full blown succeeded. Right? I mean, remember Dennis Kucinich? Remember uh, 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 Mike Gravel? Remember, you know, Bernie Sanders? Remember these elements, these these elements coming thin, make loud noises? That has been completely destroyed. Cornell West and Marianne Williamson, and, you know, the best, they, the best uh, alternate voice was uh, RFK, a fucking maniac, who was basically a conservative, right? He was the loudest alternative voice, this Kennedy who has a bunch of you know, crazy ideas. They don't care. Biden doesn't care about progressives. Fuck, man, the DNC, the, the Debbie Washerman Soltz is still there, right? The the damn executioner for the for the progressives during the, the Bernie Sanders campaign. Still there. Oh, they're proud of her, proud of her. You know, happy to have her. They don't give a shit about progressives. But here we go. Just more examples of 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 what you can expect Republicans to 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 start putting ourselves through. Thought I'd show this. Yeah, neoliberals don't give a shit about what progressives think. Joe Biden brags that he's a Zionist and hates socialism. Laughs, laughs. He you know he laughs at the very idea that they could be a socialist party. And he's right. Um, one sec. I gotta look out my door. I gotta see what this crackhead is doing. One second. It's all good. I'm I'm a I, I, I'm an idiot. It's all good. Okay. Or thing might be looking for, uh, you know, shelter. It's raining outside. But you know, you know what you know a crackhead when you see one, dude. You know they, you know what they look like. I wanted to show this here um, because <laughs> I guess once again, this <laughs> this is kind of attack from the left. <laughs> I'm doing, I, you know, I can't, there's so much, there's so much here. So what this is about, um, so, uh, you know, well-meaning 
neoliberal aligned politicians came in and decriminalized, uh, you know, ownership of certain drugs in Oregon. And uh, it's been a failure. And of course, you know, we'll, you know, critics for the next three decades, you know, in Oregon will say, oh, you see, it failed. We tried, we tried decriminalization, it failed. It, we tried it, it failed. And the problem is, is that it, it, was, it was, the reason why this failed is because the neoliberals were in charge of it. And they only did, you know, they only did, they did, they did decriminalization. They didn't, they didn't also, in, you know, fund a, uh, you know, a recovery, re-education, you know, job placement program. You know, it doesn't, decriminalization doesn't work without a suite of other services to help those people get back on their feet. Just making it legal to take heroin uh, doesn't actually fix the problem of heroin addiction. Um, so what we're seeing is a pullback now that will, of course, be, like I said, characterized as, oh, look at this, this is a failure of liberal policies, this is a progressive idea that progressives are constantly talking about. You know, we need to reclassify drug addiction from a, um, you know, from a crime to a health, uh, you know, to health issue. Well, look what happens when you do that. Crime goes up, people get hurt, um, you know, and it's like, well, no, that's, this is what happens when you decriminalize without fully supporting that decriminalization with a, like I said, full suite of recovery uh, services, um, you know, common sense things um, that, that would help people get back on track. A bill that would make possession of small amounts of drugs a crime in Oregon for the first time in three years is now one vote from reaching the desk of Governor Tina Kotek. On Thursday, the House voted overwhelmingly to pass House Bill 4002, despite many lawmakers voicing concern that the proposal goes too far or not far enough. Some lawmakers said that they hoped that the threat of consequences will convince drug users to pursue treatment. Whoops. No, I'm... Uh, quote, a drug user has two options, to pursue treatment or to serve jail time, said Rep. L. Del R. Stanton. So I'm afraid there's probably some people in the chat that agree with this statement and that this is just does, you know, that we've had decades of this attitude for, uh, for drug addicts and it's only created more drug addicts. And in fact, when you, when you have this system and you fill your prison with people that are in the situation, you basically turn your prison into a uh, criminal training facility right that recidivism is is guaranteed and uh you know and uh, you know the idea that people you know will have some kind of life skills when they get out of there and have some kind of future is uh um you know a fantasy echoing many many of his gop colleagues quote i believe this uh this is the compassionate thing to do for people afflicted with addiction who are not voluntarily seeking treatment so there you go right so here's the right wing Coming again, saying, "See, we tried the lefty stuff; it didn't work." And this, this is the danger when you, when, when progressives and lefties put our hope in a mediocre party, like Joe Biden's neoliberals that we see right now. They fail. They make us look bad. And then, you know, how, how, how much did this set people in Oregon back? Right? But for the, like I said, the next 20, 30 years, maybe. There'll always be, oh, you see, Dukakis, you know, he's, that, that argument, right? Oh, you see, well, we tried it. We tried being liberal. Didn't work. Clearly, the only solution is conservative. Treat people like animals. Criminalize it. Others voiced hope the bill would help the state continue to expand addiction services while helping to rein in the public drug use and surging overdoses that have many Oregonians frustrated and alarmed. Quote, I'm confident the compromise that 4002 represents is a good one, said State Rep. Maxine Dexter. She's a uh, Democrat from Portland, a physician. It addresses public drug use while also treating addiction as the public health crisis. Okay, so sounds like the Democrats are uh, finding consensus with this bill. The strong support bore little resemblance to the fiery debate that has made HB 4002 one of the most contentious bills of this year's five-week legislation, legislation se session. But it wasn't shared by all lawmakers. Quote, the passage of this bill will still be a re regression towards the failed war on drugs, said Rep. Mark Gamba of Milwaukee. Um, I think the town Milwaukee. Who said opposing the bill was the toughest vote he had taken as a lawmaker. It's a step backwards for us as a society. Interesting. 
So it sounds like it was kind of a mixed bag and he just couldn't vote for it. It goes back into recriminalizing drug usage. Get gnomed. Nope. Yeah, Ghost Towns are losing a cell full tape. Make sure you like and then subscribe to this underground music, folks. Yo, this is this is some hot ass shit right here. I'm loving this. Listen to this whole album again. I was like, I was just like listening to this like really quiet. My headphones I was like, God damn, that's hot ass shit, dude. Um, all right. So I just wanted to talk about that. If you want to read this whole thing right here, it's uh, here's the article. Oregon takes massive step towards recriminalizing drug possession. Yeah, me too, Malum. Me too. I saw D Live there. The gnome. I got gnomed. Um, I hate to put Ghost Town on pause, but folks, it's America's number one favorite uh, segment, news segment. It's the mass shooting update. All right. So, folks, we've had 87 mass shootings uh, in 2024. Wow. Hmm. <clears throat> Quite a bit. 5,979 mass shootings since 2013 and three whole days since the last mass shooting. Thank you, good guys with guns. Three days of peace. Three days of peace. Excellent. Well, uh... Before these uh, three days of serenity, we had a couple incidents uh, over there in Philadelphia. PA, zero dead and eight injured. Juvenile victims, all eight victims, tragically, were between the ages of 15 and 18. Gunman is unknown. I'm sure the gun was legal, and I'm sure the uh, thing that they were arguing over was uh, a legitimate reason to pull out uh, deadly weapons. Another one in Philadelphia, PA, one dead this time and four injured. Juvenile victims once again, 17-year-old male who's killed. Two 15-year-old males among the wounded. Gunman unknown. Once again, I'm sure this conflict, uh, the only, only feasible way to, uh, to relieve this conflict was to get out the blickies and show who's the real man. Over there in King City, California, four dead and seven injured. Jesus Christ, it's a fucking massacre. Victim fatalities, Alicia Ramirez uh, Aparicio. Grands Canso Aldalpe, 32. Both people, 32. Olivio Perez, 32. Mario Guzman Mendoza, 42. Gunman, unknown. Jesus Christ, what the hell happened? Monterey County, Mash... Okay, come on with this. Okay, I didn't... You know, come on. All right, hold on. Different news source. Monterey County Sheriff's Office have located stolen KIA used by suspects in King City shooting. city surrounding that deadly mass shooting over the weekend. The Monterey County Sheriff's Office says they've now located the car that was used to carry out this attack on Sunday. Deputies only saying they found the silver Kia in an unincorporated part of South Monterey they fucked up County. A, lot of people. a reminder, there is that $20,000 reward for Damn. anyone who can help provide information leading to an arrest. Meanwhile, happening tomorrow, there is a prayer vigil that's going to be oh, held good. for the victims oh, of the God. shooting. We've reported good. that there were 11 guys. total people shot, four people died, seven injured. Wow. That vigil organized by law enforcement community leaders. It starts at 6 p.m. at Shalone Peaks Middle School. Mm. Well, nothing we can do about it. And keep going here. West Point, Missouri, uh, one dead and 12, vic uh, 12 injured. Victim fatalities, Tallahassee Chandler, 20-year-old 20, uh, 20 female, uh, was the person who died. Gunman unknown. Over there in Natchez, Missouri. Is that what this is? Uh, one dead and three injured victim fatalities. Cameron D. Jackson, 19, gunman unknown. Isn't that interesting? You know, quite a phenomenon, right? Two in Philadelphia, two in Missouri. Separate incidences. Well, there you go. Uh, folks, Garbage Fuel would like to thank you for watching the mass shooting update and remind you that this, uh, this is the new normal. This is it. Uh, you know, uh, you go to church, go to school, go to a public event. Uh, go to a barbecue, a gas station. Um, you know, you're associated with somebody who's associated with somebody who pissed somebody off. Well, now you're in the crosshairs. Garbage people just like to remind you, this is the new normal. And, uh, and, and we'd like to thank 
Uh, I would like to thank Garbage Fuel for sponsoring the Mass Shooting Update. Thank you so much, Garbage Fuel, for sponsoring the Mass Shooting Update. Very much appreciate it. All right, moving on uh, from U.S. news into our good news section. Hey, Davin, you know, it, it'll work one of these days. Come on, man. Let Jesus into your heart, dude. Don't be a cynic. I know one thing that won't fix it. Uh, gun control, obviously. There's there's no body of evidence the size of the Empire State Building that you could provide me that would prove me that would prove me wrong that restricting access to certain guns would prevent uh, some of these mass shootings. I simply I simply refuse ide ideologically refuse to accept any evidence to the contrary. Oh, Davin, because that's what we need, right? I showed you evidence, teenagers getting getting a hold of all kinds of weapons they shouldn't have, and you're still proudly, everyone should get a gun, don't take my guns away. Do you know what I mean? The problem will never be over. And because of gun anarchists like Davin, uh, it's a problem that we're, we're gonna constantly have to deal with. Like I said, your school, your school event, uh, barbecuing with your buddies, you know, some football game. Could be the next scene of a mass murder. Thank you, Davin. Thank you for agreeing with gun ar anarchy. That's really great of you. Thank you. Her fault for going out without her umbrella and matching riot shield. Halski, you have a good point. People should just be, you know, it. You people, everyone should be strapped. And every, everyone, sorry, I'm sarcastic. I see. You're very funny. I take back those statements. But I mean, I take back those statements against you specifically, but not what I said. You know what I mean? Because it's so cynic. It's so cynical, right? I just, I literally listed off uh, a list of, of massacres and tragedies, right? And people would say, oh, 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 you're not going to take my gun. You're not going to take my gun. You're not going to take my gun. There's no, there's no way to fix this problem. I just, I'm just, now I agree with this idea. There's no fixing it. Nope. Nothing we can do. Pathetic. Good. His with guns will never fix gun violence. Good guys with guns will never fix gun violence. I don't know. I think we should try for the next 50 years um, and, you know, just, just live, you know, in a, in a situation worse than the Wild West. Uh, I'd like to remind people that in the Wild West, you know, uh, unlike the way that the movies portrayed it, most towns took your gun when you walked into town. You weren't allowed to mosey in with a posse, two, two guns on your hip, and start trouble at the saloon. You know, that lasted about a that lasted about a month in some towns. You know what I'm saying? I don't know the facts here. But I do know in the Wild West, gun control was a very normal thing. And a lot of these, I mean, literally the entire conflict over the OK Corral, I need to remind you this, the entire conflict at the OK Corral was about a group of hoodlums that refused to disarm when the sheriff told them to. Literally that entire shootout was about gun control. And guess who won, motherfucker? You know who won that one. So this, this idea that we were somehow safer or had more freedom when we had more guns, uh, well, is creating the problem we have today. Uh, what problem? I don't know what you're about. What problem? Everything's great. Moving on to our Gaza coverage. Yay! Oh my God. Good news, folks. Celebrate! Oh God! Celebrate! Oh God! Moving on to the good news over at Gaza. Uh, people are starving. Um, you know, aid packages falling out of the sky. I'd like to update. Oh, real quick, real quick, actually. Real quick, now that I remember, because I almost forgot, I forgot last stream as well. There was a correction I, I, was, I was covering while we're transitioning over to Gaza. While we're in this transitionary period. I was corrected on my coverage about Forever Chemicals and microplastics by somebody. And I wanted to read off their correction here and just let me see if I can find it. Um, 
you know, the, he was like, I'm not trying to nitpick or anything, but no, it was very clear. So basically, if I can't find the comment, let me just explain what he said. Oh, here we go. Yo, just a nitpick. This is by a person named Y. I'm not sure who they are in the chat. Uh, yo, just a nitpick. You conflated PFAS and microplastic pollution in your recent coverage, but these are um, actually two independent issues. Probably could, don't need to do the um, buddy. It's all right. Uh, PFAS, PFOS are bioaccumulative forever chemicals used for nonstick services and fire retarded treatments, Teflon, Scotchgard, and your outdoor clothing, and has helpfully been introduced to the USA's groundwater, gr groundwater, groundwater nationwide by a firefighting foam usage at military bases. That's true. I remember hearing about that. Um, uh, you know, the military bases are often exempt from certain uh, pollutionary pollution standards. Pollutionary, Jesus Christ. This is what was banned in food containers recently. Microplastics are just tiny chunks of plastic, which are also bioaccumulative and can both physically and chemically disrupt living tissue. Lots of nasty pollutants are hydrophobic and accumulate on plastics over time and environment. So the particles are like little poison bombs that the body has no way of processing or excreting. Both things are ubiquitous globally and can be found in Arctic and Alpine snow, which is some of the most remote regions in, in, in the world. And in every homo sapien tested, that's right, every hum, single human being tested has uh, forever chemicals and microplastics. Uh, he says, pushes glasses up nose. We can solve the PFAS problem by not making it any more and waiting, and waiting a millennia but we might be fucked on the microplastic front. Is it possible we children of men ourselves here? So uh, referencing children of men, uh, the, the, the children of men is a, is a brilliant movie where uh, fertility, you know, like uh, there's a fertility crisis um, and only, you know, it, like most, most children are still born and only like one pregnancy out of a million uh, actually, you know, goes to fruition, right? So humanity basically has a massive crisis. And one, the reason why he brings up fertility is because people are saying these forever chemicals, these PFAVs, these microplastics, which are different things, um, but are still bioaccumulative, um, they might be the result of the, la the, the, the loss of fertility that we've been seeing. Uh, 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 every nation, every nation's dealing with this, you know, and the economy is one thing. People just are, are, don't feel incentivized to have kids. But the people who want to have kids are having a harder and harder time having children. And people think, and of course, the increased cancers. There's a lot of cancers that we have now that historically humanity has never had. So people are starting to think, hey, does it have something to do with these incredibly toxic chemicals that, you know, every human being seems to have? Does, you know, does, does the rise of all this have something to do with that? And more and more science is coming out and linking that, yes. Um, uh, Davey, <laughs> so so appropriate to give me that feedback. Um, over D Live, very appropriate. Just reading your comments here, really quick. Hard to believe we've gone so far, totally. Uh, wait, Super Earth would be overrun by automaton and bug armies without their freedom guns. <laughs> Ever think about that for a second? We can't possibly give up our guns for this reason. That's a good point. I like I like Davy's idea where you can rent guns, right? Where that way that way humanity can still know how to fire a weapon, but we don't have to deal with maniacs building up their own arsenals. Now we get to watch genocide victims thin in real time and in color. No more restoring 40s footage for human skeletons. Thanks, Israel. Olski, geez, tell us how you really think. All right, so let's get to it here. Gaza coverage, folks. Um. This is great news. Uh, the Israel, that looks like the world is starting to give up, you know, on this lie that UNRWA is a Hamas organization run by Hamas and we need to ban UNRWA. Um, you know, it looks like Canada is done pretending that this is a danger to humanity to feed men, women, and children. Oh, well, you're feeding the terrorists too. You're feeding the terrorists too. Okay, well. Um, it's It's undeniable. Some of this food gets to men, women, and children, and feeds them, and they're and because and they're hungry, and I like that. That's a good thing. I don't think it's justified enough to make those people starve 
because some of these resources may be going to Hamas. Um, I think it's impossible to 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 deny that some of it probably does end up there, though, right? I mean, that's just the cost of doing business, it seems. Um, I feel like it's worth it. I I, I don't want to see images of children with uh, distended stomachs, you know, where where you're starving so much, your belly it looks like you're full. It looks like you you know, it looks like you're fat. But no, you're so hungry. Your body does this weird thing with your with your stomach, and um, yeah, I think I would rather you know Hamas get, you know gets a couple sacks of flour, and not have to see that. Um, yeah, Chem Goblin, I agree with you there. Nobody should only go unless they extremely throw a bag. Yeah, I mean Japan seems to have a pretty good uh, grip on things when it comes to guns, uh, except for the uh, political maniacs who make their own shotguns. All right, let's get to it. After five months of war, this flower is desperately needed food, and there is not enough. People in Rafa, Gaza, scramble to get what they can. What UNRWA provides is not enough, this man says. We have children who need milk. They cannot stand on their feet. The United Nations agency has been the main source of aid in Gaza, but many countries, including Canada, pulled their funding in January, when Israel alleged 12 members of its staff were involved in the October 7th attacks by Hamas. 1,200 people were killed, another 253 taken hostage. Yeah, Lenny. The UN launched an investigation. Pretty big success the story there, I'd say. Wait. Now, amid dire warnings of famine, a move by Canada. UNRWA forms the backbone of the humanitarian response in Gaza and in the region because of its networks, because of its presence and its history on the ground. Um, so <laughs> we are resuming <laughs> uh, our relationship and funding. Part of the government's Very decision hinging on an interim UN report that has not been made public. Canada's ambassador to the UN says it neither exonerates UNRWA staff nor does You're it confirm You're a progressive, Ken Goblin. The report couldn't either do either without getting a full, full dose of the information from the government of Israel. And that's the information that people are still waiting for and that we still haven't received. CBC News was the first to report Canada's announcement was coming earlier this week. Hearing it, some in Gaza said they hoped others would follow suit. People are dying of hunger, said this man. They've been starving for two, three months. Many of Canada's allies have not resumed payments, and Ottawa's decision is controversial here. Jewish organizations and even a couple of liberal MPs have said it is the wrong call, especially without conclusive evidence man. that clears UNRWA. It's disgusting. No, they're, they're, come on. What, what, conclude, what do you want? You're setting a standard. You've got to give us what standard, what standard do we need to meet? Because they, they fired these people in question. They've done their own investigations. Other countries have done their own investigations. It's not a Hamas-run organization. Um, you know, they take volunteers from Palestine, you know, and it's, it's you, know, th you know, hundreds and thousands of volunteers. It's very difficult. You're going to run into some characters that, you know, you need to let go, right? That's the nature of all volunteer organizations, but especially one that would be in the Gaza Strip. Um, so, you know, it's, isn't that great? They set some kind of impossible standard. And, and, and meanwhile, men, women, and children starve. Oh, I don't know if we should give a starving kid flour. Oh, no, Hamas might get a cup or two. You know, acting like, acting like this is a funnel of resource directly into the Hamas terrorist network. You got no proof besides the, the word of the IDF. Pretty pathetic. Shows the power of Israeli lobbies. Let's get more news on this. This. This joke. This absurd black comedy. Right? Some dark comedy. Some Mel Brooks skit. Right? Some absurdist art installation. Why am I saying these things? Why? They are providing the weapons and logistics for the IDF to create the humanitarian crisis they are now applying a Band-Aid to. And the reason why this installation is being built is because Joe Biden 
has to run for election. That's why. Does anyone believe that the Muslim people that are going to be boycotting the Democratic Party this year are going to be, their minds are going to be changed by this pathetic display of, uh, of uh, you know, neoliberalism, right? My favorite word. Hamas was storing food for years, not giving flour to citizens. means Hamas is the power of being only the good source in the middle of famine. You want Hamas to have more power without all the food aid? I, I'll deal with it, man. I'll deal with it. Okay? Like I said, I'd rather deal with Hamas getting some bags of flour than not have to see images of literally children starving to death. I'll deal with it. It's fine. Okay. Their bellies are full before they get a fucking bunker buster, you know, shot at them. But anyway, let's uh, get a couple minutes uh, information of this, like I said, farce. The satire. The U.S. has had a lot of experience in building floating causeways. The yeah. Trident Pier has been built off several coasts, including that of South Korea and the UAE. The facility of Gaza will take around two months to build. As far as time frame, as I mentioned, several weeks, uh, likely up to 60 days in order to deploy the forces uh, and uh, construct the, uh, the causeway and the, and the pier. In recent days, the U.S. and some other countries have put in place an airdrop operation of supplies into Gaza, this resulting in a tragedy on Friday when a parachute did not open properly, killing at least five people and injuring a number more. Highlighting the criticism that airdrop operations and maritime piers are a measure of last resort, are expensive and ineffective, and run the risk of creating chaos on the ground. The measures in this case, say a United Nations expert, appear to be more for domestic political benefit than real humanitarian relief. This... Holsky, yeah, you make a great point that there, you know, it might be, it, it might be harder for Hamas to, you know, to get people to do what they want when, you know, they're receiving uh, food aid. Yeah, that's a good point. They're less desperate. My best educated guess is probably a performance Never heard that argument, to try Mary. and meet uh, a domestic audience with elections around the corner. Oh, a temporary sorry, Gavin. pier sorry. will enable a massive increase in the amount of humanitarian assistance. Check the record. Gaza every day. Check, chat logs. The fact that President Biden announced the new <laughs> measure in his State of the Union speech, one Look normally centered on domestic issues, Prove adds it. fuel to the claim of political cynicism. These U.S. measures could also serve to prop up the nearly two-decade-long Israeli blockade of Gaza, another consequence of the Biden administration's apparent reluctance to fully confront the Netanyahu government and its unbridled war. Yeah, the election over The United people. States yeah. needs to use other tools uh, in our toolbox to not just insist, but to say, if you continue to ignore us, if you continue to rebuff cool these requests, with the anti-Semitic there will be consequences. Cool it with the anti-Semitic remarks. The purported you Can you believe that man is even allowed on TV being this anti-Semitic? He's actually a U.S. senator, really. U.S. Senate Democrat. Wow. I mean, I got to give credit. You know what I mean? Like, some, sometimes we've, we've seen two, two glaring examples that there is a big difference between conservative fascists and authoritarians and cor corporatist neoliberals here. Um, I mean, good luck finding anyone in the Republican Party with enough balls to say this. You know what I mean? Tools uh, in our toolbox to not just insist, but to say, if you continue to ignore us, yeah. if you continue to rebuff stick these Israel. requests, there will be consequences. Yeah, we got to carry and stick them. Look, man. You know what I'm saying? I'll deal with Hamas getting a couple bags of flour to just, I can't, I can't look at this, man. I just had a son. I can't look at this, dude. This intention to help the people of Gaza could have the opposite effect. In reality, it could bolster and effectively endorse stop. the illegal Israeli blockade. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, Washington. All right. Yeah, they don't deserve that. They don't. And and quite frankly, you know, to to Israel, Gaza to the to the, to the people defending this, you know, I would say.
Um, yeah, these are future members of Hamas if we don't do something about this. If we don't build uh, a stable, um, independent Palestine, that, you know, what, what choice will these, will these young men have? And they're like, well, they, they'll have a choice to be kicked into the Sinai Peninsula, and then they'll, you know, they'll, you know that's up to them. But you, it just isn't right, man. It just, it's, it's so crazy that this is coming from like a very Jewish thing because like, you know, the, the Jewish people throughout history, you know, victimized, uh, exploited, uh, you know, uh, kicked out of here and kicked out of there and, and, and just treated like total crap. And it, it, it's, it's, it's such a shame that Zionism has stolen the identity of Judaism and is now representing Judaism like this. Um, because, you know, it's just like, you know, of all, of all the, the cultures, of all the people, right, it, you would think it would be, you know, you would hope that, like, something that is so glaringly Jewish, like Israel, you would hope it would be the exact opposite of what we see, which is like, no, we're going to break this cycle, and we're going to, you know, we're going to treat people like humans, we're going we're gonna to do this differently. And uh, God, it's just that you couldn't, you know, couldn't get more of the opposite. You know, with that said, though, I wanted to point out, though, that Zionism doesn't, you know, Judaism and Zionism, that's not a one-to-one. -one. There's a lot of Jewish scholars, a lot of rabbis that make very intelligent arguments about how it's actually anti-Semitic to assume that all Zionists, that all, that all Jewish people agree with Zionists and Zionism. So that's that's a very interesting argument, isn't it, right? It's like, well, that's that's an anti-Semitic trope that all Jewish people agree with Zionism. Like, oh, this this rabbit hole gets even deeper. Great. Um, current members of Hamas were not even born yet during the Iraq and Afghanistan invasions. We were probably just babies when Israel was last shelling the Gaza Strip. The 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 fact is you don't you don't destroy terrorism with a bomb or the barrel of a gun. You destroy terrorism with a healthy middle class. Um, five killed and ten injured in Gaza aid airdrop when parachutes failed to open so uh, I reported on this a couple days ago maybe yesterday it was hard to tell um, but uh, you know I, re I didn't report any deaths because uh, the, the article didn't mention any but I wanted to update this that the, the number the tally has been increased to five killed tragically I mean one of these things fell on somebody dude you know, one of these things fell on somebody, man. Five people, man. That's horrific. Yeah, so this is the footage I showed yesterday. And you see the you see the damn box like boof land right next to you. So tragically, um five starving people died. And uh 10 were injured I don't have time to read all these details but if you want more detail you can find it right here thank you so much uh, Guardian for reporting on this uh, there are a lot of Jews who are protesting to remove BB and create a permanent ceasefire not to mention that Israelis are dying needlessly in the war too Holsky I would I agree with you but I would only point out that a lot of those Israelis that want a ceasefire they don't necessarily agree with the Palestinian state they kind of agree with the direction that Israel is taking with the West Bank, you know, implementing apartheid and steal chunks of land piece by piece, slowly over time to avoid a major conflict like this. That's the kind of ceasefire that they want. They don't exactly want to give Palestinians statehood. The guy who is in jail for denying the call said his jail is filled with people in the IDF who refused to go back to the front and were deserting. That's fascinating deserting huh well i mean you know israel gets everybody involved so <clears throat> that means a lot of people that are not ready you know bowdy bowdy not really ready for this shit so maybe that that would explain it i don't think that's an indication that the idf is having some kind of problem with troops fighting right um that might just be a result of the idf you know everybody in 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 israel of fighting age is is part of the idf so that might be just, you know, you're going to get some people that are just not able to hold their shit down, you know, out of counter some morals, but deserting is deserting. Deserting, it, it depends on the context. If you're a deserter in Ukraine, you're a coward. 
If you're a deserter in World War II fighting against the Nazis, you're a fucking coward. Um, if you're a deserter in the Vietnam War, you're a hero. If you're a deserter in the IDF, you're a hero. So no, it totally depends on the context. I read that a few child killed were small children. Great. Thank you for that information, Davy. Appreciate that. Lovely. A couple starving children died from falling food. Great. <sighs> More like normal. No, it no, it's it's heroic. It's heroic. Because what? Because of the because of the the consequences. The consequences. You didn't you didn't just get to go and live a normal life as a deserter in, in, in you know in in America in Vietnam. You know, the people that tore up their draft card, they got in big ass trouble. So no, it it requires a, a heroic effort. It's not normal. It's heroic to say no to your country. I disagree with this foreign war. I disagree with this action. I'm not going to dehumanize these people. This is not a uh, necessary war. This is not, you know, this is this is a war of choice. It's it's an, a heroic decision to say no to that. So speaking of heroes, uh, guys, would you believe um, shamelessly Israel is auctioning off? I, I reported on this uh, yesterday or the day before, uh, but I didn't have this video. I forgot that I had it queued up in a different browser. Uh, but Israel is shamelessly auctioning off uh, new uh, settlements that they are creating in the West Bank. Um, of course, it's only a matter of time before they start doing this in uh, the Gaza Strip. That's my prediction. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but this man is protesting. This is happening all over the world. I pointed it out. I typed it in. I typed it into Google, you know, like, you know, settlements being auctioned. It's happening in the United States and Australia, all over the world. A bunch of auctions happening. For all these different properties for uh, settlers, for occupiers, international occupiers, Israel wants you to come on down, come on in, uh, pennies on the dollar real estate. We just we just stole it from a Palestinian family. The bed is still warm. Uh, you know, you used to have a Palestinian owner. Now it's all yours. Uh, yep, it's all legal somehow. America isn't going to do shit. Well, this hero stood up at one of these auctions, and he's not the only one. Uh, stood up at one of these auctions and said, uh, "Hey, what the fuck are we doing here? You're, uh, you know, you're you're buying occupied uh, land, stolen, yeah, you know, freshly stolen uh, from a people currently being victimized. Are we really going to stand for this? You know, are we really going to put up with this? And uh, I haven't actually seen this clip fully, but I would assume he's booed and chided and called an anti-Semite and yada yada. Right? Let's find out." Uh, my name is Rich Siegel. Um, I'm a 25-year homeowner here in Teaneck. <laughs> I thought he was going to call himself a 25-year-old. I was going to be like, Rich. I'm Jewish. The reason that I'm telling you that I'm Jewish is because I have a concern about something that's going on in the Jewish community. On March 10th, there is scheduled to be an Israeli real estate sales event at the Keter Torah Synagogue. That event <laughs> violates both domestic law and international law. Violates domestic law because we had a Civil Rights Act in 1965 and a Fair Housing Act in 1968. We don't allow real estate events to be for whites only, for Jews only, for anybody only. Yeah. Now, as Jews, we don't get to fly under the radar and break the law and hide it in the synagogue. Yeah, yeah, because you were, you know, victims of a horrific crime. You know, no one's denying that, but that doesn't give you special rights, uh, you know, ab above other human. Well, yes, it does. Yes, it does. You're being anti-Semitic. No, no, I'm not being anti-Semitic saying that, you know, we should all be treated equally and, uh, you know, and you know the idea that you 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 can exclude certain people because of their race, religion, um, you know that that maybe maybe in some cases maybe in very niche cases does it make sense? You know, 
certain you know things need to happen here and there but no no in, in generally uh no you don't get special status jews only this that that is uh, uh ridiculous it's antithetical to to uh the american uh concept welcome back ice king it violates international law because uh west bank settlement homes are going to be available for sale at this real estate event on the website it lists three different west bank settlements those settlements are in and of themselves illegal by international law if we allow this sale to go through we are enabling a local synagogue to violate both domestic anti-discrimination laws and international law now wow. there's other reasons Powerful. we shouldn't allow it okay sure. there's a genocide going on right now sure. i don't care who that offends more than 35,000 people have been killed more than 13,000 children have been killed people in this community are in deep mourning people in this community are angry i'm angry what this real estate event is going to do is it's going to fan the flames if it goes forward there will be a demonstration i know there's going to be a demonstration because i'm going to organize it <laughs> and there you go folks that's what following those three steps looks like that's what creating change looks like it's not hard it takes a little bit of gumption it takes a it takes a little sack okay but you know facebook a facebook group you know a couple emails couple flyers you got yourself you know something at least you stood up stood up against it now i wonder did it actually happen because this is a couple days old um my guess is that it happened without you know without incident because you know how dare you cool it with the anti-semitic remarks wanted to show this image here it's very striking uh, i've shown this is the the second time i think we've talked about this but um this is this is a good mix but i like this is a little bit chiller um but just wanted to report on uh the israelis who are celebrating and having a good time barbecuing and dancing and you know having rave music uh while blockading food aid for women and children so they are you know they they agree with this concept that well if 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 even one bag of flour gets into Hamas's hands, um, well then there, it's justified to starve men, women, and children, uh, even to death, even to death. You know, people that are eating animal feed and scooping up flour off the sand, well that's okay because Hamas. Yeah, Malum. Yeah. Yeah, it's Zeo Duke, 100%. It's the core problem with religious thinking, right? This faith, this idea, right? But here we have, you know, having a good old time. You got the baby, got the family out, cotton candy. Yeah, Zeo Duke, yeah. Yeah, they like, it's it's such a harebrained, you know, stupid idea to begin with. Like these, like, like these terrorists are not perfectly comfortable you know fighting in the rubble scraping together whatever resources that you know iran can send over you know like this is like this is hurting hamas at all you know i'd be shocked i'd be shocked if this affected hamas even minimally all this is doing is 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 showing us you know how eager how eager you you know uh this subset of israelis uh how eager they are to to believe this um this lie that this is somehow an effective attack against hamas it's pretty crazy to me man how in the world do you you know you get up you, you get the whole family together you say we're gonna go and we're gonna stop this food 
not guns, not, you know, fertilizer or anything that could be turned into explosives. Food. Food, man. Food and water. Right? I, I'm sure. Maybe just food. I don't know. We're going to, we got to stop that. Get the kids in the van. Yeah, hang out all day in the hot ass sun. Making sure people starve. What is it? Well, you know, religion. You know what I mean? Religion. Fuck this shit. Hope they get better at parachuting boxes. Well, no, they're installing a pier. You know, I, I, hopefully they'll also give the IDF more missiles and weapons through that pier. You know, we can just expedite this ethnic cleansing campaign and then we'll remove the need to provide aid to the Palestinians because Palestine will cease to exist. There we go. Solutions, folks. Solutions that make things final. <sighs> the hits keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Is that supposed to be me? Am I crying? Am I crying because I'm a liberal and, and I'm losing? I'm crying for the Palestinians like a cuck. Is that Tom Hanks? Tom Hanks from that D and D movie about about the the dangers of D and D. God, that movie is something else, man. Uh. Or building docks, yeah. Um, just to throw another incredulous story on the pile, another head shaker, another like, I can't believe this is what we're dealing with, but you're reading the headline correct. This is from Al Jazeera, so it's kind of a snarky headline. Let's keep that in mind. Israel refuses to recognize Palestinian villages. It plans to confiscate. It's that's a factual statement though. Israel doesn't recognize 35 Palestinian Bedouin villages, giving them pretext to uproot communities from their land. The Indian Satan, it's real. Hail Satan. I hope God, you know, if God exists, he'd probably be down for some D&D. What do you got to do, man? You got all the, you got all of, you know, got all the time in the world, man. Sit down, play some D&D, God. What do you want to be, an archer? A paladin. Oh, come on, God. Oh. <laughs> really? You're going to be the holy warrior? All right. He's, God God has to be a lameoid. Look, I want to be the dungeon master. God, you're, you're already the dungeon master for all creation. Can you just play the game? Yeah, God doesn't have time for us, seemingly. God should be a barbarian. No, God's a priest. Right? He picks a priest. <laughs> Seemingly, Davy, if God exists, we we are. That's what it, that's what you know. That's what it feels like to me. If God is a real thing, that's what it feels like to me. I don't think God is real. But um, and here's here's some evidence that uh, God is dead. Um, Israel is building a town exclusively for Jewish Israelis. To do so, it is building over homes it destroyed in Um al Hirin, a Palestinian Bedouin village in southern Israel. In January 2017, uh, security forces stormed the village to bulldoze homes and evict inhabitants. They killed a resident, Yaquib Ali al Quin al Quyan, accusing him of attacking the forces with his car, which spun out of control when they shot at it. Most of the villagers were forced to leave their land and relocate to Hura, a larger Bedouin village nearby, leaving tracks of destruction behind for Israel to claim after it had caused it. But some 200 people refused to leave their homes and remained in Um al Hiren, which is one of 35 towns unrecognized by Israel. And right, Israel has a big problem with recognition, right? It's a big problem that uh, the the Hamas doesn't recognize Israel as a as a as a legitimate entity. Um, that you know, and, and Israel takes this so seriously. That's why Israel extends that courtesy to other nations and other entities. Right? Oh no, no, they don't. In fact, they've actually denied the existence of the Palestinian state since its inception in the 1940s. 
and I know I sound like a broken record, but I need to point this out. Israel is, according to, from what I believe, I'd love to be proven wrong, but Israel is the only country in the in the world that has not defined its borders. Israel simply exists right now as a borderless entity. They, I guess they just didn't fill that part of the form out, right? To be determined, maybe they put a TBD there. Yeah, so what What are the borders of Israel? Ah, uh, TBD, that's complicated. Quote, we're fighting for our rights, said Morad Mohammed, 23, Abu al Quin's nephew. Quote, we're hoping to eventually come to an agreement with the government to remain here. Spoiler alert. Um, there's about 120,000 people living in unrecognized villages across the desert, predating the existence of Israel. Unrecognized. Right? Like, like these people need Israel's permission to exist. Right? Isn't that insane? Oh, well, you, you know, you're not a real uh, Californian. Gavin Newsom hasn't acknowledged your your existence it's not is not real i think it has borders and has inherited the world what has um since then israel has continued confiscating palestinian land they're just talking about what happened after the nakba the government uses the unrecognized status to deny basic rights and services to these villages as well as to justify confiscations residents and activists told al jazeera on February 27th, as Israelis and Palestinian citizens of Israel voted in municipal elections across the country, Palestinian Bedouins from unrecognized villages were not allowed to vote. I'm writing in code, bro. Oh, is not real. I see. No, the, the, the solution is not to go extreme in the other direction either. We Israel exists. We have to negotiate with it. You're not going to be able to make Israel go away and, and then every all the problems go away, guys. That's not going to work either. Yeah, that's really clever, man. So uh, next time you hear... Um, so moving on to the next story here. Um, uh, next time you hear somebody, you know, try to make the excuse, uh, you know, because, you know, constantly, you know, thir 13,000 Palestinian children... Uh, you know, over 25,000 people dead. They, oh, that's not true. That's not true. Those those numbers were provided by Hamas. Those numbers, Hamas numbers, Hamas numbers. We hear that all the time. Downplaying the damage, right? And then and they're in they're in in. in oh shit! Okay, you're gonna show something nasty. Dog survives vicious mountain lion attack. Ooh, wow, nasty. Don't show that. Uh, you know, poor dog survived though. It's great news. I can't show it though. If you got mauled by a damn lion. Uh, but, you know, Hamas numbers, can't trust them. Hamas numbers, uh, you know, in, in, in implying that the numbers are lower, but of course not really referencing any other sources that would, you know, contradict that. But, you know, just, you know, basically just kind of throwing, you know, throwing in some doubt. Oh, you can't trust those numbers. Hamas provided them. Well, Austin follows Biden in citing Hamas health ministry death toll for Palestinian women and kids over 25,000. So, um... Secretary Lloyd Austin, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, military representative, Defense Secretary, using those Hamas numbers, using those, oh no, Hamas numbers, can't use them. So just go ahead and speak, speak with confidence when you're trying to defend yourself and defend your positions, right? Because they, they try to gaslight you, right? They, oh, those numbers aren't real. Then you're like, oh fuck, if they're not real, then maybe my conclusions aren't real. You know, and maybe that maybe I'm being hyperbolic. Maybe this person defending Israel is right. No, the numbers are real. U.S. government referencing these numbers. Biden over here saying thirty thousand. Okay, so don't. I, I just wanted to show you this. Back up what you're saying. Feel confident defending humanity. Davin over here with a link. Take a look. Ah, okay, this is him saying 30,000. There are red lines, blah, blah, blah. Okay. 
wanted to show this article, but I, I wanted to look it up on Ground News because I'm like, well, okay, you know, what's the authentic authenticity of this? But um, according to, oh, you're back. Huh. Want help? You bite. I want pizza. I'm starving. Um, but no, according to one source, uh, all allisrael.com, right? So questionable. But according to this source, Hamas leader Sin Sinwar reportedly satisfied with course of war, confident civilian deaths will force stop. Um, you know, with that said, questionable source aside, we have seen, like I said, I, I, I talked about this earlier. Hamas, there's evidence of Hamas cynically using uh, the people that they're supposed to be protecting, the people that they're supposed to be liberating, cynically using them uh, for their own political gain, for their own political purposes. Yeah, airdrop a pizza without a parachute. Breaking bad, my ass. <laughs> so once again, according to all Israel news, despite Israel's steady, pro you see what I'm saying, steady progress, yada, yada, yada. Senior members, the fighters of the blah, 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 Hamas aren't doing just fine. We're prepared to the face of the bus and we're also confident. Mounting civilian casualties on for the war. What? Did, where, where's the quote? According to Gallant, it's literally, it's literally just, there's no quote. Oh man, this is, I'm not, okay, this is officially, I thought they were quoting the guy. I don't see any quotes here. And then they say the source is Gallant, who is incredibly, you know, biased. He's, you know, he's like a propaganda uh, dude. Okay, never mind. Um, with that, with that said, like it, I, like I said, so this this article is pretty sketchy, but there's plenty of evidence to show that, like you know, like I've said this before, Hamas is holding the Palestinian people hostage. Um, Hamas is not a honest actor in governing Palestine. Um, here's an example of um, you know, Zionist extremism. There's no uh, better way to put it. Uh, we have uh, uh, a person confronting a Zionist, uh, a, you know, a, 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 a you know, person, a pro-Palestinian person confronting a Zionist in a parking lot. Oh my God. <laughs> you want me to open the garage door? My wife just handed me an entire pizza. My wife just handed me an entire pizza. Ooh, delicious. Hmm. I hope pizza, dog. <laughs> Let's go ahead and take a look at this confrontation here. <laughs> She's a keeper. Why are you doing that? You just shot that at me. So he has a nail gun and the way he's holding it, the reason why he has to hold that is that there's a safety on the nail gun to prevent you from it being able to do this. But all you need to do is hold down that safety. And then you can fire nails. Don't ask me why I know that. Oh, he put the nail gun away. Or no, he didn't. Fucking coward. Time to run, dude. Oh, he puts the nail gun away. He's like, okay. Off the road. Respect that. Link me that? Okay, yeah. This uh Toronto, Canada. Nail gun guy. <laughs> so, 
knowing Canada, um, there there will be legal follow up for this guy. I'm sure. You can't you can't be threatening people with a gun with any kind of construction tool like this. Hey, you. You. Why are you doing this? You, you see what he's doing right there? It's the safety when you put it down on the you know on the surface, it comes up and then allows you to shoot it. He's holding that back so he can shoot nails at people. Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> All right, so moving on to the next story, uh, uh, final two stories here for Gaza, and we're almost done. Gaza doctor says gunfire accounted for 80% of the wounds at, at his hospital from aid convoy bloodshed. So this is a follow-up to the flower massacre. Um, Israel tried to come out and say that um, the people, you know, it was, uh, most of the people died, you know, yes, we had to f fire some shots to defend ourselves, but most of the people died because of stampeding. Um, not true. Most of the people that were dead on the scene were dead from gunshot wounds. But more lies from the IDF, more half-truths, you know. Is, is the FBI story you will tell us in four years related? Uh, to this? No. Oh my God, you remember that? I shouldn't have said anything. All right, so uh, I wanted to show this here. It's a mini documentary, Channel 4, showing uh, the real reality for Palestinians, what they've been living with literally since the 40s. But uh, it's, of course, gotten worse, been ramped up, and is now in uh, full steam ahead in the West Bank. But this is the terrifying reality for Palestinians in the West Bank who are seeing their land stolen from them and then, uh, you know, cynically auctioned off as we saw earlier. It's almost hard to believe, right? It's, a, it's, it's so cartoonishly evil. It's almost hard to believe that it's like, it's legitimately happening and there's, you know, and it's only until like, you've had like a conversation with someone face to face who's like, I, this is, I agree with this. I know it's happening. It, you know, they have their justifications. Oh, we got no choice, defending ourselves, whatever it is. But it's so cartoonishly evil what's happening right now. It's it's hard to believe that it's real, uh, but it's very very real, and it's it's actually been very very real for Palestinians for quite some time. Um, honestly, Bibi Netanyahu and the extremist right wing government of Israel has kind of overplayed their hand with the Gaza Strip. The question is, will the power of the West and the United States basically allow them to overcome this mistake that they've made? Because with the West Bank, with this. The West sleeps, aid continues to flow, relationships with Saudi Arabia were, you know, before October 7th, we're about to finalize, all of this was happening, you know, and under the shadow of West Bank settlement expansions that were not slowing down, right? So it just needs to happen slowly and piece by piece over time, you know, throw a couple bones to the two-state solution. Oh, we care about it so much, and we're gonna we're working on it. We're just looking for the right deal. We're just looking for the right negotiation, right? Everybody was happy to pretend that you know this was a problem that was eventually going to be solved. Uh, of course, with no intention of solving it while taking more and more and more and more over time. But as Ice King said, they kind of jumped the shark here. The question is, is the United States going to back them up? So far, yes, fully, 100%, you know, with, you know, the only pushback being, well, you know, we're, we're going to give people, we're going to give people food, we're going to give, we're going to, we're going to give them food, even though you don't want us to, and, and you better not be mad at us for that. Right? Who, who wants to bet Bibi Netanyahu called up the United States saying, don't, don't airdrop food into, into Gaza? Who wants to bet that that phone call happened? Right? You can't tell Israel what to do. Really, the United States can't tell Israel what to do. That's cute. But that's probably, that's probably, you know, Joe Biden was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, right. Apparently in the hot mic during the State of the Union, he was caught saying, Bibi Netanyahu is an asshole. Um, I have a hard, I have a hard time believing that over the phone, uh, 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 Biden's getting real tense and real tough with Bibi Netanyahu. I have a feeling he's that, you know, 
conciliatory, uh, reach across the aisle, bipartisan Joe Biden, right? Patton, Mitch McConnell on the back, kind of Joe Biden. Who wants to bet it's that? And not some fiery, uh, you know, fiery leader being like, you're making me look bad. I'm going to lose my reelection because of you. Your, your military is going to be carried and sticked immediately if you don't I- I immediately do what I fucking tell you to do. I'm immediately going to pull out support, right? I bet you that's not the conversation going down, isn't it? Really? Do we, do we think Joe Biden has that in him? You know, maybe when he's scolding his dog for, for like, you know, eating, eating some food off the floor, do we see Joe Biden, you know, oh, you start the scolding, right? Not, not for a right-wing government making, making his re-election possibilities less and less likely. The Israeli government's ambition for the Palestinian territories comes as no surprise to Hafez Hereni. This Bedouin's farm is in Masafa Yatta, the West Bank, on the edge of the Negev Desert and on the front line of an Israeli land grab for years now. The 7th of October attacks turbocharged that process. We've been filming with the Hrenis over the course of the last 14 months. Watched an empowered group of settlers next door move away from sticks and stones to assault rifles. The Hereni's cousin shot in the stomach. The family and what's left of their farm now staring down the barrel of the gun. Hafez's mother bought this land after the family were evicted during what they call the Nakba in 48. He divides his life between farming and making sure they don't get displaced again. So in 2006, for example, when the Israelis tried to build a separation wall here, it was Hafez on the vanguard of the protest. Now his son Hamoudi is the activist, fighting to keep this land. A fight that's about to get more violent than they could ever have imagined. It's the evening of the 30th of November, 2022. Hamoudi and his brother Sami notice settlers on the edge of the village. Look how they operate. What? Look how these settlers operate. The settlers are holding a demonstration on Palestinian territory. The army should intervene to stop it. Instead, they're standing guard. The brothers, with a rifle trained on them, confront the soldiers. The expansion of illegal settlements in this area started years ago, but this night in 2022 is different. Benjamin Netanyahu is about to form a coalition government which includes extreme right-wing settlers. And with their men about to take key positions in cabinet, the settlers on the ground are emboldened. The following day, they the be? settlers' weapon of choice, sheep. A young settler from a nearby illegal outpost drives his herd deliberately onto the Hereni's land. Hamoudi rings the Israeli police. He's grazing his sheep. He's a settler and he's like grazing his sheep in my land. These are the mechanics of a land grab. Claim the grazing ground as your own. And try provoke a reaction. No, no, no. Imagine this child coming to your property and telling you it's his. I'm going to hit you. I'm going to poke you with my stick. Another settler arrives by way of reinforcement. 
as do the army. This is the way hugs, they can confiscate hugs, my land, hugs, so they will and just fist say this bombs. is like a shuttle land, he's just grazing his jeep, right? Or not? Thank you, David. I'm speaking, speaking the truth. Hugs and fist bumps Where for the from? settler, guys. I'm from Tuan here. This is my own land. It's a Bedouin? What is this? What? It's a Bedouin. You're a Bedouin. You don't know that? You're Egypt. You don't know? You are Saudi Arabia. You are no, Jordan. My grandparents. Yeah. My grandparents. They are grandparents. The palace. From the Beersheba, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, no, you don't belong here. So you're Bedouin from Beersheba. So you, your place is Beersheba. Your place yes, is Beersheba. Yes, and it's the land that my grandparents are <coughs> living in after, after you evicted them from there. Beersheba is 30 minutes from here, by, by, by car. By I'm car, okay. Oh. But they were living down. Why you evicted yeah, them yeah. from there? Yeah, we came here after the first knock, but dude. Hafez Hamoudi's dad, the owner of the land, arrives. Full of other dishes here. Okay. There is a bit to the north, but it's still on. Negative. Full of the man, maybe it's a son, maybe it's a son, maybe it's a son. Hafez and Hamoudi know how this will play out, but still involve the Israeli authorities. A way at least of signaling to the settler the that they're not taking this lying down. This is a closed military. You need to go out of the area. They could move. In that grave. Yeah. Remember, we're filming this a, a year before zone. the October attacks. So we have authority. Back when there we was at least your own land. a semblance Settlers of staging forced fair play here. Settler gets to hang out. Well, Davey, that On October is, the seventh, twenty twenty-three, forty miles west of here. 1,200 people were killed by Hamas, hundreds taken hostage. Everything changed that day for everyone, including Hafez Hareni and his family. After the 7th of October, everything changed, really. Lenny, yeah, you're because, yeah, you know, eminent the domain. Settlers, they start, like, uh, ruling almost everything around here. It's the 12th of October five days after the Hamas attack. The first time when they came, they came with the bulldozer. We just like walk up, you know, and start like screaming, you know, what are you doing? They just like, okay, go back home and they totally start normal, just shooting, you totally know? Totally justified. At one point, a settler in army fatigues appears to shoot directly at the Hurenis and other unarmed activists. They chased us, all the family, all the kids, until the house here. You know, really, you know, I was really confused. Kafez is pushed back October into his 7. house at gunpoint <laughs> by both settlers and the police. The following day, the violence becomes even more extreme. This is in the West Bank, guys. Just after Friday prayers on the 13th, Hamas a settler not comes down here. from the hill into the village. Hafez's nephew, okay. Zachariah Adra, is shot point blank in the stomach. Tragic, man. An incident broadcast around the world. He's just been released after spending... I'm, I'm more comfortable calling it ethnic cleansing. Uh, Lap pine. I'm more comfortable calling it ethnic cleansing, uh, but uh, the uh, International Criminal Court has uh, you know, considered it to be a genocide, so that's good enough for a lot of people. I'm not going to argue with them. In three months in intensive care, and has agreed to speak to Amazing us. Amazing, he's alive. Took a, took a rifle bullet right to the gut, man. Miracle, he's alive. The settler who shot him was using expanding bullets at the time. According to his lawyer, the only consequences so far for the settler who shot Zachariah, he had his gun 
confiscated. Shot a man in cold blood. We asked the Israeli police about this, but they refused to comment. Treatment. The blurring of lines between the army and the settlers has been happening for years. Since October the 7th, that's gone into overdrive. A few miles from Hafez's farm, the start of a new illegal outpost. Looked like he was doing pretty rough. Trees you planted know, in the names of fallen is Israeli soldiers. Memorials that double as a land grab. So isn't that cute? Isn't that cute? Listen to that. They use, they make these makeshift memorials, right, for dead people or whatever it is, for their martyrs on Palestinian land. And then they're like, how dare the Palestinians come and rip up these sacred, these sacred, these, you know, sacred, uh, you know, places. We've blessed them and, and, you know, it's heartless. Outpost. Trees planted in the names of fallen Israeli soldiers. Memorials that double as a land grab. Isn't that We cute? interview one of the leaders who doesn't want to give his name because he's been fighting in Gaza and another condition. We ask about settler violence. According to this man, it doesn't exist. I don't know a Jew who came in the morning and wants to do a war to Palestinians. I know water is wet. I know who came in the morning and went to the Three months on from October the 7th, we're back on Hafez's farm. According to him, settlers are now de facto law enforcement. You can have a here. slice. Come on over. I mean, October 7th until now, you know, we can't even pass this part of the land. We can't go out just to come to graze our sheep, our goat here. And you can see they just put the Israeli flag right on our trees and on our land. They've seized about Isn't two acres great? of his farm. A military watchtower supported been built. by the IDF. The dry stone walls literally closing in on him. Really, it's something uh, make me so upset. And really, uh, really, I even I worry about if they succeed, just like to take over the land, you know, because they have the power, you know, just to do it. Yep. Before we leave, Hamoudi, Hafez's son, wants to introduce us to someone. Khuda is a widow. She now spends every night sleeping in a cave with her family because, she says, her 14-year-old son and her animals have been attacked. She lives in a cave. <laughs> They're sheep for their livelihoods, by the way. As the light fades, Hamoudi walks with them into the desert. And to the cave where they'll sleep, like their Bedouin ancestors before them. Incredible strength. Since the October attacks, 
Huda's world, just like Hamoudi's, is shrinking faster and faster. The space to make a home, to harbor hope, now reduced to a hole in the ground. Yeah. And the United States, it's like, well, that's just the devil we got to deal with. It's more important to have our military satellite that could potentially challenge Iran. You know, if some Arab people get caught in the mix, well, that's not my problem. All right, folks. Our final segment of the day, Ukraine news. We're going to get through this. Call it a day. News Underground. Hardcore news for hardcore folks. Keeping it real. I am Abandoned Nihilism. A.K.A. The Harbinger. Hope you're enjoying it. I had one too many slices of that delicious Papa John's pizza. I hate that I like Papa John's. It's disgusting trash pizza. But I like their barbecue chicken. I guess trash pizza for trash people. Is that their slogan? Um... Right here, they're one of the, yeah. I mean, they're the they're the better one in terms of trash pizza selection. Might as well just eat the box. Probably, probably just as much nutrient in the box. Blaze pizza, that sounds good. Good crop of new stone oven, nice ones. Yeah, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of pizza offerings. You know, no matter where you go. Papa John's versus Little Caesars, not even a question. Papa John's, Little Caesars is the bottom of the barrel. They charge $5 for those pizzas, and there's a reason. Yeah, Lenny. It's, it's just barely food. It's like Subway. Like, well, there's a lot of newspaper in there. Uh, uh, thank you, Chem Goblin, in advance for this link here. Slovakia faces increasing isolation as allies exclude it from Ukraine meeting. Um, literally the only pizza I can afford. Little Caesars? Yeah, it's garbage. France organized a follow-up teleconference bringing together foreign and defense ministries to discuss the war in Ukraine. However, they learned their lesson and did not invite Slovakia because of its pro-Russian stance. Representatives from 28 countries, including Ukraine and the U.S., held an ad hoc ministerial teleconference on Thursday to follow up on last week's Ukraine summit in Paris. So this is good to see. Like, we're just not going to play. We're just not going to entertain fools right now. We don't have time for this. Um, you're clearly, you know, representing Putin's interests. You know, that's what you showed us in the last meeting. So you're not invited. Let's make it at home, which is way easier than people think. Yeah, homemade pizza is delicious. You see what the Pope said about Ukraine? Uh, no, what? That, you know, they should give up and, you know, for, because, because, you know, people are dying and Ukraine should do the right thing and, you know, bend the knee to, to Putin's invasion. That's great. <clears throat> Fuck the Pope. Uh, wanted to show uh, another big dub for Ukraine here, attacking a military target. Look at that. Look at this professional military. Focus on military targets, using their uh, their money and resources to attack military targets instead of civilians, unlike Russia. Here they are blowing up a uh, one of Russia's largest steel plants, 800 miles from the border. Big W for Ukraine. Big W. Yeah, well, fuck the Pope, Davin. Fuck the Pope. Um, okay, so this is inside the plan itself. Yikes. Hit at 5.30 a.m. Hopefully that reduced casualties. Struck a blast furnace causing a large explosion. Distance from the plan is left. Wow. There it is in the distance there. Yeah. Learn to make yeast bread. I agree. Bread is hard to make. My wife, my wife was uh, really, um, she, she really had to put a lot of work, you know, into making a, a, her culture, or whatever it was. Starter, the starter dough. That's what it was. Starter dough. 
Uh, big props to the Welsh community here, Welsh mi miners in uh, country to repay 1984 help. When Ukrainian miner Vasily Yakovsky donated his own wages to striking Welsh miners in 1984, he never thought that help would one day be returned. However, a group of Welsh miners have now loaded up on medicine and supplies and driven from South Wales to Kiev to repay the old favor. Wow, you can drive? Really? So you can drive from Wales to Kiev? Dude, really? The convoy is supplying much-needed aid to miners fighting on the front line two years after Russia forces invaded. Did not forget about us, uh, just like we did in 1984, said Vasily. Yeah, isn't this great? Look at these guys. A group of miners from South of Wales loaded cars up with medical supplies and drove it to Kiev. These guys. <laughs> Getting her done, boys. I bet them Welsh boys drank well that night. Live in large, son. Communities in Wales affected uh, by the miners' strike in the 1980s received much-needed support from the former Soviet Union and from around the world. Um, interesting. Scary. I don't, uh, that's, that's a loaded statement. <clears throat> we are mining brothers. I remember the donation box we had. Everyone donated as much as they could and sent it to those miners. Now, 40 years later, we are in need, seeking help. And our English and Welsh friends responded. We're helping our soldiers on the front lines. Vasily Yakovsky welcomed the uh, Welsh miners as he arrived in Kiev with med uh, medicine and supplies. <laughs> Four decades old bond that bridges a strike, uh, that bridges a strike, and now a war forged in shared experiences underground. In Ukraine, there are currently hundreds, if not thousands, of miners fighting on the front lines of the war against Russia. True. Um, never forgotten. Look at these guys. They had a good old time. Nice. You know. Hey, let's go to Kiev, guys. Let's bring a bunch of medical supplies. Excellent. Lapine, thank you for that follow over there on Twitch. Is that a Twitch follow? Thank you for that follow. Maybe a kick follow. I think this is from Chem Goblin. Uh, hey, thank you so much, Lapine, for stopping over on Twitch. Appreciate it. But this is the uh, result of uh, Russia and Putin's um, disgusting war against Ukraine. These once beautiful places turned into... Um, I already showed this. Yeah, this feels familiar, but that's okay. I'm going to show it again. Um, yeah, I do remember showing this. I don't care. I'm going to show it again. Borderline feline, no problem. I'm almost done with the stream, but if you got to leave early, no biggie. Thank you for being here. Hopefully, we'll see you again. But um, yeah, I mean, just look at look at what Russia does. Um, you know, look at what this war of aggression has done. This war of choice, because because Ukraine didn't want to bend the knee and wanted to be an independent democracy. This was deemed necessary by the Putin regime in Russia. Really disgusting stuff. Like you can't even tell on the bottom. Like it's unbelievable. That we're looking at the same. Only only the trees and the benches, right? Um, are there wars not of choice? Um, yeah, for some, for well, for Ukrainians, right? This is not a war of choice for Ukraine. It just depends on the context. Bold statement, Lapine. Bold statement. That is an incredibly bold statement. Oh my God, my gut is very mad at me for eating that much Papa John so quickly. It's like, oh, you're gonna pay for this, buddy. Look at these beautiful places. And yeah, this beautiful school. I think, I don't think this is the legitimate sound of school kids. Link? Oh, did this? Yeah, right here. Uh, unironically, some people I talk to think war is good. And that makes me sad. Yeah, a lot of a lot of dumb people have a lot of excuses for for war, and sometimes fighting a war is necessary to defend yourself. You know, Jesus, man, look at this. See what I mean with with Russia targeting civilian targets? It's beautiful locations where people were, you know, living their lives. So brown, so gray. Wow. Terrifying video. 
<clears throat> fuck, uh, fuck the uh, uh, current government in Russia. And, of course, fuck Vladimir Putin. Um, so I got to show this, folks. I'm sorry. I don't know if anyone, you know, the people want to laugh. They want to, you know, they want to be like, what? what's this? Why are you doing this? Boo, I don't like this. Too bad. I don't care. We're doing this. This is too juicy not to talk about. <clears throat> too juicy not to talk about. So this, I will talk about this, but there is a UFO scandal out of Ukraine. Ukrainian soldier who filmed UFO bigger than the Empire State Building over war zone in Donetsk tells DailyMail.com it sat deathly still against the winds and was hotter than anything I've ever seen. Okay, Lapine, thank you for that follow up. Appreciate that. Yeah, my, my uh, let me let me turn that down. My uh, my Illuminati confirmed has always been too loud. I'll turn that down by ten notches. There we go. This this one's definitely right. <laughs> that was a no no don't do that one. I got to remove that one altogether. But no, this is really something else. Um, this is really something else. Uh, I, who knows how true this is? But uh, Ukrainian army drone operators capture massive UFO. Is this a? Uh, can I click on this? Does this work? This is archive.is. So maybe that's why I can't watch the video. I'm not on the right website. Let me just allow ads here so I can see this. Just always find whatever. There you go. All right, I want to see this video. We got a U. We got a legitimate UFO scandal in Ukraine, guys. How exciting! Huh? How exciting! Wouldn't that be great if it was real, though? Right? Like it's oh, Lordy. Like it's you know it's like wow, look at this human conflict. Look at this human war. And it's, uh, you know, observing it. But here's here's the footage right here. Finally, right? <laughs> I don't know, man. All right, I don't know. Um, the 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 thing that makes it freaky is the fact that it's it's it's. Stand, it's like perfectly still, which is aer aeronautically, you can't do that without some kind of jet engine, some kind of helicopter blades. Oh no, Davey, why would you do this to me? All right, there you go. So if, if you want this whole story, it's, you know, here it is. It's right here. Check it out yourself. If you want to read more into it. But I just wanted to show the footage, talk about it for a minute. Kind of interesting. Let's see here. Biden's new campaign ad. Guy. I'm not a witch. Look, I'm not a witch. Look, I'm not a young guy. That's no secret. But here's the deal. I understand how to get things done for the American people. I led the country through the COVID crisis. Today, we have the strongest economy in the world. I passed the law that lowers prescription drug prices. Caps and for some people. $35 a month for, for some seniors. Seniors. For four years, Donald Trump tried to pass an infrastructure law and he failed. I got it done. Now we're. Re mm, yeah, that infrastructure, instead of Build Back Better, you mean the, 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 massive, the massive giveaway that you gave to billion dollar industries instead of doing your Build Back Better, right? Yeah, and no, I remember that. Yeah, AOC, AOC and the squad begging you until they capitulated themselves and allowed Build Back Better to be separated from the infrastructure bill. And then you, after you promised us, you promised us, Build Back Better, Build Back Better, it was gonna happen, it's gonna happen. I don't, do you think he's gonna mention Build Back Better? No, 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 it was the infrastructure bill. That was the real victory. That was the real victory. That was the compromise given to the corporations. And the promise was that we were gonna get the, the Build Back Better instead, and we didn't, did we? Boy. Love neoliberals. Building man. America. Awesome. I passed the biggest law in history to combat climate change because our future depends on it. Right. Donald right. Trump took away the freedom of women to choose. I'm determined to make Roe v. Wade the law of the land again. Donald Trump believes the job of the president is to take oh. care of Donald Trump. I believe the job of the president is to fight for you, the American people, and that's what I'm doing. I'm wow. Joe Biden. Wow, dude. 
they've, they've learned nothing. They're changing nothing. Same strategy. Same. Did they? You know, they're, they're ch this is this is not a radical new direction for the. You know, this is not a big. You know, uh, you know, big promise to America. You know, hey, vote for. You know, we got to get to us. The blooper at the end. And I approve this message. Can we do one more take? Look, I'm very young, energetic, and handsome. What the hell am I doing this for? I don't see a single thing different from this versus the Hillary campaign. You know what I mean? I don't see a single thing different. And he's touting some of his successes, which he should be doing. And that's great. But I think it's the infrastructure thing is really interesting to me. Because that was a massive compromise given to billion dollar companies. And we were supposed to be getting Build Back Better soon after. And we're just completely forgetting about that. Um, yeah, Lapine, I actually, I spent about two hours uh, earlier today covering Project 2025. Welcome to the News Underground, where we cover real news. Uh, bumbling Russians, uh, you know, fucking up on the front lines. I thought we might want to watch this. Um, yeah, Project 2025 is real. Um, it's absolutely happening. Um, yep, yeah, no doubt about it. Crashing and uh, crashing into each other in a panic, looks like. Give me some music or something here, man. Oh, how embarrassing. I'd still vote for him. No, I mean, Davin, I, you know, look, we don't have a lot of choices, do we? You know, this is, it's like being stuck in a saw trap. You know? Remember, folks, this is Ukrainian mud. <laughs> Project 2025 Israel. <laughs> it is not real. Got him. I'm Canadian, so I don't have to. I'm trying to be. Turns, turns out I can actually start applying for my citizenship right now. Which so I'm going to be starting that process very soon, and you can bet we're going to be doing, uh, you know, we're going to be learning about Canadian history together on stream. I'm going to have to be learning it for my citizenship test. Uh, so I'm very excited to do that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, we'll be studying for my citizenship test together. Right, Zio Do. Traitor. <laughs> my only allegiance is to humanity. That's where I raised my flag. Look at this guy. <laughs> oh, the irony. Well, I'll be a dual citizen. Um, I won't be starting the process of rescinding my US citizenship for quite some time. But I am flirting with that idea and I, you know, I may, I may one day do that. We'll see. How many racisms Trudeau has done? Uh, Boa, Boa racisms? Damn, look at him, he's getting the hell out. Still leaving them damn hatches open. Oh, ho, 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 ho. front panel gone. Oh, oh, that was on top. I thought he got it underneath. Still, he got it open. People died in that clip. Well, people, those people shouldn't have been in Ukraine, should they have been? They shouldn't have put on an army uniform and uh, invaded another country. Wouldn't you agree? Damn. Cope cage getting hit. Yeah, hey, you know what? If you don't want to get shot at, maybe don't invade another guy's country, huh? Here's a video of a Russian soldier walking around with his ass out. I can't show that. Put, I'll, put, I'll put that in the Discord, though. If you want to check it out, it's in the Discord, folks. Okay. Final video of the day. Final video. 
Final video of the day, folks. We're going to uh, report our favorite uh, YouTube channel when covering uh, the, uh, you know, the front lines of the Ukrainian uh, uh, war here. Um, reporting from Ukraine. Absolutely wonderful channel right here. Great. Looks like they put out a video 19 hours ago. Let's check it out. Terrible idea. Russians try attacking on quad bikes. Regrets. Today there are a lot of... Uh Regret immediately. Okay, interesting. Let's have a look. Updates from the Orekiv direction. First of all, more information became available about the aftermath of the night operation that was conducted last time, when four Ukrainian soldiers, without incurring losses, managed to repel a mechanized Russian assault with three armored vehicles and two dozen soldiers. According to Russian sources, Russian forces managed to retain a foothold in the village by organizing a defensive position around the local school. However, Ukrainian fighters released several videos that suggest otherwise. In the first video, a Ukrainian soldier is walking past one of the armored vehicles destroyed during the attack, and judging by the fact that they are walking slowly and not trying to hide, Russian forces are not present in the area. Mm. Another video shows how a Ukrainian unit entered the school building, confirming that Russian forces were pushed out of this Poor position dogs. and lost the foothold inside the village. This prompted many Russian sources to update their assessment of the situation and state that the Ukrainian army recovered all the lost positions in the settlement, with some even claiming that Ukrainians also re-established control over the southern trenches. Russian soldiers complained that they struggled to clear seized Ukrainian trenches due to Ukrainian mines and struggled to establish a foothold in the houses because of the destruction that the Russian artillery inflicted on the settlement. Shortly after the Ukrainians consolidated... This is in Robotna, and it looks like, you know, it, un, until we start supplying Ukraine properly, we're going to be seeing the Bakhmut strategy, a, a Divka strategy repeated over and over and over again. You know, punish, punish Russia for dumping uh, a, an insane amount of resources into taking these, uh, these minor towns, punish them as much as possible while, while doing strategic retreats. That's their only choice. ...dated control of the retaken positions... Russian forces start everything from scratch. The Russian command understood that the sudden mechanized attack did not pay off, and as Ukrainian reinforcements arrived in the region, catching Ukrainians off guard for the second time would be extremely unlikely, which is why Russians launched extensive artillery preparation. Russian sources published footage of artillery strikes showing Russia's attempts to identify and destroy Ukrainian firing points. Notably, Russian forces did not stop there and launched bombardments of the tree lines behind Robotini. This Robotini. is because Russians could see that there is no way to keep lots of soldiers inside the village, meaning that Ukrainians logically accumulated the reserves outside the village. Mm. However, Ukrainian forces did not passively let Russians conduct their firing missions, and they launched counter-battery fire to undermine the Russian artillery preparation. Very nice. Russian analysts admit that, so far, the Ukrainian counter-battery fire is very effective, thanks to HIMARS. Combat footage as shows how Ukrainians ammo. hunted down a lot of Russian artillery systems. Left. The most valuable targets became three Russian Uragan long-range multiple launch rocket systems. Other footage shows the destruction of howitzers, such as MSTS and Gvozdika. In order to amplify artillery fire, Russian forces also deployed a number of tank crews, whose job was to approach the village from the east and strike potential Ukrainian firing points with high explosive shells. Ukrainians quickly adjusted, and the subsequent raids were prevented by Ukrainian Yo, drone crews that destroyed win. Russian T-80 tanks. Nice. When the artillery preparation was completed, Russian forces launched a new wave of attacks. At first, many Russian assault units used a variation of the same tactic, and tried to send between one and three armored fighting vehicles, carrying approximately 10 soldiers each. Yeah. And, and if, if you've been on the Discord, you've seen footage of these failed Russian raids. They, they come barreling in, truck full of soldiers. They get their ass handed to them. The whole operation goes tits up. And then, you know, they retreat, and then another group tries it again like an hour later or how, whatever the timeline Ukrainian is. Ukrainian fighters sure from the 118th Artillery Brigade released footage they send, of the they aftermath just send another of one. one of such assaults. Another video shows how an armored vehicle got immobilized by artillery and was left burning near the shell crater until the detonation of the ammo. 
Some Russian soldiers were spotted hiding under the remnants of the destroyed vehicles in hopes Recently, of being Davey. evacuated, oh, that's, that's but news. most of them were detected and destroyed. Russian forces reported that, with the arrival of reinforcements, Ukrainians were able to assume a more active stance and started meeting Russian attacking forces by attacking them. Many sources reported ongoing meeting engagements, which allowed the stabilization of the situation. A fighter from the 24th Battalion reported that Russian forces developed a new tactic and started using quad bikes instead of armored fighting vehicles. Crazy. The main idea behind... All right, folks, um, I, I'm actually running out of time. I do need to get going. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to give everyone in the chat props. I'll be sure to do that next time. I want to want to give a big prop to uh, the Ukrainians, though. Peace in that motherfucking Middle East. Glory to the Ukrainian democracy. Props to every single one of you in chat. Thank you so much for being here. Sorry I have to leave in such a huff. I got a little little thing I got to take care of. No biggie. Uh, but, you know, thank you for uh, participating in the news underground. Uh, once again, I am Abandoned Nihilism. And, you know, a.k.a. The Harbinger. Uh, the realest motherfucking news channel on Twitch. I hope you enjoyed it. Six, six and a half solid hours of news. Lenny has the stamina. Whoa, dude, loud, loud. Lenny has the stamina. Amazing. Thank you, Davin. Thank you, Zeo Duke. Thank you, Davey. Thank you, Kem Goblin. You're all amazing. Uh, something like that, Kem. Something like that. Thanks again, everybody. See you. Thanks again, folks.